Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the University of Wolverhampton. Uh, please do come and take a seat. We're about to kick off. Yeah, it's not a church. You don't need to sit at the back. You can come and sit further forward if you'd like to. Um, <laughs> brilliant. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for uh, coming along today to this COP26 Regional Roadshow. Uh, my name's Ed Cox. I am Director for Inclusive Growth and Public Service Reform at the West Midlands Combined Authority. Um, and it's my job, I think, to um, be responsible across the region for galvanising all of us to create a fairer, greener and healthier West Midlands. And it's the greener part we're particularly focusing on uh, today um, and as I say I'm really really excited about uh, the fantastic day that we've got in store. I'm going to be your compare uh, for, the, for the day and it's a real pleasure to welcome you uh, this morning to this fantastic setting, the largest school of architecture and the built environment in Europe and we're going to hear a bit more about that um, in a few minutes time. A couple of housekeeping things, um, the uh, toilets are just behind this staircase here. Um, there are fire exits um, out that way and that way and where you came in um, as well. This is really COP26 coming to the West Midlands. Um, not all of us are, are able to go up to Glasgow, Andy Street, the mayor is up there uh, today and was there yesterday as well representing us. Um, but we're here in the West Midlands during COP26 to celebrate the amazing things that many of us are doing as we strive towards our net zero goal of 2041, net zero uh, in the West Midlands. And as we not just celebrate, but also challenge ourselves, I think, to go further and faster. I want to thank uh, Bayes, Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, um, and the Midlands Energy Hub for sponsoring this event. Uh, and I want to thank you all um, in advance, really, as participants in this event. Many people will be um, uh, speaking and, uh, and talking and taking part in workshops, so thank you in advance uh, for the energy that I'm sure you'll bring today. And I'm really excited because I think net zero um, and the net zero challenge, if you like, I, I sometimes see it as a kind of giant jigsaw puzzle and that many of us are working on different puzzle pieces, um, if you like. And today, um, as we work through our agenda, we'll be hearing from people who are working on the, like, the transport puzzle pieces and the energy puzzle pieces and the built environment puzzle pieces and later on the green skills challenges as well. But perhaps what makes this event special and where it's kind of COP26 in one day is the way in which the whole puzzle comes together, the way in which the whole system works. And so I really hope that you take the opportunities that we have today to talk to people who are perhaps not in your bit of the puzzle, but are actually part of that wider puzzle as we try and, if you like, build that full picture of what net zero needs to look like across the West Midlands. I'd like to encourage you this morning to use um, social media as far as you possibly can to let the whole region know that we are um, meeting here today. Uh, and I should welcome those people who are joining um, the session online um, as well. Uh, so uh, that's absolutely fantastic. I don't know immediately how many people we've got online, but um, it's brilliant that we are um, broadcasting in that way too. And I'd like to really encourage you to use the hashtag, which is uh, behind me, uh, COP26 Roadshow. WM. That would be really great if you wanted to tweet about that. Um, so, first of all, to kick things off, um, we've got a short video um, from Councillor Ian Courts. Um, Councillor Courts is the portfolio holder within the Combined Authority for Energy and the Environment. He's also leader of Solihull Council, and really he should be here opening the conference, but unfortunately um, he's one of many who has tested positive for COVID uh, in uh, the last week, and so he's having to isolate. But instead, um, he sent us a video. So um, if we could run that video, that would be fantastic. Good morning. 
and a warm welcome to you all. This is a really important day and I'm just sorry that COVID has stopped me joining you. Uh, I'm Councillor Ian Courts, I'm leader of Solihull Metropolitan Borough Council and I'm the lead member on the West Midlands Combined Authority for Environment and Energy. And as you <coughs> might expect, energy and environment fit really closely together in the climate crisis that we are now in and today's program matches that. As we all know, the atmosphere of our planet is warming due to the effect of too much carbon, that's the greenhouse effect, caused by the over-reliance on fossil fuels over the years for our energy, that's transport and heating, for example. And that's why energy and environment are so closely connected. Now, led by Mayor Andy Street, uh, the West, Mid West Midlands Combined Authority uh, declared a cross-party climate change emergency in June 2019, and we produced the first of our five-year action plans to achieve carbon neutrality for the region. Now, we picked 2041 as the date for carbon neutrality based on science, and that date will be tough. The involvement of our partners will be critical. There's no one silver bullet to fixing climate change. Action is going to be needed by every person, organisation, company, and we will need delivery at scale. Now, there's a lot of work going on the technical and research front and we know some of the innovations we need uh, are there um, solutions already exist but we do need to grow the effort and the marketplace we need to use all that to inspire uh, to change behavior our plan for neutrality by 2041 sets out our ambition our vision and our policy but collaboration of our partners is going to be key the region and the authority, the command authority, is already taking action in a number of ways. We're greening the transport fleet. Uh, we're promoting the development of brownfield sites. We'll be setting up a neighbourhood pilot to trial building retrofit, promoting tree planting, enhancing natural capital. But meeting net zero obligations really does open up huge opportunities for our economic recovery, creating jobs and skills for areas that have been left behind by previous waves of national prosperity. So today you'll be hearing a lot about the West Midlands being the home of the green industrial revolution. And our low carbon industries are thriving, now outperforming many other sectors of our regional economy. We need to capitalize on this growth and lead that new green industrial revolution. This time we must grow whilst protecting our natural resources and reverse plan uh, the damage to our planet. Now the region has a clear plan for deli delivering those net zero ambitions and will create tens of thousands of new jobs in green industries. Um, economically, low carbon environmental goods are already the fastest growing sector in the region. 12 billion is worth to the regional economy. Thousands of companies engaged and 100,000 people employed. And we're global leaders in three low carbon sectors. Future mobility, smart energy systems, energy storage, that's batteries. <coughs> Investing in innovation to reduce industry's demand on expensive energy will create that green marketplace. Supply chains, business growth, jobs and skills that we need to power a genuine green industrial revolution in the West Midlands. Thank you very much for joining us for this event. Enjoy the day, but thank you for your part in helping us reach net zero. Thank you. Do you clap a video? I think we should just clap it anyway, shouldn't we? <laughs> so that was Councillor Courts um, opening the event. Thank you uh, to him. I'd like now to introduce Professor Jeff Leyer, who's Vice Chancellor of the University of Wolverhampton, um, has been for over 10 years now, and his career has included roles in various other cities um, around the country. So, um, Jeff, do you want to come and say a few words of welcome too? Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the University's Springfield campus. Uh, it's great to see you here, and it's great to see have this particular event here. It's particularly poignant and meaningful uh, for what we stand for and what we've sought to do over many years. You know, universities are at the forefront and the heart of shaping and changing our society, our industry, our commerce, our research all the things 
that we need to focus on. And universities, all of them, have a particular role and responsibility as we look to move towards net zero. And that role focuses on three things, what we call the three C's. It's around their campus, how they use their facilities, how they use their energy, how they use their buildings, how they develop recycling, etc. It's about their curriculum, how they influence the young people of the future. And they do that through their curriculum. And I'm not talking about things like civil engineering, which is crucially important to the environment. I'm talking about all our students, because we all need education about change and how that society needs to change. So it's getting to that sort of place in life where we educate ourselves to only use, or to only have prescribed the drugs that you need for antibiotics that you will use rather than many of us having many unused in our bathroom cabinets, etc. It is all about how we change society, how we create people for the future through our curriculum. And the third C is about our community because all universities have got communities around them, within them, and we need to influence that. And we need to shape that for the future. And that's crucially important. Five or six years ago, the university bought this particular campus here in Springfield. A brewery, the, an old brewery site that had been closed since 1992 was particularly run down. And we had a focus and a vision about how we use this particular site to do several things. To help with the regeneration of the city, to use as a demonstrator of how we can use brownfield land, old facilities, old buildings for the future. And today, thanks to our partnership with the Black Country Local Enterprise Partnership, the Combined Authority and Wolverhampton City Council, you now stand in a campus that is a mix of a number of different activities, all focused on the built environment, where we have old buildings, new buildings, modern methods of construction, a big brownfield research institute, which is crucial to this area about how we use land that has been devastated, how we turn it into things that we can uh, work with. Wolverhampton Mechanics Institute, which was the forerunner of the university, was established in 1827 at the heart of the first industrial revolution. Now we've changed a lot as a university since then and we look forward to the future and we work towards the green industrial revolution. Focusing here on development of the National Centre for the Circular Economy and the National Centre for Construction Futures launching here in January a master's course in sustainability and climate change. We can only do all of those things with our partners, with our community, but we need to be, as all universities do, shaping the future and helping to deliver that future. And that includes retrofit, new build, thinking about what we do, how we use energy, etc. So welcome to the campus, enjoy it, thank you for being here, and remember our focus has got to be about the future. And remember the words of Dame Ellen MacArthur. When she was sailing around the world, she knew that she'd be able to refit her boat when she got over the finishing line. You can't refit the planet. We need to make that change now. Thank you, Ed. Thanks very much, Jeff. And so now into our main program. Um, as I say, we're looking at bit and bits and pieces of the puzzle as we work through the day. And uh, we're going to start by thinking about transport and the future of mobility. And I want to take the opportunity actually just to uh, mention the document that uh, is on people's chairs and has been given out today. Uh, this West Midlands Low Carbon Investment Prospectus that has been pulled together by West Midlands Growth Company and um, other colleagues 
around um, the region. And the first section here, one of, the, one of the big strengths that we have in the region is around future mobility. So that's why we're spending the first session uh, today thinking about it. And it's my great pleasure to invite to the stage uh, my colleague Sandeep Shangad Shingadia, um, who's going to chair um, this session for us. Sandeep's Director of Development and Delivery at Transport for West Midlands. So Sandeep, um, looking for you. Here he is. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, yes, I'm Sandeep Shingadia. I'm Director of Development and Delivery at Transport for West Midlands, and a very warm welcome to the City of Wolverhampton on this morning as part of the, the future mobility uh, session that we're, we're hosting. So the last 18 months has seen a huge disruption to just about every industry that we know, and the mobility and transport sectors have felt the brunt of this. People have changed the way that they travel. Um, people have broken habits of a lifetime, it's fair to say. And transport remains the lifeblood of our society, connecting people, places, and the economies. Now, reimagining transport in a post-pandemic world, supporting the right technologies, creating a digitally smart and connected system, we can move towards decarbonizing transport and creating a digitally integrated future mobility system. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panelists who will be talking through this future mobility session this morning. So we have Mel Jones, a transport planner at Birmingham City Council, and we'll be providing an overview on some of the policies that the city is putting into place to tackle emissions and improve air quality, whilst also increasing access across the region to support one of the UK's fastest growing economies. We also have Richard Ball, the new vehicles director at National Express, a highly experienced engineer leading on the develop developing and the new technological solutions in the national company. And Mark Collins will talk about some of the innovations uh, coming forward in the transport systems which will help the move to net zero and encourage more people to adopt sustainable transport. So I will hand over to, to Mel first to, to go through. Over to you, Mel. Good morning everyone, uh, as Sandeep said, I'm Mel Jones, I'm Head of Transport Planning at Birmingham City Council. Something of a homecoming for me today as I was born in Wolverhampton many years ago and uh, actually did my first degree here at the University uh, of Wolverhampton again. I won't mention how long ago that was but I will say that the last time I presented on university soil it was using an overhead projector and acetate uh, sheets. So I'm just going to give you a, a whistle-stop tour this morning through the, uh, through the Birmingham Transport Plan. It's our new uh, transport uh, policy document for the city, um, and it was adopted by the Council's Cabinet actually uh, last, last month, so it now is an official policy uh, in the city. Um, in 2014, we adopted our Birmingham Connected Transport Strategy, uh, and we always start these presentations by saying we, we, did, we didn't throw Birmingham Connected in the bin. It had a lot of really good stuff in it. It had a lot of the right ingredients. But what it didn't do was set out our plans in a, in a bold and ambitious enough way to reflect the aspirations of the city, the sustainable, inclusive economic growth agenda, but also a lot of the challenges we face around air quality, uh, around climate change and around uh, uh, equity and, and inequality. So the transport plan has, uh, has four key objectives that, that underpin it. They're, they're up there on the screen, I, I, I won't read them out to you, but the key point for us is that it's not a plan that is purely about environmental factors. It, it's about, as I've said, responding to the growth agenda. It's about a city that's fairer. It's about creating a transport system that actually meets the needs of our citizens uh, and our stakeholders. We've got some of the most deprived communities uh, in, in the country. We know that people are excluded from uh, access to healthcare, to education, to job opportunities because transport isn't fit for purpose for, for them. So the plan is our response to a range of social, environmental and economic objectives, but 
it's actually the climate emergency, the need to decarbonise transport, to decarbonise the economy, is actually what is driving the pace of change um, and, and the speed with which we need to implement uh, a lot of these policies. So the plan is framed around four key principles. The first is around reallocating road space. I like to say that this is a double whammy because what it does is it has a, a dual effect of improving the alternatives uh, by providing uh, priority for public transport, walking and, and, and cycling, but at the same time actually making travel by private car relatively less attractive. The next big move is around transforming the city centre. So this thinks about the, the last mile of a, of a lot of journeys, uh, creating an environment within our ring road that is conducive to, uh, to walking and cycling, reducing the speed, volume and dominance of, of, of vehicular traffic. There's a number of measures uh, that are being brought forward under the transforming the city centre umbrella. The first is around something that we call in this, the city segment, so that divides the city centre up into, a, into six cells, a bit like slices of pizza or cake. Uh, movement between the cells is unrestricted for public transport, walking and cycling, but you can't travel in, in a private vehicle from one cell to another without going back out uh, onto, um, on, onto the ring road. Uh, one of the more controversial things within this is looking at the future of the A38 through the city centre recognising that that's not necessarily something that we would day, do from day one, but the vision has to be for a city centre that no, needs a, no longer needs a whacking great road running through, running through the middle of it, bringing in all those vehicles and, and, and causing, uh, causing severance and, and taking up space. The third principle is around prioritising active travel in local neighbourhoods, so very similar to the Transforming the City Centre, it's about providing environments conducive to walking and cycling in and around the areas where, where, where people live, uh, having an environment that's much less dominated by cars, more 20 mile an hour speed limits, measures to encourage people to walk to school, measures to encourage people to walk to their local shops and services, and the ability to access, access the transit network without having to get into a car first, so being able to walk to a bus stop, being able to walk to uh, a train station. And then the last principle is around managing parking through, uh, managing demand through parking measures. This recognises that there is absolutely a relationship between people's mode choice decisions and the price, availability and convenience of parking at their trip ends. So we've just uh, this week adopted a new uh, set of parking standards um, which is much more heavily restrictive than it previous, previously was, links actually the number of parking spaces provided in new developments to the level of accessibility by public transport in any given location, but also things like curbside management strategies, pricing mechanisms in favour of short stay over, over, over long stay, uh, and also doing a feasibility study into a workplace parking levy so that we can start to look at the impact of private non-residential parking on people's mode choice decisions. So I will just wind up by um, highlighting some of the sort of the challenges that, 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 that we face, sort of wet, wet the appetite for a bit of discussion perhaps. Uh, we do uh, need to, uh, we are moving forward now to develop a delivery plan for the transport plan, so that's a set of policies and principles, so the work is now starting on actually working out what, what, what schemes we're going to deliver and testing those uh, against the objectives and looking at the decarbonisation uh, impacts of those. Resource is always an issue. We've just had a significant um, sort of injection of funding through the city region sustainable transport settlement. It's a good start. It's nowhere near enough. Uh, and even if we had all this cash to spend on these transport schemes, there is, there is a shortage of the right kind of skills in the transport sector to be able to, to move forward and, and, and deliver on, on these schemes. So something that we are looking to address. Ultimately, for any of these policies to work, it's all about securing behaviour change. People are quite willing to uh, 
reroute, so go a different way, or re-time, we see spreading of peak periods. What we need is for people to reduce, so think about whether journeys need to be made at all, following on from a lot of the lessons we've learned through the pandemic, and remode. How do we actually get people to change their behaviour to use more sustainable modes of transport? Support for the vision, everybody's got this motherhood at an apple pie view of what the future should look like, but that, that needs individuals to actually change their behaviour um, and people support the vision, but then when you bring forward schemes to, to reallocate road space uh, and, do, and do a lot of these more controversial things, uh, we get quite a lot of uh, uh, objection from citizens uh, and, and from stakeholders. And the feedback that we get always says you have to improve the alternatives before you can start to retrain, restrain car use. But as I mentioned earlier, with things like reallocating road space, those two go hand in hand. And we do need to be really careful about the <coughs> short term uh, carbon budget and air quality impacts of making things worse in order to make them better uh, in the long term. So really you know, important to think about how we can make sustainable modes the obvious choice and not something that people do for the, for the greater good, but because it is actually the, the best choice of mode for that particular journey. And then finally, the importance of doing this in a collaborative way so that citizens and stakeholders feel like it's being done with them, not to them. But again, that's a challenge when we're actually trying to change people's behaviour in a way that they don't necessarily want to uh, and isn't natural to them. So. If you are interested in any inf more information on the transport plan, uh, you can view a version of it uh, online at www.birmingham.gov.uk forward slash transport plan. And I look forward to any questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mel. And that's a really useful insight into some of the policy direction, as Mel says, the importance of how we actually deliver against that in the future to make sure we can actually get that movement moving to, to, to achieve those overarching objectives. I'd now like to introduce, um, well, invite Richard over to the lectern to go through his presentation. Thank you, Richard. Good morning, all. Um, Again, I don't really want to share my age, but I've had 40 years in the bus industry so far, so I'm knocking on a bit now. Um, I started back when uh, buses had two doors, conductors. So I'm sure you understand that my age here. So just a little bit of that, what I can share with you today. Um, I'd like to share with you our journey, how we started, a little bit of experience of electric vehicles, our plans for introducing hydrogen, some opportunities this process provides and some challenges that you might encounter. And then if you've got any questions at the end, I'll happily answer those. So as you will have seen, we've made a public commitment uh, that we won't buy another diesel bus. Um, we bought our last one in 2019, that, that one's called Janet. Um, but really, to, we, we'd started our process before that in terms of reducing the emissions from our vehicles, both retrofitting existing equipment and buying the most efficient vehicles we could at Euro 6. Um, our target is absolutely resolutely to, to be uh, zero emission by 2030. Um, and, and we're looking at the white coach fleet too, that'll be 2035. And we've similar ambitions for our businesses uh, outside the UK. For our electric fleet, we're currently running 19 at Yardley Wood and 10 over at Coventry. Um, when they come back to the garage, they've got a two-gun charger, we charge them up. We have a company called Zenobi who manage the charging process, and I'll go a little bit into people, infrastructure and vehicles later on. But one of the key issues is making sure that you minimise the demand on the grid and, and actively charge your vehicles so that they're all ready for service first thing in the morning. A really important process for this is, is training the drivers to make sure they match up with this new technology and understand exactly the vehicles they're driving and how they can get the best from them. So electric buses more, you know, we, we've been working with, with uh, the City Council and with WMCA on a bid for the electric bus city. Um, our intention is to get 130 double deckers in 2022 and we're looking to roll out single deckers slightly later. 
The garage we operate in at Coventry is probably the newest on our patch. It was built in 1986, just, just around the deregulation. Even then, we will need to do a total conversion there. You know, this was a garage designed for diesel vehicles. We now have to uh, change that infrastructure so that it's suitable for electric. One of the challenges is the supply. Um, and, and one of the ways we've been trying to negate some of the issues with supply is fitting solar panels on the roof. And also, we're using recycled bus batteries to actually charge vehicles when charge the batteries when the electricity grid is available and then releasing those to, that to buses overnight and as we see we during that transition process we're even converting the ancillary vehicles to electric too so for hydrogen buses with, with our friends at birmingham city council we'll be running 20 hydrogen buses by the end of this year um, we're working on a bid with DFT to, to, to get some funding for considerably more. So I think w one of the challenges with hydrogen buses is that people see them as different to electric and actually it's an electric bus with an onboard hydrogen charger. It's still an, ultimately it's still an electric vehicle. So some of the opportunities when you're creating a zero emission fleet. Yes, there are genuine reduction in particulates and emissions per passenger kilometre, that, that goes un unsaid. But there are also some people related issues as well. You know, developing our driving staff so that they understand how to get the best from the vehicles. Regenerative braking is a great example for that. You know, with a little bit of extra care with the drivers, they can save a lot of energy. And in the winter time, when you're using some of the battery energy to provide internal heating, that really makes a difference. For our engineering skills, you know, ultimately it's still a bus, but the engineering transition that we're making between diesel fitters and those who are working on zero emission vehicles requires us to retrain our staff. It's really important that they understand how to embrace this vehicle technology and they've got the necessary skills to be able to uh, maintain these vehicles for us for the future. In terms of the vehicle specification, I think we talked a little earlier on about the use of the road space and, and, and one of the ways that you can really help drive modal shift is to make sure the vehicles really reflect what the customers want. So every ZEV that we buy is to our highest spec, it's to platinum specification. Um, we're looking to do two things from that, we're trying to encourage the modal shift and get a secondary emission saving from all those people who are coming out of cars. I mentioned earlier, we, we, we're using the support of central government and WMCA to offset some of the costs of introduction. With these, with these changes uh, to, out towards improving ZEV penetration, you need to watch for funding opportunity and when it comes along, embrace it. One of the experiences we've had is that the reliability of our electric fleet has been really good, you know? And, and, and when you look at moving people onto public transport, reliability is important, cost affairs are important, timeliness is important. All of these things are, are, are dovetailing together. Finally, be, because we're leading on some issues, and I'll talk a little about coaches in a moment, we want an opportunity to, to lead our coach division, but share that best practice with others on the same journey. You know, the number of, of businesses that are actively um, embracing ZEVs um, and their engineers, uh, they're relatively tight-knit. So I know guys in Liverpool, Aberdeen, uh, London, and, and we're sharing the best practice between us so that when, when someone has a learning, we, we all share from it. So some of the challenges, um, I think it's fair to say that if you look particularly at long distance coaches, we, we're needing to work with our suppliers to understand and develop an appropriate solution. At the moment, I think that's hydrogen, but generally technology flow is from high volume vehicles like cars through commercial vehicles down to coaches and buses. In this case, commercial vehicles are a little less focused and actually the technology jump has been between cars and coaches and buses. And that, I think that's partially due to the funding routes. We haven't had 100 years of development like we've had with diesel. You know, the backbone of the existing infrastructure in terms of filling stations, particularly for hydrogen, that hasn't grown to support it yet. And we're at the leading edge of that. 
we have a number of um, uh, depots in our estate that are from the 1930s. When you change the type of vehicle that you're running in a depot, you have to consider, you know, how will I adapt the existing depot to take into account this new technology? A re another really good point on infrastructure is really simple things like, can the existing infrastructure you have, the, the size of the pipe you've got of the electricity cable coming into the depot, can it really cope with the charging requirements? Um, uh, again, the work we're doing at Coventry at the moment says no, and we'll have to support that. There was a lot of talk when ZEVs were first, it, it were first mooted about perceived range limitations and, and this whole concept of range anxiety that I think people feel with cars. I think that's rapidly becoming overcome. You know, we, we've got greater vehicle capacity now, we've got better vehicle efficiency, we do better vehicle planning. The less cars that are on the road, the, uh, the more freely the buses are to move around. Uh, for us, we currently don't run out of charging service. And I think the final element is it's clear that ZEVs are more expensive than their diesel counterparts. And therefore, you know, you have to embrace these funding solutions when you see them. So that's a little bit of, of, of us. I'll be happy to answer questions later. Thank you. That's a really... Um, a really useful uh, backdrop to, to some of the work that's going on. Bus by far carries the most amount of public transport journeys across the West Midlands and indeed lots of other metropolitan areas. So it's really good to understand how bus will play play a part in that entire decarbonisation journey with the use of technology. Um, on to our final speaker for this session. Uh, I'd like to invite Mark up. It's a bit of a mark on the front seat as well. Yep, so good morning, uh, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Mark Collins, I'm from Transport for West Midlands and I look after the Future Transport Zone programme here in the West Midlands as well. And um, this morning I want to talk to you about sort of managing transport systems and specifically the role that policy, innovation and uh, play in, in behaviour change that we, we need as a, as a region. Okay, so a little bit about the, the sort of the problem statement that we face. The West Midlands Combined Authority has set a, a net zero target by 2041 and, and fundamentally as part of that the, the, the real sort of not issue that we have is that the way we collectively choose to travel and move goods around the region is unsustainable with that target in mind. So let me just explain a little bit about the, some, of the, some of the sort of the, the data behind this and apologies for those right at the back, they're a little bit difficult to see but, but the sort of the salient numbers of these this is a graph sort of charting car use over the last 100 years. The, the, the graph here finishes in 2015 at 400 billion miles travelled. The, the data from 2019 suggests that we're at over 500 billion miles travelled by car. So what are the reasons for this? Clearly it's a convenience, but actually when you study the relative cost of travel by car compared to what we have in here, which is bus and, and train above it, you actually see the cars are relative entities that are quite cost effective for a lot of people. And it being also probably the most convenient, time efficient and uh, sort of flexible way of traveling around the, around the region, you can sort of see why we've got a, an endemic problem with car travel. And not only that, what we see is that 85% of all journeys taken in the region by car are not actually into town centres. So what we're seeing is a lot of radial routes by car, which are not normally the, the transport routes that are supported by public transport measures. So you've got this other issue where actually the, the alternative for people isn't necessarily that viable. Coupled with that, we've also seen that a, a large percentage of low mileage trips are those, are those that are preferenced by car. So all the trips that are taken, 59% of those that are between one and two miles are taken by car. That is a really significant proportion of all the journeys. Coupled with that, we're also, we also know that 63% of all car journeys in the West Midlands are single occupant. So you've got this position where a lot of journeys that are quite low mileage are being taken by a lot of people that are traveling by themselves in a really unsustainable way. And I think there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of information out there which sort of charts our progress to net zero. Some of the most sort of startling statistics out there, and I'll read you one that was from the, uh, the Tyrrell Centre, which said that even if by 2035 all vehicles that were sold were low emission, we need to reduce the number of car journeys by 58%. 
That is millions, or is billions of miles that we've got to save. So what are we going to do about it? A big problem, and Mel has sort of outlined some of the, the, the strategic responses that Birmingham have taken, but equally the Westminster Combined Authority have a, a similar approach. So one of the levers that we can pull is around strategy, uh, and this is an outline of our local transport plan that we're, we're about to publish, which builds upon the regional activities that are also going on. And it's a reflection of the fact that transport is woven into the fabric of our society, and actually just tackling one individual issue in this is, is not going to work. It's got to be a blended approach between recognizing the social agenda, the environmental influences that we have to tackle as part of this, but also the economic ambitions that we also have. And we've got to find the right balance between each of those, each of those factors in order to have a strategy which works. Now, a strategy is a really important tool for us, but actually it's not the only one when we start to consider behavior change. So I, I list this, which is really looking at how an individual would view elements of travel. And there's a number of different factors that are place-based and also person-based as well. So in terms of the place-based ones, the policy and the strategy are, are an important lever that we can pull. Equally, the infrastructure, i.e., is there a road outside your home? Is there a cycle path outside your home? The sort of the core fundamentals allow people to travel. The commodity or the service, i.e. their access to either a car or other services that are local to them, you know, that, that specific availability. The energy requirements, so it's, it's no good to have an electric car if you've got no facility to charge it. And then equally, the influence of technology in this space, so things like mobility as a service, i.e. the ability to aggregate services together to allow a person to, to take um, a selection of services quite conveniently. And then we have the sort of the people-centric ones. And what we've done through our studies is establish probably three key elements that effectively influence a level of choice in their sort of a modal activity. Who that person is, i.e. their views, their values, and, and elements around their sort of social economic ability. The journey that they take, is it a commuting journey? Is it a leisure journey? Each of those has a significant influence on their ability to take one mode or another. And equally, their, their physical availability at both the location in which they start and which they end their journey. And so what you can see here is a really complicated picture of understanding, actually there's no silver bullet in this space. We've got to understand for which people, which levers are most effective at driving sustainable behavior. So how are we gonna do that? Well, one of the tools that we've developed through the Future Transport Zone is really to try and segment the population. So we're really looking to try and understand what groups of people have what views? So this who element of that diagram. And what we've got is a, is a segment analysis that's broken down into sort of eight core, core areas. And through that, we've developed a load of per, uh, persona activity. And we've also developed what we call our market research online community. Our ability to communicate with these groups, to trial out different things, to test their views, and understand a really pulse of, of how they're thinking about transport at the moment. And then we're looking to go a bit deeper. Again, apologies for the small writing on this, but I, I can articulate what we've got here. So this was a study that we're doing at the University of Warwick around their sort of staff and student travel, and it's one that we repeated elsewhere in the region. And this is looking mode agnostic about understanding what is driving a level of behavior. So this is looking at need states. So what we can see here is actually time efficiency, convenience, and flexibility are consistently, and this is not unique to the University of Warwick area, are the drivers for a lot of behavior. So what this is telling us, in order to be able to compete with the car, which is the most time efficient, convenient, and flexible for most people, how do we curate a mobility experience that actually is greater than the sum of its parts? How can we sort of look around elements such as value for money, reliable presence, environmentally friendly, to actually over-index on those elements to make the overall end-to-end -end experience more than just, um, just those sort of elements that currently have a lot of sway? And, and I suppose this also points to a, a shift in our thinking. Traditionally, we, we concentrate a lot on mode. And actually, if we're going to sort of be able to sort of compete with a car, we've got to look to, to deliver end-to-end -end experiences for which modes play a part. And I'll explain a little bit more on this next slide. So really, if, if we want to try and amplify experience for an individual, generally an individual doesn't ride the bus just because they want to ride the bus. Although some do, I'm sure. The reality is they're transacting a journey. They're, they're wanting an experience. So how can we amplify that experience so actually it makes the bus more attractive because their facility is greater? And I think this is an area that's currently quite unexplored within, within transport sectors. And actually, there's, there's loads of opportunity, especially that, the opportunity of time. 
that you don't get in a car because you're driving. So what can we do with that, that capability that the, the car cannot compete with? And I suppose just the, just the uh, last sort of uh, statement on here. We're trying to understand really what's working. So I said before, we're, we're really trying to understand for what people, what incentives, what modes of transport, what times for what journeys are it actually most effective in order, in order to elicit that change. So working with the University of Warwick, what we've done, we've amplified the number of services that are available to that local population by quite some margin. Everything from e-scooters to our, our, our localised on-demand bus service, car sharing, car club, etc. So actually we've got a really good modal mix in that region. And we're doing a series of quantitative and qualitative assessments across that population to understand who they are, where they're going, for what journey, for what purpose. To try, to try and find what we're calling sort of golden threads of information that link that person to that modal choice. Because if you sample people and ask them what they do, they don't always tell you the truth. So this is really a way of, of unearthing that position. And with that insight, what we hope to be able to do is for a given population in another area, we can say, this is the most effective incentive, this is the most effective mode, and have a really sort of targeted infrastructure which is responsive to the needs of the population at large. So that was uh, last slide, and thank you very much for your time. So thank you, Mark. So we've had three perspectives there. We've had a real sort of insight into where the future policy direction is going from, from Mel. We've had Mark talk, uh, sorry, Richard talk about the role of technology in decarbonising bus, and then Mark taking us through the very detailed insights into what can actually drive behavioural change. And all three of these working together can really help us move this agenda around decarbonising transport, but taking us into the space around smart mobility. We have now an opportunity to ask questions. I'm sure you've got plenty from all the information that you've seen there. So I'll open up the floor. We have about 15 minutes for, for your questions and discussion. Gentleman at the back there. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Ian Jenkins, uh, Campaign for Rail. Can I ask Mel, please, about the sprint route on the A34? Uh, if, you, if you recall, when the uh, metro was proposed down to the Scott Arms, there was a furore about it. Uh, I think it was polit probably politically organised, but nevertheless, it didn't get off the ground. How confident are Birmingham City Council that sprint buses will work? That's a very good question. Um, I think. I personally don't like to make too much distinction between trams, sprint uh, and, and buses. I think what we know a lot about um, public transport is the factors that make people want to use it. Is, it. is it clean? Is it on time? Are the journeys reliable? And over time, hopefully, be quicker than, uh, than, than other modes. Um, talking about the transport plan, the point about the policies in our, in our transport plan is actually about the things that are in the council's gift to change and reallocating road space is something that is within our control and whether we are reallocating road space to trams, buses or, or sprint and actually a lot of the, um, a lot of, well, all of the sprint infrastructure is actually available to improve bus services along that, uh, along, along that corridor as well so absolutely we, ha we have we have faith in where we've reallocated that road space where we've changed that that setup because it's designed to provide priority for public transport and that's absolutely in line with um absolutely in line with the transport plan thank you thank you mel um the lady right at the back over there Good morning, thank you so much for your presentations this morning. I was wondering, uh, what level of collaboration do you have with organizations across sectors to drive behavior change? So perhaps creative industries to get people thinking differently um, about transportation modes. I think each of you touched either implicitly or explicitly on the behavior change element. And I was just curious um, what innovative methods you're using to drive that behavior change. Over to Mark, I think. That one. Yeah, okay. um, so, I, th I don't think there's one, one specific 
at solution to this. I, th I think where we, where we found lots of sort of good success is the collaboration with employers and, and, those, and those areas or those companies that have trust Hi, with a population. Sorry. So our site at the University of Warwick is one that whereby we, through that collaboration and a shared vision as well, it has to be said, in terms of our view around sustainable transport, offering lots of viable choice to people, has been really powerful as a message because it's all well and good Transport for West Midlands or Birmingham City Council telling you these are the things we want you to do. In, in order to sort of transact that, you need it almost coming from a level of trusted source. And, and that trusted source for the University of Warwick example has been the, the staff um, and, and the sort of hierarchy there really getting on board, promoting it and reinforcing it because these behaviours don't change overnight. And I think if, if we are going to be successful in this space, you're right, we do have to have a groundswell of uh, companies and organisations that effectively sit alongside us and recognise the same issue, want the same thing and work with us to communicate some of the things because it's, it, it's, a, it's a real mixture here of having both that inclination, that sort of sustained support marketing, the physical capability in terms of the modal choice and also that sort of capability within the population to access that choice. So it's a really sort of complicated mix. Um, and, and, and therefore, having one of those arms of, of that sort of constant support is, is key in order to be able to be successful in that space. Um, so hopefully that answers your, your question. Thank you. Um, gentleman in the middle here. I'm here representing ACOX Greener, which is a community association in ACOX Green. And we have together with the ACOX Green Neighbourhood Forum, uh, set up a small group who are looking at how we need, as an area, to respond to COVID and the changes like the climate change in order to cope with changing transport. And we are looking for who we can work with because we have no resources. We have cross-party support and we have local support but we don't have the resources to actually make plans. And so this is a plea to work with some of you in order to see how we can go forward, um, see what's happening, make plans and make change happen. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment. And I know from some of the work that Transport for West Midlands has done previously, we have worked with um, uh, associations, we've done some work around ACOX Green, I know the City Council have done some work around ACOX Green. So yes, that will definitely be something that we can, we can pick up and, and engage with you on in the future. Any further questions at the front here? Thank you very much. Paul Hanson from the University of Wolverhampton. Uh, welcome back, Mel. Delighted to see you here. Um, at the last RICS Global Conference, um, the Mayor of Vienna talked about um, a strategy that the forefathers have put in place, which meant every citizen within their region could travel for a euro a day, so they all had their sort of annual pass, 365 euros which strongly encourage that greener engagement in using public transport. Do you think, with everything that's been talked about today, we're anywhere near that plan and that vision, or do you think that's utopia? It's a very good question, so who would like to come in on that one first? Mel, would you like to give a BCC perspective? We've, I've, I've, I've written at least half a dozen responses. <laughs> Uh, to correspondence on this, it, 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 it is an issue, you know, if, if you want people to use public transport, m make, make it free. Uh, but nothing, nothing in this world is, is free. There is a, a, a finite amount of resource in, in, in the public purse. I think we are increasingly creative um, as local transport authorities in, in terms of how we leverage funding and, and, how, we, and how we ring fence that and how you know, thing with our investment in the clean air zone, how we've protected the income from, from that. I mentioned a workplace parking levy. Um, we've got bus lane enforcement and things like that where we've got, re we've got revenue streams that are protected and, 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 uh, and invested back in, into transport. Um, but at the moment, the focus on that is very much about getting the capital infrastructure investment um, right and actually spending it on physical things that, 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 you, that you can see. The cost of public transport is, is, is a barrier. Um, it, 
it ex that's one of the key things that excludes people. Um, you know, there's probably a lot of people in this room are in a fortunate position of maybe being in a position to be able to afford to have a car that they don't use for all journeys and still be able to pay for public transport on top of it. A lot of people don't. Uh, a lot of people don't have that. But when there's pressures on the public purse, we have to take a balanced view as to where to put that subsidy. Um, uh, and, and I think ultimately something like that would need to be led na would need to be led nationally, uh, rather rather than uh, on the basis of of, of done on, on, on in, a, in a regional way. Thank you, Mel. Um, Mark, would you like to come in as well? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting point, isn't it, around around the sort of the significance of um, value for money and, and some of this. Um, it's it's a really interesting perspective a lot of people have about the sunk cost in vehicles. People just don't recognise the cost of running a car because it is it's either in chunks or it is, it is a sunk cost that's largely hidden. Um, and, and I think what's, what we found through our, some of our studies is actually value for money has, an, has a significant influence, but it's not the biggest influencer. And we've, we've got to sort of recognise that actually even if you made it free, is it, is it still expressing the convenience factor for people, the flexibility that people want? Possibly not on a whole scale position. So actually, how, how can we think differently about this problem that isn't just relatively simply just making it a lot cheaper? I think, I think it's more deep-rooted than that. I think we've got associations with car and, and our perspective on that is, is ingrained from a very young age. And, and these are the things that we've got to try and address that underlie um, our, our position we've got ourselves in. So, yeah, that's be my addition to that. Thank you. Um, got time for one more question before we wrap up. I will take the gentleman at the back over there. Thank you very much. Mattia Parati from uh, Science and Industry Research Center in Wolverhampton. Um, so two, two comments really and questions as well. Uh, and it stems off what you've just said really. And uh, it's the fact that we need to incentivize in some sort of way. And I want to bring to your attention two examples. The first one is an initiative in Ireland that is called Civic Dollars. And basically what this company is trying to do is to incentivize people to be more, um, let's say, responsible, both in terms of health and in terms of uh, social responsibility with climate change, to move greener, right? To tackle those mini journeys that are less than one mile. And either you go walking and do that uh, or uh, go on buses and you can earn civic dollars, which you, at the moment you can donate to charity and it's, it's good that way. So I think there should be more than of this sort of initiative. It's not realistic to make public transportation free. It's just not, it, it cannot be an option. The second thing that I want to bring to your attention is something that uh, occurred in Milan. I'm originally from Milan, big city in Italy, a lot of business, and they tried to tackle those, those small journeys, and they did it by a similar way that has been, I noticed, outside. There's Voy um, electrics, scooters, mopeds, however you want to call them. And uh, what they provided, it's something cool to, r to run around with, something that was fun. Um, the in infrastructure in Italy wasn't ready yet to be able to, uh, you know, there's not enough cycling routes and paths to do that. Nonetheless, they, they've introduced this sort of mobility and business people thought it was actually fun, it was electric, it was quick, because it's the flexibility, right, in, in moving, in reaching the destination. We're not as fortunate in the UK with the weather. How many businessmen here today would want to get on a scooter when it's a bit brisk and possibly slippery outside? So it's also a matter of uh, being safe. That's why the, the car is so good because it gives you a sheltered environment that gets you from point A to B dry. You know, we've got to somehow mimic that and incentivize that and promote that. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank you for all your questions. Hopefully you found that a really informative session on future mobility. I'd like to thank our speakers once again. And if you can thank them in the usual way, that would be great. Thank you.
So thanks very much, um, Sandeep and team. Thank you all for your questions as well. Um, we're going to try and keep you involved as we go through, um, uh, so, so to make it as interactive as we possibly can. And I'm really looking forward to this next session um, because this is the, 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 the real fun part of transport. We've got three companies that are going to come and talk to us about some of their um, innovations. And even just the name of the first one uh, makes me really, really curious to know um, what on earth this is about. Um, so I'm now um, introducing uh, Chanjit and Lash Sarana and their company Electric Zoo. So do you want to come and tell us about your company and then we'll have a chat uh, as, to, uh, as, to, as to what we can learn some more about it. So do come here. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Chanjit. Good morning, I'm Lash. And we've been invited here to tell you a little bit more about Electric Zoo and some of the, the benefits that you can gain from going on an electric journey. So our journey dates back to uh, 2012 when our 12-year-old daughter came home and decided she wanted to study sustainability. It was probably not a word that um, was very familiar with people at, back in 2012 or anything that we considered. So at the time, we were running... Uh, a Porsche dealership based in the West Midlands, um, a, a large scale organisation that we'd built up over 30 years and we decided to go on the journey with, with our daughter to see what sustainability was all about. And that led us to, uh, to change our whole business model, change our, our lives and we actually gave the business away to our employees at the time because we we believe we couldn't continue supplying, elect, uh, supplying uh, gas guzzling vehicles um, in the way that we were at the time. Following on from that, she's gone off and studied um, global sustainability. She's graduated this year, and we've been on a journey since about 2014, looking at a way that we can get more people engaged on zero emission vehicles. And possibly back in 2014, there weren't many vehicles that people had a choice of, and resistance to, to change, the barriers of infrastructure were all um, challenges that individuals could see that would prevent them going electric. Moving on, we've formed Electric Zoo, and the business today is about getting people on that journey. I'll let Lash tell you a bit more about it. Yeah, so just going on from the group discussion earlier, it is all about change and how we can bring change about, how we can all individually help make it happen. This is what we've tried to do with Electric Zoo to transition from ice to nice. So that is internal combustion engine to no internal combustion engine through the use of electric cars. We at Electric Zoo have got a platform where you simply go on, choose your car, choose the term, populate your details, click and collect. We started in Coventry last July in the midst of a lockdown with three cars. Today we have 100 cars and the plan next year is to go to 1,000 cars. It's proved very, very popular, it's very simplistic and it works. But the biggest thing that it does is brings back the zero emission change. So what we've learnt on our journey, going back to our daughter and sustainability, the whole thing kick-started in 2012 with a sample lecture at Warwick University for sustainability. Warwick University had never run the course. They were planning five years ahead and getting the commercial, commercial viability of it by inviting potential students who would take part in this. We went along to sample lecture and three hours later realised that we didn't know about climate change, we didn't know about rising ocean levels, we didn't know about air quality and air pollution and those were the things that convinced us to change. Finding out little facts that we've all gone through COVID now, pre-COVID, going back to 2012, 2013, 14 and to present day, the government spends 20 billion pounds a year on treating people for air pollution. 40,000 people a year die in the UK from air pollution. And we felt so strongly about it that we actually changed our way of life, 
gave up our business. We wanted to go in a space to help. What change can we bring about? And that's where Electric Zoo was formed. We did try desperately with Coventry City Council to set up an electric vehicle learning centre where people could find out about electric cars, but predominantly actually find out the benefits of electric cars and why the transition should happen. That didn't come about, but what it did reinforce was that we needed to do something and we needed to provide the education, which we did for um, three or four years by creating uh, a little black box. You could put it into your car, no need to plug it in, no need to wire it in, simply drive for a month and after a month we could basically trace your journey data and let you know all your journeys, whether they could be covered using an electric car, if so, what type of car could you convert to or transition to, and how much money and how much carbon it would save you. Just as we were about to launch that, which was February 2020, obviously four weeks later, COVID hit, so that put that, put that to bed. Uh, that didn't really happen, and that's why we actually transitioned or pivoted to a subscription model. So with our business now, in trying to bring back about change, the three questions or the three concerns of most people with electric cars, they're too expensive. They don't have a long enough range, I can't go about my journeys, and where do I charge? So we've answered the first two questions by our model, our business model, which only actually requires one month's advance rental. It only requires one month minimum use case. You can go up to 24 months. The longer you choose at the start of the journey, the cheaper it is per month. In terms of the charging infrastructure, if you have the facility or the ability to park off street, you can actually charge off a three pin we call it a granny lead, you can charge off a three pin lead for short term, not recommended for everyday use for long term, but that would help, help transition people to know whether they could actually live with an electric car, whether it works for them in their personal use case. And again, our, our business model allows to have one car for one month and have another car for another month until you find the right car or the best car for your own personal use case. This model, as I say, has proved very successful and up in Scotland we were invited by Glasgow Council to actually set up a hub there. Now there, the government over there in Scotland is slightly different. They are offering free charging to anybody with an electric car. If you're a local resident, you get a charge card you can use any of the charge point infrastructure in Scotland for free because they obviously they want to transition. Now th th these sort of initiatives are coming here. We heard on the panel they didn't actually elaborate on how they're going to use government funding to help but the government funding will come and it will help. There are various um, cases all around the country of how different councils are bringing this to the fore, and I've I, I just given you the example of Scotland. But we as a business are here to help transition to electric. So if we can do that, if anybody has any questions, we are actually in the room across the road. Um, we will be there. Please come and see us in person. Alternatively, ask us a, a Q&A now. Um, we just want to bring change about help people, help preserve the planet for future generations. And just a little point on our daughter, she not only graduated, but she graduated with the first, and she was actually on stage at COP with how young kids can help preserve the planet yesterday. So um, that's a really uh, motivational, inspirational, true story that we're so proud of but we're also very proud that we're actually helping to bring change about in the real world to anybody and everybody, so it benefits us all. Thank you. Thank you.
So I want to bring you in with your questions um, in, in, in just a moment. But um, Chanjit, Lash, that's a great story. And um, really, you must be very proud with your, with your daughter as well and the way she's inspired you as a whole family to do, uh, to do what, you're, what you're doing. But I wonder, I'm going to be a bit cynical here. With, with, with your customers, do they see things more in kind of green sustainability terms, or are they just looking for a great car? And I'm keen to, keen, to, keen to understand, I'm keen to understand sort of what your customers say to you about, about Electric Zoo. It's probably a mixture of both. I think um, the fact that the model gives people opportunity to try something. At the moment, there's still that reservation of, can I drive electric, as Lash alluded to earlier. And our model gives people the opportunity to try a car, so they then know that they can make that change. And it, it predominantly, in the, certainly in the early days, it's been con uh, an environmental consideration rather than just the cost aspect. But once people have driven an electric car, they then realize that actually it's far easier, it's better. There are incentives for, for you to drive in some counties without having to pay for parking. Charging can be free at some locations. And it starts to help to build that momentum of, of the reason why you, you'd want to drive electric. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, on, on that, there's two, two aspects to this. When we started out, out on the journey, it was 2014. Um, speaking to people about electric cars, most people would stop you actually mid-conversation and say, um, no, I'm, I'm fine with my diesel. Mm. There's no need. Electric cars, not happening in my lifetime. Mm. I don't need it. They'll never work. Mm. They won't take off. And the biggest thing that happened to bring the change about was COVID. Mm. I think we all realized, you know what? You can actually go out for a walk and breathe not necessarily the cleanest air, but cleaner air than what we'd been breathing. You could see further, you felt better. Mm. And this, as I said, we started a business absolutely in the middle of lockdown mm. and without any promotion other than a website, the, the, the success that we've had is phenomenal. But now with government's 2030 strategy of um, not producing any more petrol or diesel cars, this has really started to gain momentum. Mm -hmm. COP happening here, mm -hmm. again, it's highlighted so much that so many people didn't know. Mm -hmm. And it's on our doorstep, it's on our watch, this is happening now. We have to do something about it. And people are actually taking action now. Businesses are being, mm -hmm. you know, oh, we want to transition, how do we do this? Can we try two cars, can we go? So it's happening even on a personal use case. And I just wonder though, given what Mark was saying in the previous session, whether it's not just about environment and green and electric vehicles, but actually it's about convenience. Yeah. And do you get customers talking to you about, and I'm sure they won't use the term, but mobility as a service. They don't yeah. actually want to own a car anymore. Actually, they quite like the model that you're, you're mm. suggesting. And, and the usership model is, is far more attractive. People don't want to be inconvenienced. They don't want to spend ages looking for insurance. They want to use the car when they need it, and then they can hand it back when they don't. Mm. They don't have to maintain it because that's covered as part, part of the, the subscription, but people want that flexibility. And I think with the way that um, w work has changed in terms of people working remotely and not be always having to travel into work, that, that convenience has been adapted. Mm. And what's their biggest complaint? I don't think we've had we haven't got any enough cars. Re regarding, yeah. <laughs> we haven't got enough cars. Uh, we cannot get the cars fast enough. At the moment, the lead times for electric vehicles um, yeah. are, are quite long. They're going anything from um, six months to even 18 months now. We've been quoted on some of the models. But it, it, it's the whole model. We're going through a modal shift of transport. It's the biggest change that's happening in the transport industry for over 100 years. And a lot of people don't know that electric cars were actually with us over 100 years ago. So it was only thanks to Henry Ford who brought out the Model T and, and made it half price compared to an electric car that the electric car actually phased out. Mm -hmm. So the, with the model or the modal change of transportation is we are taking it from ownership to usership. We're transitioning from petrol and diesel to electric but the next shift will be sharing cars. So not only do I or people want to use a car only when they need it, 
they don't necessarily even want it on their doorstep mm -hmm. for more than what they need. So I can see the day will come when we will all have a, 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 a car park or a facility for parking cars yeah. at the end of the street. You need a car, you walk to the end of your street, you use your phone, you've pre-booked it, so you tap at the nearest car and you go use it, park up. And at each street or in a strategic location will be a charging hub and the car's just positioned there. Brilliant. And that's the way, I think that's the next level mm -hmm. before autonomy will come further sure. on. Sure. Have we got any questions um, from the audience? Yes, please. Can we get a microphone over there? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, guys. That's really interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask you, so the subscription model is obviously getting bigger in the normal car market, not even just for electric vehicles. Obviously, in electric, you can see how the de-risking factor makes it even an even bigger opportunity. I just wanted to know how involved the OEMs, the manufacturers, the manufacturer finance companies um, are in this already. Um, you know, are they thinking about subsidising through this, um, or is really the role going to be down to startups like yours popping up all over the country? I think the manufacturers have been slow to take part in, in, in this new transition to, to come away from the ownership models. They're obviously looking at lost revenue from their own perspective as electric vehicles don't need to be, uh, have the same servicing requirements. So for them, it's damage to a revenue stream. So perhaps they've slowed down that resistance. But in terms of commercially and uh, smaller organizations being able to help make that change quicker, I, th I think that they'll be nudged into changing, but at a slower pace. Mm -hmm. I think the subscription models are coming and or will come from manufacturers, but they'll, they will look to people like us where we've proven the model before they take it on to know that it works. And in terms of OEMs taking it on, the big difference between uh, an independent business running a subscription model and an OEM running it is that the, we have a, a, a choice of every brand. They will only have one brand to offer. And if we look at car phone warehouse, you can go there and buy any type of phone. You go to a Vodafone shop, you'll only get Vodafone. And that's where our whole subscription concept came from, to be honest. And we didn't create it. We just purely looked at how the mobile phone market worked and thought, you know what, we can replicate this in electric cars. Sure, sure. Any other questions? Yeah, Anna. Thank you, great to hear your story. Um, I was interested in the technology that you put in vehicles. To, yeah, uh, the black the box thing. Yeah, mm. exactly. Would you have any plans to use that to inform users whether they actually need a vehicle all the time or whether mm. they could use other modes of transport? Yeah, on, on that, that, we left the model as it was in 2020, February, and concentrated on the subscription model. But yesterday we were at um, a show in London, which is a future mobility show, um, and we spoke with somebody whom we'd met on our journey. They've actually taken our model further. It's now mobile phone based, and they've actually opened it up further. So it's not just cars, it's about how we move in society from the moment we get up and leave the house, how much walking we do, whether we're on public transport, whether we're on a car, in a car, how many journeys we do, and then they can map each element and separate it. So they can pull the car journeys out, they can pull the public transport out, they can pull the cycling and the walking out. But just on the car journeys, that takes it back to our situation. So you can actually use that data to know, A, do you need a car? Could those journeys have been carried out with any other form of transport? B, if you need a car, what type of car do you need? Do you need a small electric car? Do you need a medium-sized electric car? Or do you need a big car to cover the bigger journeys? And it, they can actually define it down to a single journey in the last 365 days. So brilliant. that's coming. Great. And I think I saw someone had a question yesterday at the back. Good morning, Sen Randari from University of Birmingham. Um, it's great to see, it's a really interesting model. It's great to see that obviously the fossil fuels from petrol and diesel will be removed. 
Is there anything that you're doing to ensure that the electricity that's being provided for recharging is also from renewable sources? Yeah. Um, on that, we were talking about manufacturers earlier. I think one manufacturer has actually grasped this whole space better than any other. Obviously, we know the success of Tesla, what Elon Musk has done there, but Volkswagen, they actually were the main reason for electric cars starting to come to a fore through Dieselgate. So what happened in America was Dieselgate, that got caught out with the, the, the emissions uh, figures, and the state of California took them to court. They won the case against them, first time that anybody had actually stood up to any of the motor manufacturers. And instead of actually penalizing them and saying, no, you cannot sell any more diesel, you cannot do this, they said, we're going to fine you a billion dollars, but we don't want you to give us the billion dollars. We want you to use that in four tranches to electrify America. So Volkswagen very cleverly took a lot of the Obama administration, because they were already connected in it across the country, and started to put in a, cha a charge infrastructure. The learnings from that, Volkswagen then, in Europe, have, they own some of the biggest solar farms and wind farms. They use that energy to build cars in their new factory in Germany, so they're building electric cars with green energy. They have then formed a partnership with all of the other German manufacturers plus Ford to create a charging network called Ionity, which is in Europe much greater than it is here, but they're just starting to put it into the UK. They will, Volkswagen will sell you the car to sell you the charge point to sell you the energy. So they've got a complete circular economy and it's green energy. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, listen, I think we could spend another half an hour talking about it. <laughs> At least. Uh, I can see somebody had a question as well. I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to keep us moving. I'll tell you why. We've got an 11 o'clock, um, two-minute silence, and so I have to make sure we land um, on time for that. So I'm really sorry, and I'll bring you in if you've got a question later on. Um, but Lash and Chamjit, thank you so thank much. You. Um, it's been really, really interesting. So if you'd like to thank leave you. the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to now invite um, Darren Jones. Darren is from a company called Sonny Hole. And uh, Darren, do you want to tell us a bit yes. about what you do? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, that does say Sonny Hole, not Sonny Hole. Sorry to disappoint anybody from uh, our near neighbour. Um, but Sonny Hole is actually in Coventry, not Solly Hole. So, are we, all, are we all still sort of awake? Because actually, I'm spotting a lot of green fatigue because we've been going on about COP26 for years. We're now in the middle of it. It's wall to wall and I'm starting to talk to people and they're going, hmm, bit of green fatigue. So hopefully if there is, and I doubt there is in this room because you're the converted, we'll try and break that with a, a wonderful tale of what's going on right here in the West Midlands and how there is a huge amount of carbon abatement in a place you wouldn't expect it for the West Midlands. Sonnyhill, what's Sonnyhill? Well, I am going to really excite you by regaling you with the story of the dirty bottom of boats. Yes, isn't that exciting? Isn't that a way to change the world? Well, shortly I'll be sitting there and you'll be asking me questions. So why don't I start with asking you a few questions? Okay, how much of the, I think some of you will know the answer to this, how much of the world's uh, greenhouse gases is the UK responsible for? What percentage? Anyone? Are we awake? It's one percent. There we go. Somebody at the back. There we go. They, they, they were hiding doing that. But yes, one percent. One percent. So, Sonny Hill, this West Midlands company, works in the maritime industry. Of course we do, because we're so near the sea. What percentage of carbon emissions comes from commercial shipping, do we think? Anyone? Shout some figures? 16%. 16, well, that's a bit on the high side, but... I'll give you the answer. It's 3%. Three times more emissions come from those big ships out at sea than from this entire damp island of ours. Three times. Now, let's get back to what we do with that. Barnacles, mussels, oh, it's like not mine. 
barnacles and mussels. They grow on boats. Well, we've just had some people talking about uh, cars. If you had, well, I tell you what, if Lewis Hamilton, if he had barnacles and mussels growing on his car, how do you think his car would perform? Yeah, there'd be quite a bit of drag, wouldn't there? Quite a bit of drag. So, boats, ships, it's even worse, because as we all know, water is quite a lot thicker than air, so the drag factor is enormous. We at Sonny Hill knew that. There are currently some technologies that deal with this. Now, these technologies have been around for 50-odd years, um, and they're, they're called biocides. They're poisons. So we spent the last 50-odd years painting the bottom of boats with poison. And the po these paints only last three to five years because they are designed to leach poison into our oceans. That's a great idea, isn't it? That'll, that'll help. Brilliant. Fantastic. Well, we decided um, we didn't like that. And actually, fair play, governments have decided they didn't like that some time ago. So they started banning certain of the biocides. TBT, that wonderful, lovely carcinogen, um, got banned. And now the biocides aren't particularly good. That actually, ultimately, is a good thing, but they're not particularly good because it inspired Sonny Hull um, and others. So, just as an aside, in the last couple of years, the geniuses went, ah, biocides, we're going to have to ban them. Let's come up with something different. So they decided to put silicon on the bottom of boats. Now, silicon, um, it literally sort of gradually degrades so the stuff falls off. Silicon is this thing called a microplastic. So instead of putting biocides in the oceans, they decided, oh, we'll put microplastics in. Not a very good idea. So at Sonny Hall, we decided there was another way of doing it. Uh, one of our founders, who was a bit of a geek, he noticed that uh, the US Navy noticed that where they used ultrasonics for um, all sorts of weird and wonderful things from sonar to whatever, where the little pods were, nothing ever grew. Rest of the boat covered in all green wonderfulness and half of a mall marinere, but not that part. So decided to have a little play and decided that ultrasonics could keep a boat clean. Now this is the boring science part, so I'll be quick on this. That is called a transducer. It's a little bit like a speaker on your hi-fi. You put it on the inside of a boat and it makes the outside of the boat have this tiny ultrasonic power wave this sound pulse at a microscopic level, and I really do mean microscopic. That microscopic sound wave causes a, a pressure wave, and that makes single cell organisms implode very carefully. By the way, before you wonder, no, it does not bother dolphins, whales. It only goes about two inches out, and we've had it checked by different governments. But it goes out, and the single cell organisms can no longer grow. Well, your, your mussel and your barnacle and all the weed, they actually feed on those single cell microorganisms. And so do the bacteria and whatever that grow on them. So we remove the food source from the bottom of boats and then stuff doesn't grow on them. Now, great, we're doing that. What real impact does that make? What real impact does that make? Well, Back to you again, audience. Let's get another figure out of you. So I'll tell you a little story. So last week, I addressed C uh, COP26. So I happened to chair uh, the IMO, the UN's uh, Organization for the Oceans, uh, a, a fouling, global biofouling program for them. And uh, earlier this year, I commissioned, uh, through uh, the panel I chair, the definitive study to find out what is the real effect of biogrowth on ships? So, on a container ship, if you've got medium growth, just a few barnacles and a bit of mussels and a bit of weed, which is pretty much what they all operate at, what is the effect on greenhouse gas emissions? What do we think? Percentage, come on. How much extra greenhouse gas emissions on a container ship do we think? 20, 20 at the back? Any more, any lower? Is he mad? Is he... Close? He might be mad anyway, but we don't answer that. 
The answer came back and everyone was shocked because actually, 20% guy, you were bang on what everybody used to believe. The definitive study done by um, Strathclyde University and a university out of um, South Korea with the, the finest hydronomists in the world, 54%. So the drag on a ship, just because stuff grows on it, 54%. Now if I were to tell you the 100 largest vessels in the world create more greenhouse gases a year than every vehicle on Europe's roads, I'm guessing most of you would be a little bit surprised. But they do. And we now have a technology that is greener than the old technologies, actually, get this, cheaper than the old technologies, lasts longer than the old technologies, that can save 54%. So let me tell you where Sonnyhull is now and what we're doing. I'm guessing no, well actually there's about two people because they know me, but nobody else in this room had ever heard of Sonnyhull. So I can tell you now because we've had it uh, independently verified that Sonnyhull is responsible for more CO2 abatement reduction than any other company in the West Midlands. That doesn't matter if you're JLR or all these big boys. We are currently reducing CO2 by 12 million tonnes a year, just on the few vessels we're on. And we're only on about 1% of the world's vessels. We happen to be the world leader in it, which is good, we're British. And if you put, um, if you put a Sonnyhull on the huge propeller, 10.5 propeller, uh, metre propeller of a, uh, of a container ship, You'll get, for each pound you spend, you will save 25,000 times more CO2 than on every pound you spend on an electric vehicle. So the bang for your buck is there. By the way, we're also, we have another benefit. Um, when these vessels move around, uh, you go to a port in Japan, some little critter grows on your boat, and you, your vessel then goes to, well, Southampton, and that little critter goes, oh, I like it here, jumps off, and these invasive species are then damaging the environment around the globe. Huge, huge problem. And it's also dealing with that. So we're green, green, green. And nobody in here has ever heard of us. The British government, yeah, there's a couple of them have heard of us. We get not one penny off them in subsidy, assistance, anything. So, there isn't an appetite to help in some respects with this. And I think the reason is that um, you can't wave a flag about it. It sounds dirty. It doesn't, it doesn't help. Giving a subsidy for an electric vehicle or for a, heat, a, a, a new boiler, or not boiler anymore, um, I think politicians can jump on because they're doing something directly to you. Because they can't do that, we're this, we're this sort of Cinderella. So how can we not be a Cinderella, and how can you help? Well, I'm now working with the IMO to devise a clean shipping register. And ultimately, what we would like to see is that you, the consumer, because we all are, when you click on Amazon and you go, I want to buy that, or when you buy your new electric car, or subscribe to it, better say that, you can go, hmm, how do you ship it? Do you actually put it on a clean ship? Because you now know, you're now the enlightened, you know that makes a difference. And actually a difference that you can make that is almost bigger than anything else you can do. If you said, I'm only going to buy stuff that comes on clean ships, I've just intimated, with a 54% of a container ship, it is the equivalent of making the UK carbon neutral one and a half times over just by doing this, just by this. And by the way, we're not the only ones, and there's other technologies that's going to come out. But you, the consumer, can start to do that. So there's the journey we're going to try and take this on. And with your help and the rest of the populace around the world, we can do that. But I've got a message um, that I, I sort of gave at COP26 as well last week, is um, we're in a wonderful building in a university. And um, if you look at the media, 
and you look at what we talk about, we talk about invention. Ah, oh, we're going to invent this, we're going to do this in 10 years, we can do that. There's all these new, new technologies. Actually, um, I think the Prince of Wales in 1927, not the current Prince of Wales, that's, he's not quite that old, but um, used a phrase, adopt, adapt, and improve. And actually, that is the green journey we need to go on. You'll see in the exhibition at the back, which I'm sure you're all going to go and visit, there's some great technologies that already exist. The problem isn't that we're not an inventive species. We're brilliant at inventing stuff, particularly in the West Midlands. The problem is reticence with adoption. And then when we do adopt, we do need to adapt because it's never going to be quite the same. We're going to have to change our processes if it's how you keep a boat clean or change our processes if it's how you fuel up your car because you plug it in instead of go to the petrol pump. And then we need to improve. Never, ever, ever stand still. And again, that's something in the West Midlands we've never done. We do not sit still. So my message to all of you is what can you adopt that currently exists and here's a real challenge that isn't more expensive than the current technologies. And I'll tell you now, when you go next door, across the way, you will see those sort of technologies. They do exist. Forget the doom and gloom mongers at the media who like to tell us all, all the terrible sides of this green revolution. There's a real good side. And every time we have a technological revolution, it is driven by our behavior that we want better. And actually, better doesn't mean hair shirts or living in a cave, as some people would make out. There are better technologies that are actually easier for us to use. Our previous speakers, electric cars. If you've never driven one, get in one. They're cool. They're really nice to drive. They are a better driving experience. I've got a bit of technology with a Sony hull that is a better way to manage growth on a boat. That's my message. Get out there and look for the stuff that is either cheaper or the same price as what you currently use, but gives you a better experience and happens to be greener. If we do that, this green revolution will be read, led by the people, not by the governments. Markets can help because markets have driven every revolution, whether it's uh, the automobiles originally or how we do use computing. You, we can do this. The West Midlands can do this in areas you wouldn't expect. I've just come up to my 20 minutes. See, I could talk for... Well, you'll be glad of two-minute yeah, silence we're when I'm do done. some questions. But so, yeah, we can do questions. Such a compelling presentation. But have a seat. Let's see if we've got any sure. questions for, 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 for Darren. We've probably only got time for one or two. Any, any <laughs> questions? I want to know, how are you going to get from 1% of the shipping fleet to 50 or 100? And at what point does... So, so interestingly, this is where government does come in. Um, about 16 weeks ago, Boris Johnson stood up and suddenly said, we're going to include maritime emissions in the CO2, uh, in, a, in the um, greenhouse gas emissions for this country. The day after Joe Biden did exactly the same, uh, about a week after that, the EU said the same. Uh, every phone call into our office and every email changed. Within a week, we used to get engineers contact us and say, how does this work? We now get CEOs and chief finance officers <laughs> of these big shipping lines contact us and say, uh, can you tell me how this works and, and will it work for us? Huge difference. As soon Because before that, it was greenwash and hogwash. All these shipping companies claimed to be green. They weren't. They didn't understand it. Also, there was a whole way how they finance. We're, we're classed as a capital asset. And, they used and to do you do manufacture these products in the West Midlands? So um, we manufacture parts of it. Uh, in the West Midlands, all of the programming, um, our R&D is all done in the West Midlands, with the exception of our warm water R&D, which strangely isn't done in the canal. We do that in Abu Dhabi, uh, where we've got the right facilities. And now we're um, just changing some of our stuff because we're moving into um, industrial. So we found the same technology works on pipe work in factories. And so uh, pipe work, they just expect it to, to close up over time. So they put in massive pumps. They can now put in smaller pumps and have lower maintenance costs. So we're saving the money, but we're also saving CO2 because the pumps I guess my use concern half the is, energy. I guess my concern is that the, obviously the production opportunity yep. around this is huge, yep. and you could easily see that going somewhere outside of the West Midlands. So I know, as, I, I, as you grow, what's the, what's the plan? Yeah, so no, our, our plan is um, we would like to be doing manufacturing in the West Midlands. Um, we actually want to do, have about four plants around the world to keep it local. Um, 
It is a challenge to do this in the UK, I have to say, because I've got other governments around the world begging us and waving large checks for us to do that here. Can't even get a conversation in this country. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting vibe. I'm from the West Midlands. This is from the West Midlands. I want it to stay in the West Midlands. The West Midlands is, for the second time, going to be the centre of an industrial revolution. This time, it's going to be green. Brilliant. And serving the maritime industry, which is the most bizarre thing for a landlocked region. But how wonderful is that? Thank you very much, uh, Darren. It's been really, really good. Brilliant. Thank you. So our third case study is um, Adam Piekarski. Adam, are you around? I've seen him earlier. Come to the stage. Uh, some steps up there, but uh, you're right there. Brilliant. Tell us a bit about um, Trigo and what Trigo is, and then we'll have a chat with you too. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, to be here today and to present Trigo. Trigo. Um, well, maybe that. Uh, before I uh, before I introduce Trigo, a quick uh, a quick poll. How many of you? enjoy getting stuck in traffic on the way to work or when you're taking the kids to school or when you're going, I don't know, to the gym. Show of hands. Who likes standing in traffic jams? You, you all like standing in traffic jams. Okay, right. In which case, Trigo is not for you. How many, how many people enjoy driving idle, idlessly around in circles looking for a parking space? spending 15, 20 minutes looking for a parking space in, uh, in the city. You don't enjoy it, no? If you don't enjoy it, I'm, I, was, I was hoping for a show of hands, I can see some head shaking. And If you don't enjoy standing in traffic jams, and if you don't enjoy looking for parking, then Trigo is a mobility solution that we've, uh, we've developed. It was, uh, we came up with an idea about 11 years ago, it's uh, an idea that was um, founded by um, an, uh, an engineer in, uh, in Poland. We currently have a, pol uh, a UK operation at Hariba Myra. We're working with Cranfield University on some very futuristic stuff that we'll show you and we'll talk about. But uh, we were hoping to have the vehicle uh, here today, but um, basically, if I could just introduce one of the gentlemen, I don't know if he's still here, asked the question about who would use a scooter or who would use a moped if it's raining. Totally agree with you, totally agree. Basically, we're looking for something that combines the functionality, the convenience, and the agility of a two-wheeler, like a motorcycle or a scooter, with the safety, or should I say, with the, yeah, with the safety, with the protection of a car. Now, and that's exactly what Trigo is. We've actually developed a vehicle that changes shape. So when we're maneuvering through traffic, the vehicle's 86 centimeters wide. It's a two-seater vehicle. It's an enclosed cabin with seat belts. You don't require a, dri a, a motorcycle license. It's a normal driver's license. It's an electric vehicle with replaceable batteries, so there's no downtime in charging. Once you clear the traffic, because there are a number of vehicles, Toyota tried this, a couple of other companies, very narrow vehicles that will scythe through traffic. But once you've got through the traffic, very often those vehicles are limited to a top speed of around 30 kilometers an hour, 24, 25 miles an hour, which is almost useless because the time you make up in traffic or the time you make up finding a, a suitable parking space, you lose on the open road. With Trigo, the front axle opens to a meter and a half, providing you the stability to drive at speed, up to 90 kilometers an hour. And this is something that we've developed. This is something that we're testing already in the UK. This is something that we're testing at the moment in Singapore. We're looking at doing durability tests in the West Midlands, uh, as I mentioned, uh, working together very closely with uh, Hariba Myra. But maybe, because I can see people are sort of saying, well, What's this guy talking about? Instead of telling you a little bit more, we, uh, we were hoping to bring the, the vehicle here today, but because of all the, the pilots and the trials we have, the best I can do is, as a picture speaks a thousand words, is show you a film uh, of the vehicle and what it does. This is, these are two of our vehicles driving through 
the road. As you can see, the front axle moves as you're driving. So when you're in traffic, we call it maneuvering mode. You're eight to six centimeters narrow. It's narrower than many motorbikes. It's a two-seater. It's got seat belts. Can be driven by anyone with a regular driver's license. Five Trigo fit in one standard car parking space. We swap the batteries. You don't charge them, there's no downtime. So imagine instead of going to a petrol station, filling up with petrol, you drive into a charge bank and you just swap the batteries. It takes two and a half minutes and you're off. We also teleoperate. We have a vehicle, I'll, I'll mention this later, we have a vehicle at the moment in Milton Keynes that's been driven around Milton Keynes by a team of teleoperators sat in Berlin. There's no one in the vehicle, it's being driven. And that's part of our business model. Part of our business model is to deliver empty vehicles to people who need transport solutions where and when they are. So we'll keep that, if possible, we'll keep that on the loop and I'll carry on, uh, I'll carry on telling you a little bit more about where the idea came from. The, the concept was, when we looked at mobility um, and urban mobility, one of the biggest problems is congestion, traffic congestion. The other is finding a suitable parking space. People can get into town, they can drive between cities, but once you're in town, things become difficult. They become, it's, it's, it's a hassle, it's a hassle. We started to look at what was happening in, um, well, we, we, we started to develop the solution, a solution that would overcome both traffic congestion and parking. The concept um, arose, as I say, the idea, Raphael Budweil, a very good friend of mine, he came up with the initial idea. He was um, a guy who, a motorcyclist who had a big touring motorbike. Um, he thought it was useless for commuting in traffic. He found out that it would take him 30, 40% of the time it took in a car to, to arrive to and from work. And then he started thinking about a solution and he came up with the variable axle, the variable axle um, solution. Over the years, when, when, it was first, uh, when we first came up with the idea, it was an internal combustion engine. Over, over time, things have changed. E-mobility has become a big issue. Uh, everybody's talking about electric vehicles. We're in a very nice place because if you replace an internal combustion engine with batteries, cars still get stuck in traffic. The footprint of the vehicle doesn't change. The, car, the, the, the parking uh, space it requires is exactly the same. So you're not solving two of the biggest mobility problems within an urban environment, traffic congestion and limited parking. Trigo, as things have developed, and uh, I mean, one of the biggest challenges as a company we've had is keeping up um, with the, 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 the speed of which um, mobility in general is, is changing, the trends in mobility. As I mentioned, we were an internal combustion engine at the outset, it's now batteries. People are talking about car sharing. Car sharing allows us to platoon, uh, to, sorry, to teleoperate the vehicles, to deliver them to people who need them when they need them. You wouldn't necessarily own a Trigo. You would pay for the kilometers that you use in a Trigo, just like you would on some of the electric bikes that are stood outside. Uh, sharing bikes. Now the problem with a bike is you need to be there, you need to operate it to, to take it to where it is. With a, four, with a four wheel vehicle it's stable. We can move the vehicle around town at 86 centimetres narrow, we like to say 86 centimetres narrow, not wide, uh, just like you would a bicycle. So you're not hindering traffic. If we were to take any other small vehicle, any, a Smart, a Twizy, um, one of the French um, sort of uh, micro cars. If we were to move one of those cars, as, uh, if we were to teleoperate one of those vehicles at a low speed in an urban environment, we would cause chaos, if havoc. And one of the reasons that I'm mentioning low speed is that we're, as a company, not interested in developing teleoperate uh, autonomy at the levels of uh, Elon Musk, level four, level five, where you're sat in a vehicle and the vehicle is driving you around. 
for a number of reasons. We don't think people feel that comfortable with it. We don't think there's that much of a need. It may, in time, be something that uh, is, is acceptable. We view teleoperations or autonomy more as a solution to deliver a mobility solution to somebody who wants to take themselves from A to B. Um, don't know how much time we have, because I know we were... Well, I'm keen to get you over here <laughs> so we can have some questions, but uh, I think you've introduced it brilliantly. Yep. So let's, 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 let's um, see if there's any questions that okay. people If we, if people we keep got. the loop on, then I can... It'll yep. be, yeah. okay. Ab Excellent. Absolutely. So we've got time for a couple of quick questions. There's a person needing a microphone at the front. Yep. I was actually interested in the autonomised, you, you, you touched on it at the very end. Yes. Whereby if it's in the autonomised mode, is that actually legal to sit in that vehicle and be driven around by a controller based in Berlin? And if it is legal, are you allowed to go to the, the local refreshment house and get driven home? Yeah, right, okay. This is, we, uh, we're not that interested in driving people around remotely. We're more interested in delivering the vehicle, deploying the vehicle remotely. Um, regarding the question on legality, at the moment there's a code of practice within the UK where you can teleoperate vehicles uh, as long as you stick to that code of practice. And that's why we have a vehicle at the moment. Um, uh, it's part of the 5G Create uh, program in, in Milton Keynes. And we have a vehicle that's being driven around uh, Milton Keynes uh, it'll be there for the next sort of two to three months as part of the trial and it's steered remotely. We have a team, we have an, uh, uh, a partner, a company that we collaborate with that's looking after the teleops. There's, they're more focused on teleoperations, a company called Imperium Drive. They're um, sort of situated in, in Milton Keynes. Their team in Berlin can steer the vehicle in Milton Keynes. Our team in Warsaw can steer the, the vehicle in Milton Keynes. Anybody that we give access, we give the access codes to, can steer the vehicle um, around, around Milton Keynes. The, um, the question of um, driving the person around, I mean, we would probably lose out to Uber after refreshments on a Friday or a Saturday night <laughs> because our solution is more for somebody to drive themselves back. So, for example, one of the biggest issues with car sharing fleets is that people tend to take vehicles out of hot zones in the city centres in the afternoon, in the early evening, when they're going home from work. They'll take the vehicle and they'll run a couple of errands and then they'll leave it in a residential area where they, leave, where they live. It's very convenient. In the morning, the next day, when they wake up, they don't necessarily take the car sharing vehicle because it'll succumb to traffic congestion, just like every other car, and they'll need to park it somewhere. So they'll take public transport, or they'll take a taxi. But the next day, in the afternoon, they'll probably take another car sharing vehicle out of the city centre. So you'll, you'll get these vehicles sort of blocking up residential streets. Uh, they're not where they're supposed to be. Our idea is that with teleoperations, we will be able to bring one of our vehicles, which is a two-seater, and 90% of commutes, it's 1.6 people, so it's like one, one person, two. Very, very few commutes are three people, uh, uh, three people plus. So we would be able to, in a narrow mode, bring our vehicle back into town, or even before that's legal, the person who takes the vehicle in the evening would probably bring it, drive it back themselves, because as you can see, they'd be able to drive through the congested traffic. Lane splitting is legal in the UK, it's legal in Germany on condition that vehicles are stationary. It's uh, last three or four years legal in California. More and more, town, more, and more city uh, transport authorities are looking towards sort of lane splitting and creating lanes for uh, motorbikes, bicycles, narrow vehicles. Because obviously if you can get uh, one person into a vehicle like a Trigo, as opposed to a two-ton SUV, then you're saving energy at every level. I mean, the amount of energy it takes to move an SUV and then to stop an SUV. The gentleman that was talking about shipping, everybody, talk, everybody focuses on fuel. 
but you've got to move, you've got to ship disc brakes yeah? and, 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 and the disc pads, you've got to ship the wear and the tear on, 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 on discs, on, on brakes to stop a two-ton vehicle in which there's one person. It's much, much higher than in a vehicle like this that serves its purpose. Let's see if there's any more questions. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's fine, it's fine. Um, guy at the back. You've got to stop me. I, tend Those to are, I, will, I will, don't worry. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, uh, I had a few concerns in terms of the actual practicality of it, in terms of uh, just day-to-day -day use. Uh, in the footage that was shown, uh, it doesn't really display how the doors open themselves. And this just brings about the question of, um, in terms of parking it next to each other, would you even be able to get out and how much storage would yep. actually be okay. So with the, uh, with the parking, the, what basically we have, uh, we're working now on um, Valley, uh, autom uh, Valley, uh, Valley automated parking where the vehicle will park itself. In a configuration where it parks itself, you can park five vehicles in a standard parking space. In a configuration where the individual, the driver, would park the vehicle, then it would be three vehicles to a parking space so that you can get it, was the, this is why we have the sliding door to the side and not an open door so that you can, uh, you can come out. The, um, the, the, the little part of the film there that shows it parking between two vehicles is basically to stress how much space we can utilize in an, auto, uh, in an autonomous uh, situation and to stress the fact that you could park so many more vehicles in, uh, in a city center of this, of this size than, uh, than a normal size. The other aspect of this, of the teleoperations, is once you arrive, for example, say you're going to the dentist, and you've, you've got, you, 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 on your app, you bought one of these vehicles, you go to the dentist, and your dentist surgery is in a, on a double yellow line, a red line. The closest car park is two kilometers away, and it's raining. Right? Not necessarily the best scenario. With a Trigo, you would be able to drive up to the vehicle, to, sorry, to, the, uh, to your dental surgery, leave the vehicle, and a teleoperator would basically take it away to you and park it at the closest parking uh, space, or take it to the next user, to the next commuter. So you don't have the issue of, of parking. Once your, your surgery or your haircut or whatever it is that you're doing is finished, on the app, the vehicle arrives empty, once you're in it, we turn off all the teleops, all the autonomy, you take control of the vehicle, you drive it to wherever you're going, and uh, you know, it, basically, we're just, what we're doing, everybody's talking about re uh, re um, renewable energy and uh, resources. There's one, one resource, one natural resource that isn't renewable, and that's time. You can't renew time. But what, so what we've decided to do is look at saving time, yeah? creating time. Because if you can do other things instead of standing in traffic or instead of driving around idly looking for parking, like getting a haircut or going to the dentist or doing some shopping, then we're playing our little part in renewing to, to, to the extent of which it's possible the only non-renewal resource. <laughs> Adam, our time yes. is up. So um, many thanks for all that you've uh, shared this morning. Fascinating uh, to think about the future of mobility uh, from all of our case studies this morning. Um, and, and in many ways, recognising just what the West Midlands has to offer uh, in relation to that. So a uh, round of applause for Adam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So um, we are fast approaching uh, 11 o'clock and we're going to um, stop for a two minutes silence at 11 o'clock. Um, so if I might ask you if you feel able to and you want to stand up for uh, the, the two minutes silence then that would be fantastic. We're going to run a little um, video um, and then after the two minutes silence um, we have a 20 minute comfort break and then I'll call you all back again at uh, 20 past 11. Um, so as I say, if, you, if you'd like now to stand, we will have our uh, little remembrance celebration. Right, we're going to start our next session. Can I invite our panelists to come up, please?
Great, welcome back um, to this next session. Um, this is a session where we're thinking about research and development um, and how uh, our universities are rising to the challenges of future mobility. Um, and once again, um, I'm just referring to this um, document that we are um, promoting today that the growth company have pulled together, our low carbon investment prospectus. And again, one of the key strengths that you'll find written up in this document is the crucial way in which all of our higher education institutions are contributing so significantly to uh, research um, around uh, so many different net zero issues. So we're going to uh, now hear from colleagues from the University of um, Birmingham, Paul and Peter, and we're going to be hearing from colleagues from the University of Warwick, John and Jack, um, about some of the work that they are doing. And I'm going to start, um, John, with you, um, just to talk to us a little bit about what you think the future of mobility is going to look like. Okay, um, thanks for that. So yeah, I mean, future mobility, uh, th there's an acronym that many of you might have heard, which I think is a, is a good kind of uh, basis for that answer. So it's ACES, Autonomous, Connected, Electric and Shared. Um, I would argue that autonomous and connected vehicles are definitely part of the future for mobility, but you, I would say enablers, you know, they're not in and of themselves what you will necessarily see. Um, it's more in the electric and shared area where I think that, you know, sort of next 10 years is likely to see, you know, major advancements. Um, if I take electric, uh, I'm, I don't believe, uh, and the sort of research that we're doing at university would suggest that although electric vehicles, uh, you know, and, and electric cars as we see them today is a crucial step to net zero, they're still sort of ton, two ton vehicles, moving an awful lot of metal around, using a lot of energy, and all that metal and, and electronics, et cetera, needs manufacturing as well. Um, so the net zero ambition to move towards electric vehicles is, is, is good, but actually we need to be looking at smaller solutions, so micro mobility, things like like we saw actually in the last talk. You know, Trigger. Mm. Absolutely, you know, things which are more, moving more of the person and less of the vehicle, um, whether that's bicycles, e-bikes, whether it's canopied kind of e-scooters, there's a whole load of innovation in that space, um, but definitely smaller vehicles and unbundling the car. On the shared side, obviously we're not going to be, you know, using micro vehicles to do 100 mile journeys. Um, and so particularly things like bus and particularly rail is, a, you know, when well integrated to help with multimodal journeys is hugely significant. And I know our colleagues from Birmingham are experts in that area. Brilliant. Well, I'm going to turn to our colleagues from Birmingham and, and I'm ask, going to ask um, Paul the same question. You know, what do you think the future of mobility looks like? Uh, well, my focus has been in sort of the mass transit and, and longer distance markets, different uh, to John and micro mobility. So uh, it, it, the first point is, John's already said, integrating those. So the whole end to end journey is uh, is improved and, and, and joined up in a way that uh, perhaps it isn't always at the moment, I think is key. Um, it, it will become much easier to use through that integration, much easier to use and interact with uh, as a result of technology. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, if anyone's in any doubt about the de demand for mobility, I think that's uh, clear uh, as we come out of uh, the COVID that people still want to interact with each other. So the demand is absolutely there. Um, so if, we, if we're going to deal with the carbon uh, agenda, then we have to uh, make it cleaner. And uh, uh, you'll hear much more of that from my colleague in a minute. This is what we're doing to make, make things cleaner. Uh, so it has to be cleaner, easier to use, more affordable. Um, and those are all the areas uh, where we'd be doing a lot of focus. So Paul, do you want to tell us a bit about what University of Birmingham is actually doing to address some of those issues that you've just, you've just flagged? Um, the, uh, one of the key is, is around the reliability of the overall transport system end to end. Um, so in some areas, it's not as reliable as we'd like at the moment. Uh, so one of the big areas of research we're focusing on is the uh, uh, simulation and modeling of the, the end to end journey uh, so that we can apply that right the way through the life cycle of any project uh, from its earliest inception to the detailed design, its implementation and operation. So you're using the same simulation and modeling tools to understand what will happen rather than using the real transport system to find out what's going to happen uh, and planning that through uh, the whole life cycle. 
Um, other aspects about uh, remote condition monitoring, huge amount of investment in technology and research to monitor the assets again to make it more reliable. Um, and then application of technology to, to make it easier for customers uh, to interact with transport systems and for different modes of transport to interact uh, with each other. So a huge amount of research going on across all those, those areas. Brilliant. And um, let me ask the same question now um, to, to you, John. What, what are you doing at Warwick Uni in terms of um, how, you know, how you're addressing those ACEs that you talked about? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I work for, for Warwick Manufacturing Group, WMG, which is a department at the University of Warwick. Um, what that means is that we tend to work on higher technology readiness level stuff. So, so uh, we tend to try and work on things that are close to market and, and to support businesses getting things into the market. Um, so on the kind of shared space, a good example of a project that we're working on is uh, Coventry Very Light Rail. Um, so that's a battery powered tram, for want of a better word. Um, the fantastic um, uh, opportunity and utility afforded by things like trams. But again, I'm, I'm sure the guys at Birmingham will know that the cost per linear kilometre of, of track is, is absolutely huge, um, largely because of the stuff that you've got to dig out the ground. So the foundations go into gas mains and into electric and so on, and all the utilities that are down there. Uh, the Very Light Rail project uh, basically has a track form that goes to less than a third of the depth because it's a lightweight vehicle um, that can be kind of platooned. Uh, and that means that you can do rather than 50 million pounds per kilometer, you know, plus it's more like four million pounds per kilometer. Right. So lots of places that would like to have things like tram networks but can't afford it. Suddenly the business case can work. And we've got a prototype vehicle that we've developed uh, with uh, Coventry City Council and a range of other partners. Um, on the micro mobility side, um, there's three kind of pillars of, of work that we're doing in research and development. First one is around policy. So everyone, you know, e-scooters are the example that everyone's aware of because they're on the streets. There's even some outside. All sorts of challenges in this space between bikes and, and small vehicles. Um, so we're working with the Department of Transport on a roadmap and, and doing research uh, to support uh, decision making on policy change. And um, we're working on things around behavioural change. Uh, which is a big challenge. Uh, so we, we've got a campus at the university with, uh, we generate 15,000 trips onto and off our campus every day and about 10,000 of those are in, are in one hour in the morning onto campus. Um, and we also have private land there. So we've basically got a mini city to go and trial things and try and effect modal shift. Um, and also a lot of research with our human factors group around uh, people's intrinsic needs from transport and, and similarly to what Paul was saying, making sure that journeys are, are combined and, and integrated and, and good from end to end, not just leg per leg. Uh, and then the last area uh, is around developing a UK supply chain. Um, so lots of stuff being imported at the moment. We've lost the smooth mover advantage on things like e-scooters. But, you know, as I say, I was delighted to see the last talk which is demonstrating you know, the innovation that we can lead in this country on. Uh, and so we're doing some work, which I think Jack might talk about in a little while, uh, you know, to, to start to unpick what opportunities there are for the UK supply chain. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, Jack, tell us, you're a student at Warwick University. Um, it'd be really good to know about exactly what you're working on and why that excites you and, and, and how you see the future. Sure, so I'm working on a project which is an e-scooter teardown. So what we've done is we've taken a, an e-scooter and torn down it into individual components. And then we've looked at that all through system level to component level, and we've checked what material it is, how it's manufactured, uh, the cost, price, and weight. And with that information, we're planning to look at the supply chain capability of the UK in, in terms of manufacturing a light micromobility vehicle. Um, and then what we've done to engage with businesses, we've taken it to events such as the Micromobility UK at Warwick, and really just spoken to them about the project to hear their thoughts on it. Um, Brilliant. Yeah. And John, you said that we've kind of um, missed out on the market opportunity around micro mobility. Do you want to just say a little bit more about that and how, Jack, then possibly your project could, could kind of regain some momentum? Yeah, so I'd say we've lost first mover advantage in form factors like e-scooters and things like that, although there's still a premium segment that a lot of people are kind of looking at. Um, I mean, I noticed the Pashley vehicle, uh, you know, the outside, the, the, the trike. Um, I know Adrian from Pashley describes how he had an e-scooter that they designed like 20 years ago, sat in his office, but it wasn't legal to sell it in this country. So it never went anywhere. And now obviously we import. But actually, in terms of um, you know, other innovations and essentially larger vehicles, things that cover pain points for people, whether it's getting wet or, or whether it's storage and theft and things like that, there's a great deal of opportunity for the UK to lead on that stuff. I mean, the work that Jack's doing as well is, you know, it's not only looking at the supply chain, it's also looking at the, you know, the end-to-end -end, uh, environmental impact. Right. So, you know, 
part of the work uh, that, that, that will be done is to look at the manufacturing impact of making the thing in China, yeah. looking at the carbon intensity of the energy that's gone into it over there versus potentially doing that over here, mm. reducing shipping to look at potentially onshoring parts of that as well. Mm. So Jack, tell us a bit more about that, you know, the nuts and bolts of, a, of, a, of an e-scooter, you know, what are the bits that we could do something with in order that they become even greener still? So um, part of it is spares and repairs. Yeah. So often spares are made uh, with long lead times overseas, whereas we're looking into whether we can manufacture some repairs here in the UK, and that way the lead time will be shorter, people will get their e-scooters repaired much more quickly. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So let me turn now um, to Peter. Um, same question, really. What are, you, what are you actually, you're a student, what are you actually working on? And um, what excites you about that? What opportunities do you think that creates? Okay, so what I'm working on is hydrogen powered railway systems. Um, a lot of the railways in this country are electrified. We've, we've done reasonably well as a country in, in doing that, but there's a lot of places where that's simply not practical. Uh, and so we look to other solutions. Now, batteries are fine, um, but they have their limitations. And particularly, you know, recharging them every hundred or so miles isn't really practical on, on the mainline railway. Um, so what I'm looking into is hydrogen. And that really falls into two strands. So one of the aspects of the work I do is in simulation and modeling, as, as Paul alluded to, um, is in working out how much energy you need and therefore how much hydrogen. Um, and looking at how the railway actually sort of works today. So how, where do you start the day? Where do you end the day? How many miles are you covering? What are your dwell times like? What's your energy consumption? All that sort of thing. Uh, and then that feeds into the other strand of my work, which is in uh, designing new or better still sort of retrofitted um, hydrogen powered trains. So one of the projects I'm working on at the moment, uh, and my main one is converting an old class OH hunter. I mean, this thing's from the 1950s. Um, but, you know, if you don't have to build an entirely new train, you, you serve an enormous amount of carbon already. Um, and if you can do that in a way that is zero emissions, you know, all the better. Fantastic. That's brilliant. And up in Glasgow, your Hydroflex two. train, yes. Hydroflex 2 train. Yes. Do you want to just tell people about, about that? So it's been, it's been up. It was there yesterday. I think the prime minister it, was it is, uh, there. It's with still me. there. Yes. So Hydroflex 2, um, I think maybe it will help to sort of go back to sort of where we started, which was with uh, Hydroflex 1 which was in 2019. And um, essentially that was just a way of proving that we could, um, we could do hydrogen with, with railways. Because a lot of these tr uh, electric trains we have around and even quite a lot of our diesel ones are actually powered by electric motors. It's just a case of where you get that electricity from. So Hydroflex One was a vehicle we built um, to demonstrate that. That showed kind of what was possible. And so the, the vehicle you see in Glasgow at the moment is Hydroflex 2, which has considerably more capability. So we started with Hydroflex 1 that had 20 kilos of hydrogen storage. You know, that's all right for pottering about um, between a couple of stations, um, but, it won't, um, but it won't do anything like a full train house. train house uh, 278 kilos of hydrogen storage. So a much, much more capable vehicle. But the other thing that it has, um, which you will have seen demonstrated if you've seen it in Glasgow, is the ability to also run on the overhead wires. So you're not wasting hydrogen when you don't need to. Um, and that, I think, is a sort of brief engineering summary of where, where we're at with Hydroflex. Excellent. I mean, one of the really exciting things about that is not very long ago, this was a student research project, and now there is a real train uh, running and, 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 and you know, change the world in real life. Brilliant, brilliant. So um, let me ask you, Paul, um, what do you think is the biggest future mobility challenge that faces us over the next five years? Um, I, I thought about this and how to distill it because there, there are so many, but I think uh, how I could try and do that is by focusing on the, the fact that we need to do an awful lot of things, be, be cleaner, uh, be easier to use, be more integrated. Um, but actually what we need to do is to be able to do that more cheaply, more efficiently and quickly. So for me, the, the overriding challenge is around efficiency. Um, there's a huge imperative in terms of public funding for uh, transport and mobility at the moment uh, with the financial position of, of the country. So we need to compete for funds from governments ultimately. Uh, and to do that, we need to be really efficient in how we do things and really uh, speedy in how we do things. And that's not always been the case. Uh, in transport. So for me, it's, it's around that speed and efficiency. And one of the reasons that is partly the, the call on public funds that's often needed, but also um, the, uh, the consumer paying. And actually, if we're not going to be in a place where um, 
transport is, is for the people who are relatively affluent, then we have to make it affordable for everybody. We have to make it clean and easy to use. And all of that underpins is we have to be able to do everything more efficiently and quickly. Brilliant. And are you, are you positive about that? Are you excited about that? Or do you just sometimes wake up in the morning and go, do you know what? This is just impossible. Uh, absolutely, I'm excited about it. So, you know, I've, I've worked in transport for, for over 20 years and, uh, um, and, and there are challenges all the time and it's exciting, but it, it, it really matters. It really matters for people who use it every day. It matters for the economy. It matters for us making a, a cleaner a planet. Um, so that's what excites me and I'm optimistic about the future. Fantastic. So, John, let me turn to you um, as well. You know, what what do you see as the biggest challenge facing um, the future of mobility over the next Similarly five years? Similarly to Paul, right? you know, it's a difficult one to answer because there's a lot of challenges, which is why it's exciting and interesting. Um, for me, simply one word: momentum. momentum. The fact that we're so comfortable and we're, you know, we've had such a good offer from the car for so long. It's a bundled product. It's just improved and improved. There are no better marketeers or elicitors of unspoken requirements from us than, than the, the automotive industry. Um, and we, we need to change that. You know, cars are not a sustainable way to continue to do all of our journeys. And the amount of change that that requires from uh, politicians and in terms of funding decisions um, that may not be popular initially um, is, is very, very difficult. Ultimately, we have to make an alternative which is more attractive. Um, and that, that's not an easy thing to do. It's similar to the energy industry, you know, trying to, to, to remove gas boilers. It's a very good offer. Uh, and making the alternative and putting the money into the research and development to make the alternative even more attractive is, is crucial because hitting people with a stick isn't a very politically good thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, the, the momentum of what we've got today uh, is, is the biggest challenge for me. Brilliant. And, and you know, you say the automotive industry has been absolutely fantastic in improving its offer time and time again. Same question, really. Are you optimistic then that there is a way of, if you like, changing public perceptions, changing behaviour, um, perhaps taking the automotive industry along with us, um, but in order to get that, that, that transition? That yeah, you, that I, I, I wouldn't be stood here if I wasn't optimistic. Um, I mean, the, one of the most pleasing things that I've seen is a few OEMs, uh, original equipment manufacturers in automotive have started to develop concepts for things like micro mobility, for example. Um, so uh, BMW uh, produced a few concepts quite recently to kind of illustrate what they think are the problems with the policy and regulatory space at the moment in Europe to say these type of vehicles, we believe there's a market for it based on what we know, but they're currently not legal because X, Y, Z. And that's a brilliant sign because th th there's no kind of you know, car lobby uh, at the point at which the car manufacturers actually start to make those things. Now, whether they'll be the, the, the winners in the future of mobility, it's, it remains to be seen, but uh, that's, I think, an extremely positive sign. Sure, sure. And Jack, um, I haven't prepared you for this question, so forgive me for putting you on the spot, but you know, why is the University of Warwick such a great place to do um, the kind of research that you're, you're doing? Why, how would you encourage other people to kind of come to the Midlands, if you like, in order to, um, in order to pursue the kind of career that obviously you want to pursue? Um, I, I think Warwick's great because we work incredibly closely with businesses. And as John said, the technology readiness level is close to being to market. So you can really see the impact of the work you do. Uh, you, you can work with a business who would then develop your product within the next year. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and do you feel, do you both feel that the West Midlands is the place to be in terms of this future mobility challenge? You know, I mean, political will is really important. And I mean, we, we ran, Jack mentioned, Micro Mobility UK. It was the first UK conference yeah. focused on that back in September. And Andy Street came and opened it and made an you know, extremely kind of compelling speech to start the ball rolling. I think that's a huge benefit. Plus the fact the institutions that we've got in the West Midlands uh, and the, the skills and the history around, obviously, industrial uh, you know, development. Um, there's no reason why the West Midlands can't be the centre of the green industrial revolution. So, absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I believe it or not, don't live in the West Midlands, but I don't want to work anywhere but the West Midlands on this stuff. Fantastic. I'm assuming you guys are going to give me a, a similar response because we are, of course, at the COP Regional Roadshow uh, promoting and celebrating the fantastic things going on in the West Midlands. But do you want to offer any kind of perspective as to why you think we can credibly say in relation to the future of mobility that the West Midlands is really the place to be? 
Uh, and I think there's a number of aspects of that. The supply chain here is 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 well advanced in in uh, in, in in rail and other modes of transport. So it's it, that's one one key part of it. Uh, it is a fundamental hub of our transport network and has been for very many years. Often in in, in rail, we talk about London as a centre, but actually uh, the Midlands is, is in many ways just as much a centre. I'm I'm interested as well in the potential of devolution of political power to to West Midlands to make decisions about that fundamental part of the network and how it can work. Uh, more effectively for the West Midlands, but actually for the country as a whole. We've already seen how uh, HS2 has helped to transform the centre of Birmingham and, and it will do more for other parts of the country. But um, I think improving uh, it, the connections between our cities and, and into and out of cities, um, especially and in including the West Midlands, really is a tremendous opportunity uh, for growth and, and levelling up our whole, 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 whole economy. Brilliant, brilliant. And Peter, you've you've chosen to come to University of Birmingham. I'm, yep. I'm assuming. Yep. Do you want to say a little bit about you know what what inspired you to do that? So, really, in in terms of railways um, for universities in this country, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say I don't think there is anywhere you can be better than the University of Birmingham. Certainly, there's very few other places where you can do undergraduate courses. So, my undergraduate um, degree is in civil and railway engineering. I could not find anywhere else, you know, in England at least, that did that. Um, and then from there, in terms of hydrogen power, again, we are sort of significantly ahead of where a lot of other universities are. There's not that many places where you can get into doing hydrogen power trains. Um, and it's an idea that has been sort of floating around in Birmingham since at least the sort of mid noughties So we are, yeah, in answer to your question, yes, there's nowhere better I could be than the University of Birmingham. Brilliant, brilliant. Now, listen, I'm very conscious that we're five blokes standing on a stage. So I'm going to ask you all a question. Can you just reassure me that you have got women in your departments doing work on transport topics? And is this a challenge that needs to be addressed? It absolutely is a challenge for the whole of the transport sector. I've seen it improve in the time I'm working, but it's nowhere near good enough. Uh, in terms of uh, my work at the university, I've only been there a short time. Actually, all of the people working directly for me are, 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 are women, um, which is great. Um, and it's across from the planet that they're coming from. So I think that's uh, really positive. The university is a very, very diverse environment. And I think that's an opportunity to transform transport sector as we see those people go into the, it gets stuck, you get into the transport and you, you tend to stay. So my hope is that they will feed through into the real industry. Brilliant, brilliant. Same question to Warwick. Yeah, well, I mean, I've been in transport industry for about 15 years, originally in industry before going to Warwick, and I'm, I'm delighted that the, that the ratio of, of sort of males to females is, is improving. I mean, the, the, the group that uh, Jack works on this project with, it's one girl and, and two boys. That's probably in, uh, representative of the sort of ratio that we've got at WMG. Um, but still, you know, we would rather that was more like 50-50. Mm. Um, I think what is pleasing is that we do a lot of interventions to make sure that we're offering equal opportunities so we're going into schools and we're providing sort of positive female role models to make it clear that this is a career path that is absolutely for you um because i think that the, the main issue actually is that there's a perception that's created that somehow this is a male industry and obviously slightly nervous when we stand here i'm glad you pointed it out yes. there's five men on the stage which is which is not what you know not help. the message that we need to, to put out there mm. um so yeah definitely Definite positive signs, but still not not 50-50, not where we'd like it to be, but huge improvement over when I started in the industry 15 years ago. So another big challenge for our region from that point of view. So can I ask, um, do we have any questions that people would like to ask? I'm particularly wanting women to ask questions <laughs> given what I've just what I've just said. So any 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 questions? No women? We'll go for a man first oh, yeah. then. And then oh brilliant, brilliant. Hit oh, Eleanor, um, do you mind? <laughs> This is a bit provocative, um, given that you have got women in your departments, could you say why you didn't substitute yourself with one of them on this platform? Thank you. I can take that one. Yeah, John. Uh, so Jack very kindly uh, was was the only one of the team that was available. Um, in in my case, um, uh, similarly, uh, I, I could have had my colleague Carla come along, but she's actually a. a uh, manufacturing roadshow event in Liverpool at the moment. Um, so she's on another stage representing the university and stuff. As you can imagine, it's quite a busy week with COP26. Um, yeah, so it's a shame that, that you know, we, we haven't done that, but I, I can assure you that we, we did look to and uh, another week we would have been able to. My, my apologies for being a man. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So let's go to the question over here, please.
Thank you. Right, back onto transport. That was the worry team, uh, if possible, for example, campaign for rain. You mentioned about the uh, the great possibilities for ultralight, also very light rail, to get it right, which has, I assume, uh, cost benefits and also uh, sp uh, speed of construction benefits as well. What are the downsides? Is it to do with capacity or speed? Um, so the, the VLR concept is a lower capacity option than a tram. Um, you can sort of platoon the vehicles to a degree, but each vehicle is, is a modest sort of bus sized vehicle. Um, I would say the downsides are not huge. Um, I mean, you do have batteries in the vehicles, which obviously require charging and there's an operational de uh, sort of detriment relative to having a catenary above. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the downsides aren't very big from what we can tell, uh, but the vehicle's going into testing to, to prove that. I would just say that the technology didn't exist to be able to have a vehicle of that size be battery powered, um, you know, five years ago. Uh, it's, re it's really that technology has enabled this opportunity. And I would like to think that it provides an opportunity to displace, uh, you know, uh, business cases that haven't worked for traditional trams in, in certain localities. <laughs> Over longer distances, it doesn't make sense, as, as our colleagues have suggested, to have a battery powered vehicle. Um, but certainly in sort of dense urban environments, it's a really good solution. Brilliant. Paul. I mean, I think the point is, it's not just downsides, different forms of transport are different, are suitable for different markets. And uh, uh, often, often you find in transport, the people that work in a particular part of it tend to think that their solution works everywhere and it doesn't. Trains are fantastic for, for mass, mass transit, long distance and freight. Uh, they're less good for other things. Light rail is, is suitable um, and interchange alternative to, to buses and other mo modes in some cases. So it's about the market situation you're talking about. Uh, technology change is that over time but it's fundamentally different markets that require different solutions and, and collectively we have to join those up so the end-to-end -end products is fantastic brilliant i think we've got a couple of questions at the back so um let's get those get both questions at the same time hi um we've seen quite a lot of innovative companies presented today and uh, i think we can all agree innovation is fantastic for pushing transport forward a lot of the airspace about transport gets taken up with boondoggle ideas. You know, we've seen things like loop systems in Las Vegas that don't deliver on their anticipated capacity or speed and that sort of thing. How do, how do we strike a balance between innovation and what turns out to be vaporware or, or boondoggles? Okay. And then, money to go around, presumably. And then one more question. Yeah, I'm Joe Muskin from uh, Sandor Council. I just wanted to ask the panel uh, less about the technology, more about the behavioural side of things. And we've talked a lot um, about the need to behave, um, to change people's behaviour. We, we need those options, which we've talked about quite a lot um, already. But I guess one of my concerns is whether we underestimate how difficult it is just to change people's behaviour. And, and I think often we, we talk about it as though, well, all you need to do is persuade people that this option is better than that option. And I think, uh, I just often wonder whether that takes into account the complexities of the lives that people have built for themselves. So, you know, in, in many cases, because um, our road system and our transport has been, um, you know, developed in the way it has, it means that people choose to live, um, in many cases, a long way away from where they work. And often these, these journeys just can't be replicated sure. by by public transport. So I think my concern is how long it's going to take to change people's behavior, sure. because it isn't just about giving them a different option, it's the fact that people build quite complex lives themselves. So, so thanks for those two questions. Can you take the tech innovation balance yeah. question, um, um, Pit Paul, and then John, will you do the behavior change question? Mm. Uh, so on the on the innovation side, I mean, I think most of the things we've been talking about today and you've been hearing about today, I mean, they're not absolutely radical changes in technology. It's mostly about applying existing technology uh, into 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 transport in a way that actually makes the product much better. Uh, and so innovation in that context. And I, I talked about the biggest challenge um, being about how we do things more efficiently and quickly. And I think that's an area where uh, we need real innovation to be able to apply this technology more quickly, more efficiently, more affordably for the taxpayer and for the user. Um, so that's where I, I see the innovation really coming um, and uh, getting that balance right. We say we shouldn't be um, taking 
major risk in terms of uh, many of our transport system because it's about application of, of technology and doing so in, in a short way. That's why I see this simulation as particularly important, uh, for example. Um, and just as a lead into the behavioural change, we've just seen the biggest change in behaviour in all of our lifetimes. Um, so if that can't be a catalyst for, for change, then I don't know what can be. Brilliant. John? Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, answer each or the behavioural one? Whatever you like. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I'd echo what Paul said uh, on on the uh, on the question uh, about um, uh, kind of the, the, the innovation, kind of harebrained versus opportunities. I mean, I, I would just say research is really important and being clear on what the intended outcome is. So things like Hyperloop and things like that, you know, that that's a rich person's idea and they have the capital to go and make it a reality and we can get sucked into thinking things like that are therefore a good idea because they're being developed um i think being able to look holistically at what the objectives of changing transport are and assessing options in that way at an earlier stage is really important when deciding where public money and university innovation and things should go um so yeah i think we need to be clear about holistically what the objectives are um in terms of the behavioral change I said it's a it's a key point if i go back to what i think is the biggest challenge and it's behavioral change um and we could look at it from the point of view of how do we change people's behavior or we can look at it from the point of view of what are people trying to actually intrinsically achieve what outcome do they want and then how do we try and make the options which are less impactful to the environment etc how do we make them achieve those goals and, and that's when you need to start changing infrastructure and changing uh, the products and changing policy that are available to them um, it's really interesting looking at uh, some of the surveys and things that we've done at the university because we're acutely aware that we are a car dominated campus and like 70% of the people that come to our campus come in a single occupancy vehicle, which is horrendous. Um, and we started to try and unpack why, you know, why they don't cycle and things like that. And I think one thing that's really interesting is if you think about the adopter curve that a lot of people are familiar with, you know, with early adopters and kind of you know, eventually you get to the mass market, you're going to need the mass market to want to do these things. But they're naturally, uh, you know, a, a group which tends to follow others. So concentrating on how to move through that first part of the adoption curve is really important. Research that we've done, and, and many people have done, in fact, says that um, people will generally begin to feel that something is normal when they see other people doing it more than carrots and sticks. Um, so if you can focus on the early adopter groups and really understanding pilots and trials, what are the pain points, what are the reasons why this, this is not going to work for them, whether it's things like carrying a pet or they need to take the child to school or whatever, make that possible. And then when you start to get that core of people doing it, others will follow. Um, so it's a, it's a huge challenge, um, but I think we've got to concentrate on getting a core of people doing something, and that will be difficult. That will be moving things like road space over to... Uh, you know, to, to, to micro mobility and similar things in the case of, of, of what I've been discussing, which will cause some traffic uh, initially for other people. And that's not going to be pleasant, but it's political will and we need to do it. Brilliant. Well, I want to say a massive thank you to um, all our panel. Um, really, really inspiring stuff and great to know that um, the higher education institutions in the West Midlands are absolutely driving the way in terms of innovation, technology and what the future of mobility um, is going to look like. So, um, Paul, Peter, John, Jack, many, many thanks for joining me um, on the panel this morning. Thank you. So, um, all that stands between um, you and your lunch um, this afternoon is Lord Grimstone. Um, Lord Grimstone of Boscobel was formerly chairman of Barclays Bank, and he's held a number of um, senior roles in government in the Treasury, and we're um, delighted that he has recorded a special message for us today. He is currently the unpaid Minister for Investment, jointly held across Bayes and the Department for International Trade. So we're going to watch a little um, video now uh, from Lord Grimstone. It's a great pleasure to have this opportunity to welcome everyone to what I am sure will be a successful COP26 regional roadshow in Wolverhampton. Now, we all know that COP26 is the world's best chance to reach agreement on the action needed to avert climate change and support those already experiencing its effects. Above all, nations must take action to honour the goals of the Paris Agreement and keep a 1.5 degree limit on temperature rises within reach. And this action is needed from everyone. Governments, large and small businesses, 
and of course, individual citizens as well. And this is why events such as the regional roadshow that you're having today in the West Midlands are so important to drive that action. Uh, it's particularly appropriate that this is in the West Midlands because of course the West Midlands is one of the leading places in the UK setting an ambitious target of becoming a net zero region by 2041. And of course, also being the home of the green industrial revolution. And this area is quickly growing its low carbon industries with the sector now being worth over 12 billion pounds employing nearly 100,000 people and developing the supply chains needed for this great economic transformation is key and it's a real opportunity for local business for academia and for of course for local for local people and it's important to capitalize on this growth in order to generate these tens of thousands of new jobs that we're looking for and of course to create a just and fair transition where no one is left behind. Finally, I very much welcome the launch of the first local net zero infrastructure delivery panel. And this partnership to tackle the challenges of net zero, I'm sure will help unlock many opportunities. And we look forward to other successful partnerships in the future. So thank you all very much and have a have a great round, have a great roadshow. Thank you. So thank you to um, Lord Grimstone. If I can just say again, thanks to the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy for sponsoring our event today um, and so that we can we can put it on and uh, really celebrate the fantastic things we're doing here in the West Midlands. It is now lunchtime and I understand lunch is going to be served across the way um, and at the same time, there is an expo over there. So you can see uh, some of the products, some of the ideas, some of the concepts, if you like, that we've been hearing about earlier this morning, uh, and indeed others um, that perhaps we haven't talked about as well. So can I encourage you to uh, enjoy your lunch, particularly enjoy the networking time. Remember I said at the beginning that I see sort of net zero, the challenge as being like a big jigsaw. Uh, if we only stay in our own little puzzle pieces and our little corners, then um, we won't be able to kind of paint that picture of the whole system, how we need to change the whole system. So do take the opportunity to do some networking over lunch, enjoy the expo, and then we're going to be back here at 12.45. Uh, and we're turning our attention this afternoon to energy and the energy system uh, before we get on to other subjects after that. But uh, energy immediately after lunch, 12.45, back here. Thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed the exposition as well. Absolutely fascinating to see some of the technologies um, in there. Six minutes electric vehicle charging. Um, batteries that can serve a whole neighborhood. I mean, all kinds of uh, brilliant tech. And so I wanna say a massive thank you to those people that have given up their time uh, today to come and show uh, those, those, those brilliant innovations that are uh, West Midlands based and driving forward um, the fantastic uh, work that people are doing on net zero in this region. Um, for those that perhaps weren't here this morning, this is our regional COP26 roadshow. Um, it's COP comes to the West Midlands and people might have noticed actually during the day we've had uh, a number of school groups that come in and uh, sort of mill around at the back and see what's going on. Um, so fantastic for those young people to perhaps come and be inspired and be able to go home and say I've been to COP26 um, today and uh, certainly some little stories coming out of those those little groups that have been coming around, which are really, really positive and encouraging. So um, do, do chat to them, do uh, engage as, as and when um, those students come around. This afternoon, we're changing from transport to energy. And I know any of my energy panelists looking at me now are gonna say, what do you mean changing from transport to energy? It's all about the energy system. It's the whole system that matters. And I've been describing today this, this, this jigsaw puzzle of, 
at the net zero challenge and how all the different pieces interrelate, even if we're all working on separate pieces, the whole picture is really, really important. So we're gonna hear some more about that and particularly how smart local energy systems um, might work. Um, I'm going to uh, ask for a little video to be shown now and then Cheryl from Energy Capital and her panel will come up and talk to us a bit more about that project. But uh, um, if we want to show the video now, that'd be fantastic. Hi there. Delighted to be able to say a few words to introduce our regional roadshow for COP26. I'm really sorry I can't be with you today, but as some of you will know, I'm actually up in Glasgow flying the flag for the West Midlands, talking about how we can contribute to this international conference, of course, as we all address the biggest challenge facing modern society. And my message today is really very clear, that although this is an international challenge, we in the West Midlands have got our distinct role to play. And indeed, the international challenge will only be met if every city and region like ours does our bit. That's why we've set ourselves the challenge of carbon neutrality by 2041, earlier than the national target. And of course, it's why we are talking about what we are going to do to be the home of the green industrial revolution. Three particular areas stand out for us where we can make direct action. The first, of course, is the greening of our transport and indeed manufacturing systems. We're already seeing that big investment in sustainable transport across the West Midlands, but there's an enormous amount more to do. The second is the whole area of energy. Now, some areas of the country might be the leaders in renewable energy, but the West Midlands, given its manufacturing background, can be a real leader in the storage, distribution, and the whole question of the recycling of supplies. It's a big opportunity for us in the energy area. And the third area is, of course, this whole question of net zero buildings, indeed, communities, where, too, we've got a leading role in the work we're doing through our urban regeneration. So three big opportunities for us to genuinely lead. But what I think standing back from all of this is this isn't about one individual piece being the solution to the challenge. It's got to be a whole systems end-to-end -end approach. One part relies on another. And what I hope you'll all be talking about today is how we can generally collaborate or genuinely collaborate across the whole piece. So enjoy the conference. I hope that out of it will come some more brilliant ideas as to how the West Midlands can play a leadership role because for sure, the message from Glasgow is there's an opportunity for places like ours to step forward and show that leadership. Good luck. Enjoy the day. So as you probably guessed, that wasn't the video that we were planning to show you. Um, but that was our message from Andy Street, the mayor, who is up in Glasgow today. Um, having several meetings about um, transport, about energy, about investment in the West Midlands. And so that was his message to greet us. We now have the video that we were going to see, which is about smart local energy systems. The cost of energy. It's going up, pushing up bills for both businesses and households. And the demand for energy, especially electricity, is going up too. We're spending billions of pounds a year nationally improving our energy infrastructure, as it wasn't originally designed for clean 21st century technology like solar and wind. In a city like Coventry, which spends around 500 million pounds on its energy each year and can't generate much of its own energy, we think we could make the system work better. With a local commitment to net zero carbon emissions by 2041 and nationally by 2050, Systems are being reviewed at national and local level. But energy remains unaffordable for many people. So how can we realize the full value of the energy system to make it work better for local people? Energy Capital, part of the West Midlands Combined Authority, is here to meet the challenge. The partnership combines world-leading academic expertise with ambitious local authorities, diverse businesses, innovators, and entrepreneurs. A single point for investors and project funders across the West Midlands. Regional Energy System Operator Project, or RESO, 
looks to locally explore the advantages of a new kind of energy system. To meet the net zero challenge, we need innovative, smart solutions. RISO is a partnership of all the key energy players in a city or region like Coventry. There's a lot we can do together. Using data and modeling, we can understand how energy is being used and where efficiencies can be found. We could work with businesses and households to access new markets, providing incentives to reduce and shift energy demand through things like electric vehicles and heat pumps. And we can develop new projects to make sure infrastructure investment enables the latest technology, such as battery storage and hydrogen. And the benefits of a RISO for a city like Coventry? Making some decisions locally means more control, saving on the city's energy bill. Reducing and shifting energy demand means we won't have to invest as much in ensuring peak demand is met. Specific measures can be targeted on areas where people are living in fuel poverty. And we can create new jobs and new technologies to grow smart, green businesses in the area. We in the West Midlands want to take responsibility for our future to get to 2041. The time to act is now. Being accountable public bodies, we're ideally placed to bring people together and represent our local interests. A RISO can help oversee, coordinate, and design our energy system. We can pull more levers to ensure the best outcomes for business and the people of Coventry. As a pioneer, Coventry can prove that with effective local planning, regional coordination, and integrated technologies, we can create a new market. A design we can share with other places across the UK and beyond. By integrating heat, transport, and power technologies linked up using the free flow of live data and information, a RISO can unlock new revenue streams and business opportunities, ultimately leading to cleaner air, improved services, new skilled jobs, and more affordable energy bills, bringing a smarter, greener energy system and a cleaner, brighter future for Coventry and the West Midlands. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Cheryl Howes. I'm Director of Energy Capital at the West Midlands Combined Authority and the Project Director for RISO. Um, I'd like to invite our panellists up to the chairs, if that's all right. And we'll begin by telling you a little bit more about the project and um, hopefully answering some questions. Feel free to sit either side. So in undertaking this project, it's a two year project that we're just about to complete at the end of this financial year. And so this calendar year. And um, we've learned quite a lot of things that we want to start to share with people about the energy system and how we move forward. Um, the key thing for us is that we have been able to demonstrate through the project that there is real value in working together and collaborating to both plan for our energy system and plan how things are done and also in terms of how we operate that energy system and um, how the markets operate around it. It's about bringing the right people together. It's about linking up processes. It's about making sure that the actors who are participating in that own the process and are working collaboratively in their business planning processes and their investment planning processes. It's about bringing evidence to the table to inform decision making there's going to be some really difficult decisions that have to be taken in uh, the move to achieve our net zero goals. And we, we appreciate that, but we need, need to make sure that we're all making them from the same assumptions. We're all working on across on the same um, basis. So we've got that evidence to, to base things on. And we know that those that are democratic decision makers are going to have to be held accountable to, for some of these decisions. So involving the local authorities and our local um, councillors is a really important part of that. We've also seen through the process though, that the way the energy system is run can have real benefits if a, the play, a place based approach is taken locally. So we've heard a little bit about flexibility um, and there are different ways of making sure that our energy system can achieve its goals. One way is to do it all big scale. Another way is to bring everybody into the process. So the flexibility market is something that we can see at a local level really helping with the business case for moving to 
energy storage in people's homes, vehicle to grid technologies, um, the, the electrification and um, of heat and the move to hydrogen and storage there. So by bringing everything together on the transport buildings and energy side, there are lots of advantages that we can see. It creates better economics, hopefully, for those investments and would move us forward on our um, decarbonisation pathway. So today we've got um, about a third of the panel members from um, our RISO project. There's, there's about 15 or so of us who've been working together for the last two years on this. And um, I've got a series of questions that I'm going to ask them um, to hopefully explain a little bit more about what we're doing and invite each of them to in, in, uh, introduce themselves as they um, answer the questions. So, Andrew, I'm going to start with you, if that's okay. Um, the video talked about billions of pounds being spent every year on investment into infrastructure. Um, can you tell us how you think the RISO project would actually mean that that investment is well spent? Thank you, uh, Cheryl. Uh, my name is Andrew Wetton. I'm the commercial director of the RISO project, uh, having been involved for about a year in, in the project. Uh, as you mentioned, there are two aspects to the optimization of that spend on the energy um, system. The first is the optimization of the built infrastructure, and the second is the optimization of that system in operation. Uh, in regard to the built infrastructure, uh, we think there's a role for a local actor to, to work at, say, city scale or regional scale, uh, to work with the DNOs, uh, both the gas and electric city DNOs, to optimize the infrastructure which is built in a local area. Uh, and that's because the cities themselves have a lot more information than, than any other party about their own backyard, essentially that they can bring to the table and they can do things like say, well, look, we know that there's a heat zone is going to be implemented in this area, therefore we don't need to reinforce the gas infrastructure. Uh, or there's a hydrogen project going to go on in this part of the city and therefore we do need to reinforce more in that area. And so that the city can play a large part in, in helping each of the parties who are involved in, in installing infrastructure in the city to optimise that for the benefit of the city, reducing the amount of built infrastructure that's required. Uh, you mentioned in terms of operation uh, of the system, um, and you touched briefly on the flexibility markets. Uh, we think that ARISO has a real role to play in convening a greater and more liquid uh, flexibility and capacity markets. And that could be done through, for example, asset registration mechanisms, uh, greater collection and use of data from the local environment, uh, and that that would allow a, a local market to stretch further than any sort of ESO or DSO market could. So we think that the RISO is able to produce a, a much greater benefit uh, to system uh, utilisation, network utilisation levels, uh, by taking smart local energy actions. Thanks, Andrew. Quite a technical answer. I hope Sorry. we all followed to that. <laughs> but now moving to Lisa. We won't get one. From <laughs> yeah, we can get a little bit less technical, um, but more about people. So people are really concerned about energy prices at the moment. Um, the video earlier spoke a little bit about how some of the benefits of RISO might be around cost reduction. But what's your takeaway from the RISO project in terms of benefits for people? Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Lisa Trickett. I'm co-founder of Place in Common. Um, we're working on the RISO project, really very much looking at how it can drive community wellbeing and also where it could be scaled up and replicated across the region and country. Um, for me, and I think it's a really pertinent point, Cheryl, given actually the profile of our region, we are the West Midlands region, we have absolute pockets of deprivation in our region, Black Birmingham and the Black Country, largest spatial concentration of poverty that you will actually find in Europe. So actually the ability to afford and the ability to participate in any revolution, be it green or clean, actually has to be able to respond to the needs of those communities. And too often what we actually look at is these are the very communities that face the fact that they didn't actually cause the problem because by definition, Poor people are low carbon. They're as sure as hell going to have to pay for it. Birmingham, we have a clean air zone. People are up in arms about paying, going through that. And thirdly, they're not going to be insulated against the changes that will then come through. What you then have is straight away that kind of negative resonance yeah. starting to come through. What we believe the RISO can do is it can actually show and evidence where community benefit can be achieved, where we can balance the needs of a poorer community alongside a much more advanced community. So we really avoid that triple jeopardy. Secondly, I think with RISO um, grants, I'm sure will go on far better than me about the data, but what's really impressed me is the fact 
we are living in a massively uncertain world. The only certainty is uncertainty. And for, and for investors and um, policymakers, there's a, there's a real need for them to have a degree of comfort as to where they're coming from. What actually RISO provides through the data, through the knowledge, through the collaboration, is an ability to navigate, to try and understand and navigate that change. And again, for policymakers and investors, I think that certainty, a degree of certainty and de-risk is very important. Equally though, we hear quite often that local authorities' role is to de-risk for the market. I question that at a time when we've had many local authorities facing austerity, where we have actually massive issues about poverty, local authorities and local communities equally need to see a return and share the risk. And actually what I think RISO allows is for that grown up conversation, how do we collectively share the risk? And final point, um, I'm keen, the, film showed about democratic accountability. We equally have to be honest. There is a real absence of capacity and capability within the system to actually understand how to navigate this at this point in time. And within local authorities, that capacity is quite um, small, both at a street, strategic and a technical level. Again, no one person, no one agency has the answer. So the more we can develop processes that foster collaborative working and bring the DNOs to the table alongside the local authority, alongside those who might be advocating around fuel poverty, the better. So to me, RISO is both a tool and a process that can drive that well-being. Thanks, Lisa. That's great. Um, Maggie, a question for you. The RISO project is based, based very much on the foundation that we've seen at Warwick um, at the university, where um, we've got a one customer with lots of different vectors all integrated. Um, could you tell us a bit about how you've made some savings um, in terms of energy, carbon, etc.? What the benefits are that you've seen at Warwick University? And then you know, we'll think about how that um, is replicated through the RISO project. Right. Um, thank you. Uh, Maggie here from WMG, uh, University of Warwick. Um, so we're talking about um, integrating multiple energy vectors in the campus. So the campus has been running CHP since 2001 and also invested in a district heating system. Um, so this uh, power plants produces electricity, for example, between uh, 2019 and 2020. Uh, these power plants produce about 32,000 megawatt hour to supply at least to 60% of our campus buildings. Um, these power plants also capture the heat uh, from these power plants to heat the water and supply hot water to students and staff. So historically using these um, CHP plants, uh, we have reduced a lot of emissions. Um, so looking at the trend of the emissions reduction of the campus, we have quite a bit of uh, energy savings and emission reduction. Um, we also have a limited number of um, solar installations. So um, in, in 2020, we actually generated about uh, 294 megawatt hour to supply electricity to the campus. Um, uh, on the top of that, we also have um, implemented a lot of building uh, refurbishment and improvements um, between 2009 and 2018. Uh, the university have carried, um, has carried out about 82 projects um, part, as, as a part of its um, carbon reduction plan. So projects include like uh, targeted improvements uh, in the university buildings, for example, like lecture theaters or lab spaces, and also improvements such as like lighting or lighting controls or ventilation or building fabric upgrades. Um, so this uh, project um, leads to an estimated savings of like 1.7 million uh, per annum and estimated carbon savings of um, 9,200 tons of carbon uh, emission equivalent per annum. Um, on top of that as well, we also, um, other scopes includes we monitor and calculate a range of metrics of emissions or energy consumptions per person in the campus, so changes in terms of emission related to staff and uh, students. Um, so we concluded at least uh, we have about 25% to 40% reduction between 2015 to 2020, despite the increase in numbers of the staff uh, uh, and students in the campus. 
So um, in the past, uh, we integrated all these multiple energy vectors such as uh, CHP, hot water heating, um, heating network, uh, increasing renewable uh, generation, improve uh, in building performances, uh, which actually contributed to cost and energy savings and also emission savings. Um, in future, we are actually aiming to move towards like uh, away from burning natural gas and um, moving towards like heat pump installations and use um, increase of our renewable um, installation in the campus, for example, like solar or wind, um, lower temperature water network, uh, improving in terms of like heating network and also thermal storage and continue our building improvements. Um, on the top of that, we also have valuable instrumental system whereby we actually monitor and obtain data in the buildings, which actually um, guided the rest of projects. So um, that's all for me. Thanks, Maggie. It's really clear that monitoring and understanding um, data is a fundamental part of this process. Um, the smart in the smart local energy systems bit for us is absolutely critical. Um, so Grant, do you want to tell us a little bit more about the importance of data in our future energy systems? Yeah, I'm delighted. Um, so the importance of data, it's been a really fascinating project to, to be part of. Um, so Joe and I at the University of Birmingham, we have uh, supported the rest of the group with data uh, that we've been privileged to, to have access to as a, as a team. So uh, it was mentioned Western Power Distribution. So the, the network company delivers, owns the wires uh, for electricity. Uh, we've had quite granular detailed data from them over an extended period of time. Uh, the same from um, Cadent, who are the gas distribution company as well. So at a, a reasonably uh, defined localized area, we get to see in greater detail about what is happening on the network uh, at, at particular points in the past. Uh, we've also had heat network uh, data as well. So it's been a real privilege to work uh, with uh, the project partners and uh, local authorities to really understand and dig away and try and provide some insights really from, from the data because the, the data as interesting as it is, it's, it's just data. So the data and the insights that it brings it really just helps to evidence conversations, uh, which is fantastic because it, it helps to open up different conversations, perhaps shut down different conversations as well. And it's very much an iterative process. So the, the data has been fantastic uh, to, uh, to allow the, the, the project itself to have these really rich conversations. Um, what I would say uh, as well, it's uh, with the project itself, the data landscape, uh, across uh, the UK for uh, projects run by Ofgem, uh, from the Energy Systems Catapult, from Bayes, is there is more and more data that is becoming available and that is to be very, very welcomed uh, because it does, again, allow these conversations to be evidenced a bit better and that has to be a good thing. So um, overall, to wrap up effectively, data has been um, really, really interesting uh, for the project. There are some data gaps, clearly. It's been interesting to, to consider them as we go along as well. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, yeah, I think some of us have been a bit overloaded with the amount of data that this team has been able to create. So, um, it, but it is a very important foundation. Um, the other part of our project was um, looking at the technical aspects and we've um, heard a little bit about those. Um, in terms of, Coventry, but we clearly say in the video that um, Coventry can't generate all of its own electricity or gas. It has to import. It's going to be reliant on the pipes and wires um, to bring bring power and, uh, to the region. But what did we? What did you think that we identified through the project that would be of use in terms of the projects that we can take forward? And, yeah. and how Ariso might be able to help? Yeah. So I'm I'm Brett Willis. I'm head of climate change and sustainability. At Coventry City Council, um, and I'm, I'm based in economic development, and that's a really important aspect of this because actually Coventry sees this as fundamental importance to the future economy of the city. So this isn't just an environmental issue; this is a priority issue for the city as a whole. And I think Riso has been really flagging up the kind of issues and limitations of what we have in the current system 
and how things need to change in terms of the governance of energy in the future. Um, and one of the things that RISO has given us and the data that Grant referred to has been amazing in terms of information that we're getting, insights into how energy is used across the city that we've never known before, which is enabling us to try and prioritize and target those areas which will have the greatest impact. And particularly when we look at issues like fuel poverty, which areas do we need to focus on? What kinds of initiatives? Coventry as well is not favored by having um, opportunities for wind in terms of where it's located geographically. Um, therefore, we're re reliant on solar and, and other sources. And RISO has helped us bring together other organizations and have those useful conversations. So for example, there's Seven Trent, we're, we're talking with Seven Trent around the use of the sewage network for heat recovery. Um, so some of the things are really quite um, innovative and, and, and kind of at the, at the sort of cutting edge, but really, really important. And I think RISO has given us the confidence to look at that. And the important aspect for us is that we recognize as a city that this is a commercial venture for the city council um, and needs to be because we need to help shape the future of the city. And the only way we can do that is be by being one of the partners at the table. So Risa has given us a lot of really useful information around looking at the commercial aspects of the activities that we're doing, and what the likely returns will be and where we need to focus our energies and efforts. And I think that's really fundamental to a project like this. I think every city in the country really needs a RISO and needs the kind of data access that we've been getting. For me, the question is, do we continue to have that data access? And the other thing that it has helped to do is has opened the doors with the DNO. So Western Power, for example, when they launched their five-year plan, mentioned that they would talk to local authority every two years. And we said, you, you've got to be joking. Actually, quarterly might be nice, thank you, but not every two years. We have got planners, and we're about to review our local plan again, and that's going to have a very strong focus on energy. It will inform our supplementary planning guidance. So all of those sorts of things, which are also important, the local authority has a, has a planning authority, has influence over future development and, and the, the net development of infrastructure. We've got companies moving into the city that have specific energy needs, and they're not just energy needs, they are zero carbon energy needs. So how do we find those? And we need to be, we're in on there talking with inward investment teams directly with companies locating. We know what they need. So we need people to listen to us when we're talking about what the kind of infrastructure needs to be like. And we will need to see organizations like Western Power, the major providers, move from being reactive, where people ask them to do things, to being proactive by talking and working with us and planning for the future. A lot of forward planning is desperately needed in terms of this area of activity. If I was to say one thing we need to do is have a RISO type project with does a detailed analysis and a, a capacity to forward plan, have a budget to plan ahead to work for the future, because that's going to be the best cost returns for all of us. Thanks, Brett. That's great. And um, just finally, we've look, also looked at the way in which this could work. So who does what in the energy system and what's the value of um, a local place being involved? Um, Andrew, do you perhaps want to come back on just a couple of points where you think that there is real value in us doing something locally and sort of what that might be and who might do it? Yes, thanks, Cheryl. I think I'm touching on a number of different points from different speakers, but one of the most interesting and valuable parts of the project was that um, because we live in this uncertain future, we don't know whether hydrogen is going to win or whether we should electrify or um, you know, how, how far we need to go to achieve 1.5 degrees. Um, we did scenario modelling. So we took uh, the national grid future energy scenarios, uh, translated through WPD's distribution future energy scenarios, and we added a whole bunch more data um, from the city of Coventry to create what we called the Coventry future energy scenarios, essentially looking at, at different versions of the future and making sure that we could be robust under all, all future circumstances. The benefit of doing that was that we were able to identify uh, sort of no regrets projects. So projects that show up in each of the different scenarios become something that you can immediately execute today because you know you're not cutting off one particular option of the future. So I think that scenario planning and all of the data collection and analysis that goes with that scenario planning is a central feature of the RISO that provides the extra value that you can't get from a national context.
Thanks, Andrew. Well, I think that leads us quite nicely on to our next panel, um, who are going to be joining us to talk about the infrastructure planning and how we go about doing that. Thank you very much. Super. So if this panel could leave and take your microphone straight to the next panel, we were going to have the Andy Street Mayor video at this point whilst we changed <laughs> microphones. Um, so if you'd like to talk amongst yourselves just for two minutes whilst we get the microphone situation sorted out, that would be absolutely fantastic. Good. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for your patience uh, whilst we've done some um, microphone swapping. Um, and uh, this is a really exciting panel. Uh, and uh, they will introduce themselves in, in a moment. Um, it is simply for me uh, to say that um, it's really, really great that not only have we heard now from the about Coventry and the Riso project there, we've now got some of the key players um, on the panel to talk about how we might create those integrated smart local energy systems. So I'm gonna hand over to Cheryl, uh, who's then gonna hand over to Matthew um, by way of introduction. Um, but it's fantastic that Energy Capital are part of the West Midlands Combined Authority and Cheryl's leading some absolutely brilliant work there. So Cheryl, over to you. Thank you. I won't introduce myself again. Um, but the reason why we are here is that through the pr projects that we've been working on, we've identified that um, there's going to be different solutions in different places. We, we know that. Um, and the important aspect about um, how we plan for that is that we, we're talking about infrastructure investment. And infrastructure investment has a long lead in time. It has a long planning time. So if you talk to any of the partners around the table, they've all got business planning processes that they go through and um, which diverts where their investment goes into our inf infrastructure. And that takes a long, long time. We definitely can't align them. Um, that was our kind of objective to start with. It's like, yes, let's align everything. And then when we looked at it, we were like, transport planning, spatial planning, electricity planning, gas planning. These are not going to align. Water planning, it's just not possible. So we do need to find a way to collaborate um, rather than um, align everything. And looking at the projects that we've been working on, it's def there's definitely value in that collaboration, which is the exciting thing. Um, what we're do trying to do now is make sure that that collaboration takes place. We're looking to test what we can do, what we can't do, and hopefully formalize that process over time. And what we want to achieve is informed decision-making, business plans that are well, um, again, evidenced and informed, investment planning that is well evidenced and informed, but also we want to be able to hold partners to account on what they're doing. So in terms of achieving our net zero goals, we want to be making sure that the solutions that we're identifying are the best value solutions for our communities and that the decisions that are being made are the ones that are gonna take us to net zero um, in the timescales that we're looking to achieve. So that's what we're hoping to, to do. I'll hand over to Matthew, who's our chair, to tell you a bit more. Thank you very much, Cheryl, um, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Matthew Rhodes. I'm the chair of Energy Capital, um, and I guess I'm, I'm sitting here now far, four or five years into the life of Energy Capital. So I've been chair since its inception in 2016, um, when I was a board member of the Greater Birmingham and Solihull Local Enterprise Partnership. And we were delighted. Uh, so I was part of the conversations when um, the combined authority actually came into being. So before we, we, we had uh, a mayor first time around. Um, and the conversation was about what the combined authority should get involved in, what it shouldn't get involved in. And clearly it's going to do um, transport and it's got involved in housing and skills. But there was a conversation at the time between the local authorities uh, and the LEPs in the West Midlands about whether energy should be part of uh, the, the remit, if you like, of, of this new combined authority uh, beast. And, and we decided it should be. Um, and, and the reason for that, I think, is probably fairly obvious from everything else you've been talking about today. Um, but there's a very strong sense uh, that energy matters to the West Midlands. Um, the cost of energy matters to the West Midlands. The nature of the energy vectors, gas, electricity, um, uh, hydrogen maybe down the line, they all matter to the uh, West Midlands because they've shaped the communities we live in. They've shaped the black country where we are today. They've shaped Coventry around the, the, the transport industry and they've shaped um, Birmingham. And, and I think there was a very strong sense going back four or five years that um, the, the one size fits all approach that the UK had taken to energy for the past 50 or 60 years had really um, 
let us down to an extent in parts of uh, the West Midlands, um, both economically and environmentally. Uh, we felt that uh, we could do better, really, if we had some uh, greater say in the UK energy system. So energy capital came out of that. It came out of that um, in the absence of any uh, delegated powers for local authorities or combined authorities in the UK of energy. So big question mark about what this thing should actually do. Uh, and the, the last four or five years have all been a conversation really, between the partners you can see on the stage here, uh, between ourselves and government about what form that should take. There's still a long way to go, uh, but we've made considerable progress. And it's, you know, it's a, a credit to Ed and, and Cheryl and, and everybody who's been involved, uh, the distance we, we've travelled. Um, as I've, said, I've probably said already, we, we're, we're convinced we have a contribution to make. The RISO project's an example of the kind of areas we think we can make a contribution. It, the, the essence is that, that in a, a transition to a zero carbon world, one size fits all solutions are clearly not going to be the cheapest pathways, the lowest cost pathways for our society to do that because uh, a zero carbon world is so different from the fossil fuel fueled world uh, we've been used to. So if, if we insist on a one size fits all uh, national approach solely and don't allow local authorities and regional authorities to have a greater say, value will be lost, jobs will be lost, um, carbon saving opportunities will be lost and I think we'll go a f much, much slower than we could potentially do. There are bits of this region that are really keen to move ahead um, and it's the infrastructure uh, that will make that, that possible. So I'm delighted everyone's here today. Um, I hand back to Ed for sharing the session. Well, brilliant. And so good then in that context that we've got such a fantastic group of people together who really are the people who can make those systems integration opportunities um, actually happen. So let's go down the panel, just a minute from each of you. Where are you from? Who are you? Why do you think collaboration is so good? So Mark, do you want to start? I certainly can. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mark Shaw. I'm the regional um, manager for the West Midlands area, but also look after our business plan. Uh, as a company, we s supply 8 million customers across the, the whole of the South West, South Wales. And our focus, and you may be surprised to hear this, is very much with the business plan, our top objective is sustainability. It's not about keeping power on, it's about sustainability. And we can only do that by collaboration. And our, our focus is very much collaborating with the local uh, authorities, the local enterprise partnerships to understand what their plans are, how, how committed they are to net zero, and also collaboration with other organisations and utilities, so the gas uh, and the, the local gas distribution network operators and the gas transmission. So I think I echo everything that's been said so far, and I'd also say things like this, these sort of conferences are extremely important to the utilities. And believe it or not, we are all on board with net zero and we really want to collaborate. Brilliant. So you look after the electricity system um, and, and uh, to that extent, um, play your role in these in these local area energy planning processes catherine yes um, uh, otherwise no. sorry kate <laughs> kate you look after the gas system do you want to tell us a bit about what you do and, Thanks, and why you think uh, uh, <laughs> um so my name is kate grant <clears throat> excuse me and i work for cadent gas and I admit that actually this is one of the most exciting panels I've been on for some time because of how well represented it is from all of the utilities in the West Midlands. And I think this is a really exciting opportunity and representative of how we all want to collaborate. Um, so I am the network director for the West Midlands gas distribution part of the Cadent business. So my network runs all the way up to Stoke-on-Trent down to Hereford. It's just over 26,000 kilometers of gas pipes. Um, we service 2 million domestic and business properties. Um, and like Mark, our priority is also uh, around helping or enabling the region to deliver um, net zero. A significant proportion uh, of our domestic energy consumption is supplied through natural gas and therefore <clears throat> Cadent has a moral imperative because we transport natural gas to transition or enable that transition towards a renewable energy supply. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Kate. And then Catherine, um, from a government perspective, um, 
are you excited about these different people all coming together and 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 how does it fit with um these net zero local net zero hubs that you're thinking about so um yes very very exciting to be here today so i'm catherine wright i'm from the department of business energy and industrial strategy where i lead our work on working with local authorities on net zero and i also lead our work on working uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from public sector buildings and clearly we're the government department that leads all the work on net zero uh, overall um, many government departments have a role in and, and we know it's a very complicated and challenging ambition that we've set ourselves in the uk uh, a very worthwhile one so of course it requires all sorts of different actors to come together uh, and there is a particular opportunity to do so locally uh, where you know local authorities have a leadership role and many statutory responsibilities that are relevant to, to, to net zero and also the opportunity to think about you know what are the particular solutions to that local area how do you take advantage of the local opportunities how do you respond to the local challenges what are the unique characteristics and how do you fit it all together in a specific place how do you think about the system as a whole where can you find those synergistic solutions the flexibility the the efficiency of the system as a whole and of course where are the challenges in doing that because we all know there are challenges and i think the work that you're doing here uh, will hopefully teach us a lot about both the opportunities and the challenges and will be something that others in other parts of the country can learn from as indeed we're already doing through our local net zero program our local net zero hubs that you you mentioned uh the, the midlands one that supports this area uh, and supports local authorities many of whom are doing brilliant work um and learning from each other uh, and so this just builds on that uh, on that work to date brilliant brilliant um, and one of the statutory responsibilities that um that we have as a region is transport so um andy is here uh, from transport for west midlands do you want to introduce yourself and say why you think transport fits with the mix of people that are also on this panel sure um thanks uh good afternoon everybody uh, andy page transport for west midlands uh we're part of west midlands combined authority um, as i'm sure you know uh, we're responsible for supporting the, uh, the local rail network. Uh, we manage uh, a Midland Metro system. Uh, we work very closely with our local bus operators. Uh, we have a really dense network in the West Midlands. Uh, all of it requires power. And of course, uh, increasingly over time, we're moving towards uh, more sustainable fuels, uh, et cetera, uh, in our vehicles, in our buses, uh, in our local trains. Um, so I think this panel for me is really an evolution uh, in terms of the work that we've done with Energy Capital and colleagues across the panel. And I think it's a really positive e evolution. Um, and another Ocean word is revolution. And I think we're going to need a revolution in the way we power our vehicles and transport going forward. So, you know, I think we're really, really keen to be uh, involved in this panel. And uh, we look forward to uh, the good work I'm sure that we're going to take forward over the next few years. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, and then Danielle and Tim, um, if we do you next, because you're both from National Grid, yep. um, tell us a bit about what do you do, what you're responsible, what, what you're responsible for, and why National Grid would want to be part of this kind of conversation. Sure. So good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here on such a diverse panel today, and I'm really looking forward to working with everybody here going forward. My name is Danielle Stewart. I'm Hydrogen Programme Manager for National Grid Gas Transmission. National Grid owns and operates gas and electricity infrastructure around the UK and moves energy pretty much to where it's needed all over the place. I'll let Tim talk about electricity and I'll say a few words about gas. So we have around seven and a half thousand kilometres of high pressure natural gas pipelines that span the length and the breadth of the country today. And around three times the amount of energy is transported by the gas transmission system when you compare that to the electricity wires. And on a cold winter's day, that could be as much as four to five times the amount. So reaching net zero is both a challenge of both scale and pace. 85% of our homes are heated by natural gas. That's around 22 million gas consumers in the UK. Around 40% of our gas demand goes to power generation and the remainder goes to industrial usage. So really, we need to really focus on how we make ourselves much more sustainable. And there's a number of options. We're going to need to replace natural gas. And one of those options is low carbon hydrogen. And National Grid is currently exploring how it can reuse our assets to transport low carbon hydrogen affordably and efficiently to consumers who may want it in the future, or perhaps even may need it in the future. Now we understand that we need to understand how much hydrogen might be there in the future and where it'll be used, whether that's in heat, power, transports, or in, in industry as well. And that's why enhanced collaboration at a local level is going to be really, really critical. 
We need to understand local diversity, some of the subtleties and some of the complexities at a local level, whether that's in geography, whether that's social differences, economic differences, or even in our infrastructure. And this will allow us to plan and invest in our infrastructure in the right places at the right time so that we can size and shape our network to enable fair and affordable access for everybody. So we recognize there's a mosaic of solutions needed. It's not one size fits all. We are going to need more renewable electricity. We will need low carbon gases. But by working together, we can educate and we can understand some of the options and evaluate those options that are available to us. The National Grid, I think it's fair to say, is committed to helping local communities achieve their, their net zero goals. Brilliant. Tim, do you want to just build on that from the electricity point of view? Yeah, sure. Uh, so hi everybody, I'm Tim O'Reilly, so I'm the uh, business strategy and planning manager for National Grid Electricity Transmission. Uh, so we look after the transmission system in England and Wales uh, from, a, from an infrastructure build perspective. And our colleagues in the ESO, who aren't here, but you know, in spirit, uh, are, uh, they, they manage the energy system on a hour by hour, minute by minute basis. Uh, so, so as Daniel says, you know, it's, it's about a mixed solution and how we fit into a wider energy system. Um, in electricity, what we're most concerned with at the moment in terms of developing a net zero system are changes in generation. Um, we've been dealing with that over the past decade in terms of greening out uh, the energy generation fleet, you know, bringing on of uh, offshore wind, et cetera. That's set to accelerate significantly um, and you know, all the technologies coming online. Um, but what's complicating that in the immediate sense around net zero is changes in demand. And demand can change really quickly. So from those consumer, those quick consumer changes, so you know, the, the individual decision to buy a car multiplied by a town, multiplied by a city, multiplied by a region, uh, cause us to scratch our heads somewhat in, uh, in infrastructure planning terms. So it can take 10 years to build infrastructure. Um, that's going through the planning process, that's about as fast as we can do it. So we need to make some really good decisions. We need some really strong plans um, to support our customers. So the West Midlands represents quite a sizable portion of the UK, uh, but this isn't the sort of only forum. And what we need to do is develop a, a really strong narrative, a really strong plan for how we achieve net zero, taking into account all those different changes, be it hydrogen, be it demand reduction, be it smart networks, et cetera. Um, so, so one of the key aspects that we're really concerned about is resilience. Uh, so in electricity, you don't have any sort of inherent resilience. If it goes wrong, it goes wrong, and that's it. It's, it's gone. So what we're trying to do is build out a system that works for lots of different scenarios, that has the ability to bring on that generation so that we're, so the windmills aren't stopping turning, we're burning gas to stabilise the system. That would be a super waste of money. And you know, so the previous panel talked about you know, supplying that infrastructure at, at, at best value to, to the consumer. And it's really important, you know, net zero is going to be really expensive and we're trying to do the best we can to minimize that cost to consumer, but without destroying any user function. So allowing consumers to consume when they want to consume. Brilliant. So we've heard about electricity, we've heard about gas, we've heard about transport. What about water? Neil, last but by no means least, yeah, um, so. what do you do and, and, and why do you feel that this kind of collaboration through a panel like this is so important? Yeah, sorry to just point your head. So I'm going to talk about gas and I'm going to talk about electricity. I'll come back to those in a sec. Um, yeah, I work for Seven Trent. Um, Seven Trent, you'll know, no doubt, as your um, supplier of water and uh, your service provider for, for sewage disposal and, and treatment. Um, and that is the main part of what the business does. Um, but it's quite a big energy consumer um, to pump water around. It's quite heavy. Um, we have explored opportunities to generate our own renewable energy over the last 20 years. Uh, and we've reached a point where 50% of the energy we consume to operate all those processes is generated um, from our own generation assets. Um, and, and a large part of that, and this is where I talk about gas, is, is from um, aerobic digestion of sewage sludge. So that produces a biogas, which is methane. The methane has typically been turned into electricity and injected into the grid at the host site or consumed on the host site before it even goes um, behind in front of the meter. Um, and then more recently in the last sort of five years, we switched to upgrading that biogas into biomethane, which is then injected into the cadent gas grid um, and, and beyond cadent in, in a few other areas where we operate. So um, being able to uh, recover those resources that everyone kindly contributes via the sewer and turn them into something useful um, is a really good story. Um, and it's helped us on our, our company's own journey towards net zero. But then when you've done that, we've then um, uh, leveraged that, that. That's what we've learned into other renewable technologies as well. And so anaerobic digestion of food waste. 
in our non-regulated business, Seven Trent Green Power, has sort of been spawned from that. And that now generates an equal amount of energy to, to what we generate from sewage. Again, gas and electricity. Um, and there's more potential in that area as well. Um, so um, I guess, what, what do I bring to the panel? I, I bring to the panel access to Seven Trent. I think personally, I bring to the panel um, experience of developing renewable energy assets and the kind of um, complications that you find when you're trying to connect up to your networks and your systems that you need to do. And, and I, I guess from all of us, we, we, we can leverage the expertise and the capacity within our organizations. Mm. It isn't just us as individuals and what we bring. So I'm really looking forward to it. Brilliant, brilliant. So Neil's given us a great example of, if you like, the integration between water and gas and electricity and where you can really unlock some value, if you like, in um, through, through that integration, through the way in which that works. I wonder if other panellists have got kind of examples or ideas about how, by working together as a panel, um, we can unlock value for the region. Mark, I don't know if there's anything you want to say about how we unlock value uh, for the region by, by working together. Really good question. I guess, I mean, for us, it's, it's important that we understand what the local authorities, that the LEPs want to do. Uh, we need to understand that, firstly, what are their, their, their sort of um, strategy for getting to net zero? And I think there's, there's an element there of making sure that we can unlock the capacity on the electricity network in order to make sure that they, that they or we can keep up and enable net zero. But we also have an opportunity to say, well, is unlocking electricity the way to do it? Is there another option? Is there, are there looking at gas? Is there an alternative where gas would be a better solution? Or do I look to my transmission colleagues to say, actually, we could unlock that capacity, but maybe transmission would be better served to do it. So I think there's, there's lots of examples of potentially how that could happen. We also have to look at something, I don't know, maybe on the gas side, if you've got a, an iron main replacement program, uh, and that may um, cost a lot of money, that may mean that the consumers have to pay a lot of money to do that. Is, is there an alternative? Is there an alternative that actually saying, well, why don't we transform those, those customers uh, into electricity customers, put electric heat pumps in there and, and put them onto my network and we can work together to collaborate in that way. And there'll be vice versa. There'll be other ways of, of working the other way to do that. So- Kate, you're just... nodding. Do, you, do, do you, you, you look like you agree with that? Is that, is that? is that something that you can see some value in as well? Yeah, for me, this is, this is about an, um, an engineering solution that helps our customers. Um, one of your previous panelists spoke about um, some of our customers in Black Country and Birmingham, which both of our areas cover, that are within the most deprived communities in Europe, I think she said. And for me, um, this is so critical in terms of we need to work together to provide affordable, fair, clean energy. Mm -hmm. we, I, I think it's a very unhelpful rhetoric to back one type of technology or to say that we're competing against each other because actually what we need is to enable an energy transition for those customers. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I agree, you know, in terms of. And um, Dania, you're nodding to that one as well. Do you want to add anything to that? <laughs> sure, so I agree with everything that, that's just been said, of course, but I think by working together, we can approach a, a kind of low carbon energy transition that really reflects the context of the West Midlands and the priorities of the West Midlands and ensure that they really understand what the options are for the region. And I really liked what I think it was Lisa said on the last panel, no one person has all of the answers. Mm. So we're going to need to work together on that. And different people and different organizations can really provide different insights and information so we can develop energy strategies that really achieve the best outcomes for the West Midlands. And I think there's a whole load of other benefits and I can talk about all of them, but I think I'll allow some of the other panel. Well, let me bring Matthew in. I just want to, I think an important additional point is that the scope of this goes beyond the energy infrastructure companies as well. So there's collaboration between yeah. them, but um, local authorities, housing providers, developers have all got key roles to play. And it's all about getting the right information in the right place at the right time. So you don't have to solve a problem by getting electricity or gas to the housing development. You could solve the problem by making the housing development very energy efficient. So you don't actually need the electricity or gas in the first place. And that's a, that's a conversation between 
the, the network providers and the local authority and the developer. And, and going the other way, you know, there are problems that Mark faces and Kate faces around their networks. There are better places to build factories, gigafactories or any types of factories on their networks that actually then reduce the cost for all their customers because they don't have to adapt in quite the same way. Right. Those are very interactive sort of conversations. And we've got markets that, and, and mechanisms, regulatory mechanisms that deliver a lot of outcomes but a lot of those kind of outcomes are not delivered by the, the existing mechanism. So well, let's hang on to the challenges. We're going to come back to the challenges in a moment. But Andy, I just want to know from a transport point of view, how, how does this integrated approach that we're talking about unlock value for you or rather unlock value for people using public transport? I think, um, you know, we set out our transport plans five, 10, 20 years in advance. Um, recently just submitted a bit <clears> to government <throat> where it's successful, 1.1 billion worth of transport infrastructure uh, projects uh, coming to the West Midlands over the next five years. Um, so some of those projects uh, in that bid were very much focused around uh, sustainable uh, transport. So whether that's electrification of buses, um, we've recently submitted a bid for 200 hydrogen buses. Uh, we have electric bus town in Coventry already happening. So there's significant investment already happening in the you know, low zero carbon infrastructure. And I think this panel will help us plan future projects, future developments over the next five to 10 years. So we can actually join uh, some of our work better together, I think. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, so Matthew, you, you mentioned as you were finishing just then that um, there's a lot of synergy and there's a lot of enthusiasm for working together, but there are regulatory challenges in relation to how that happens. Do you want to say a little bit about that and and how that works <laughs> yeah. or how it does or even how it doesn't work i'll, I'll, I'll exchange and I'll, I'll explain energy market regulation in 20 25 <laughs> seconds no um, i think you know, it, it, the system as it's set up is, is for um, energy uh, organizations to be regulated from london so they're centralized which is it, it's not the best way to get into the detail of the opportunities in the black country or birmingham for uh, delivering zero carbon uh, solutions effectively. So we've got a missing bit there. I think that's, I've got three three points. That's number one. Number two, I think there's a, there's a a competence sort of issue with local authorities. So there's a, there's a need for challenge to the um, uh, utility, the infrastructure providers in detail. And local authorities have not got that competence at the moment. So there's quite a big hill to climb. And, and that is a potentially vicious circle of failure, if not careful, that we need to, to address. And that's linked to my third point, which is around money. <laughs> um, so the current model of, and, and these are all quite big problems, but the current model of local authority funding in the UK for this kind of stuff is basically project-based. So a lot of the work in the West Midlands, for example, has been innovation funding, maybe EIDF funding, there's some EIDF programs in the room. Those are one-offs, they last two or three years. They don't allow you to build the competence and the capability. Mm. Um, we started to do some numbers for Coventry and the Riso project. They're into tens of millions of, of ongoing capability on the public sector side of the table mm. to have a constructive and creative mm. conversation with the other people on this panel. Mm. Uh, so we need ways of funding that that are institutionalized across the country sure. um, to do, do things fairly. So it's a long way to go yet. Sure. And Catherine, do you, do you hear those challenges? Do you recognize those challenges in terms of, you know, regulation, capacity at the local level, um, funding, long-term funding? Does that, how, how does that resonate with you? People, people certainly raise challenges with us. Uh, funding, of course, people raise the challenge of funding. There's always a discussion to be had about the level of funding and how it's how it's delivered, uh, challenge of capacity and capability. Uh, yes, absolutely, that's something that, mm. that we recognise, and indeed we've been supporting through our local net zero hubs. hubs. We've been supporting yeah. local authority capacity yeah. and capability uh, for for some some while now, and there's you know there's clearly more to do. Um, I think the other challenges that that come up. Uh, Quite, quite frequently, the I mean, there's there's, a, there's one challenge, which is that there are some things that we don't know how to do yet collectively, and mm. that's why we have research programs and why you know learning from each other and learning good practice such as such as you're doing here is is a good idea. Uh, and data is one that comes up. Having consistent, accessible data of the right sort that, that can be used, uh, we've got some uh, work looking at that through the Prospect for Energy uh, Revolution um, Innovation Program 
Um, and indeed, if I may, one thing mm -hmm. uh, in, in our innovation program to mention to everyone uh, who's either here in person or, or watching uh, remotely, we've currently got a questionnaire out under our innovation program on how innovation can support uh, local, smart, flexible uh, energy systems. So that's online and open until Sunday. So please do uh, take the opportunity to, to have your say on that. Sure, sure. And some of the work that we heard about earlier from Coventry and there's other um, research projects around um, around the West Midlands absolutely will feed through uh, into, into that some of that innovation. We, we're we really looking to extend some of those um, those innovation projects as well. So so that's, that's fantastic. Um, let's get into this kind of I'm going to put it in a kind of crude way, electricity versus gas debate, if you see what I mean, and how those two things uh, relate with, with one another. Tim, let me, let me come to you. And, you know, there's a sense in which the um, incentives for both gas and electricity aren't particularly aligned. So how do you, how do you see that challenge? And, and how might a panel like this, again, help us to mm. kind of move forward with that debate? So I think in, so, so, so in the previous, you know, period. I think there's been a very different usage of electricity and gas in, in, in history. So, you know, gas has been used for space heating and, and cooking and electricity has been used for lighting, etc. So in a net zero world, uh, we kind of throw that on its head. We're bringing in new technologies to do different things. Um, so I think that electricity and gas in a net zero system quite likely to be very closely linked. Uh, so if you think about where your gas comes from, so your hydrogen could come from uh, steam methane reformation it could come from uh, electrolysis it can come from a, a number of sources and i think in that in that sense you know green hydrogen that's suitable for electric vehicles for example so very very high purity hydrogen needs to come from electrolysis so in the electricity system that's something that we need to uh you know plan for and, and understand and, and and provide um so i guess the incentivization and the interplay probably needs to change and i think back to the regulation point that you made before previous regulation has been focused on very different things than it is that needs to be in the future. So incremental build out of networks, incremental changes about optimization for the consumer in terms of cost, so economic regulation. Um, those incentivization areas in the future need to probably look much more towards decarbonization, but offer consumer protection and consumer choice. Um, Catherine makes a really good point with that. Um, let me, let me, let me put it down this end of the, 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 the panel. So, you know, um, Mark, Kate, what kind of incentives do you think might help you in each of your roles to um, take further that, that kind of commitment to collaborate that, 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 that is there? Should I start? <laughs> <You don't. laughs> I'm going to go first. I, actually, I don't think incentives are that important necessarily. Okay. I, mean, I, I think that, that it's quite clear that there isn't a, an incentive mechanism really with the regulator at this moment in time. Um, but there is a clear focus, a clear steer to whole system solutions. There's a clear steer to, to net zero. And I think you, you can see the demonstration that on this panel, you've got senior members of, of the you know, electricity um, transmission, electricity distribution, gas distribution, transmission. And, and we're all saying the same thing, you know, that, that we can find solutions that are going to work for the customer. It's not about an electricity solution. It's not about a gas solution. It is about an energy solution potentially and getting what's best for the customer. We're all driving net zero, affordable for the customer, and the incentives would be nice. Yeah, uh, and, but, but we, we're driven by incentives because potentially that's financial. But I think the reputational thing is the, the key right. for us. And I think probably, I, I'm not speaking for my colleagues, I'm sure they'll say, but the reputational element of that. And there is no doubt that that is driving all of us with the focus room of Gem and Bayes on net zero and whole system strategies to be able to work collaboratively and have really robust strategies to ensure that we will work together to make sure the customer gets the affordable energy supply they deserve. Kate? Yeah, so I guess going back to that um, perception potentially that we would have different priorities. Um, my priority is to ensure that all customers have a, a safe and reliable energy supply and that that's a renewable energy supply. And I suspect if you asked Mark, that would be his priority as well. Um, Ofgem, our regulator, does incentivize whole system thinking in this regulatory period for us. We are encouraged to work with our colleagues in Western Power Distribution and across the, the network, um, the other utilities. Um, for us at Cadent, um, there is a big focus on hydrogen naturally because that is the s single biggest opportunity for us to decarbonize the gas that we transport. 
Um, recently, there was um, the government um, published a hydrogen strategy, which indicated that up to 35% of our future energy mix could be provided by hydrogen. So obviously, it's very important for me today to understand what that means for my network and how I invest in it. Um, so we, uh, Mark mentioned earlier, we, we, we replace um, annually around 300 or over 300 kilometers of iron mains replacement. I'm investing in my network today. So I need to understand the local energy requirements to know where I need to reinforce the networks and where I don't. But government um, also said that it wasn't gonna make a decision anytime soon on this. I just, uh, I'll let you off that one, but Danielle, I'm going to come to you on that no, one. Sorry, if I can just <laughs> No, go on, go on. I think, I think we cannot wait for the government to take a decision, make a decision. I think um, as, as, um, as business owners in the area, we need to invest with the assumption that we need to meet, meet net zero. And that is going to take a whole host of different technologies to get sure. there because the government will, will not make a decision in time to enable that, I think. Okay. Danielle, do you want to come in on that? I'm going to bring Cheryl in. Sure. So, again, I think everyone's made some really good points, and I'd agree with that. We're all collaborating to work to a single goal, and that's to decarbonize so that we can positively impact climate change. So I think we have a common goal. We are collaborating. I probably spend most of my time working with the gas distribution networks outside mm. of National Grid, as well as European transmission system operators rather than actually internal colleagues. So most of my time is spent collaborating, cooperating and co-creating actually, because that's the only way we innovate. And I agree, I don't think we can wait for policy. And at the moment, I know both gas and electricity networks are working on building the evidence so that we can have informed policy decisions. And that's the technical evidence, that's the economic evidence, that's the social evidence, because that's a really key part of the transition. So I agree with everything that's been said, but sure. I think from my perspective, I am seeing a huge amount of collaboration and cooperation today. Great. Cheryl, do you want to come in on this? Yeah, thanks, Ed. Um, we've talked a, bit, a little bit about Ofgem being a regulator of our industries around the table, and um, not all of them, sorry, there's also, also off but, um, and that, that's a really important point that they consider um, a whole system to be energy, um, a whole energy system to be electricity and gas. But for us in a place, we also obviously are concerned about transport, water, housing, et cetera, and that being the whole system. And I think there are some regulatory changes that might help. Um, they might help address the funding issue that we've talked about. So I think some of the funding needs to go in a slightly different route to enable some of that capacity building. So maybe changing some of the emphasis from the system talking to the people to perhaps the people talking to the system. Um, and I think we also need to see um, often making sure that our network operators are answerable, answerable in terms of having the right answer for each area. So not necessarily, that's not necessarily going to be the same in every place as we've talked about. So what, what is the right solution? Is it going to be one or the other or both or how is it going to work? Um, and often need to be kind of answerable to our consumers and our in terms of our communities, not just consumers as in individuals. And I think that's an important part that we're trying to bring forward. Sure. Now, we literally don't have any more room on the stage um, <laughs> to fit any others, but the people who I think are missing from the stage are the local authorities. And I can see Ross, you know, sitting there uh, in the audience as, as, as well. They're key to all of the conversations that we need to have in terms of local area energy planning. And so I just wondered if anybody wants to come in on, on how you see the relationship between yourselves as whatever we want to call you, utilities providers and so on, um, with, with local authorities uh, in taking forward these conversations. Anybody want to come in on? on I'll, I'll start if you like. Yeah, please yeah. do, Mark. Yeah. Okay, so I've mentioned <clears throat> a couple of times and I think the, the, the interaction with local authorities is critical from, from two parts, really. But the first thing is very much, we, we work on a forecast energy scenario that comes from National Grid, comes down to, to us. And, and, and that is our best view of potentially what the, the take up for low carbon technology for new, neural generation is gonna be, um, major energy uses for, for that area. Um, but, but that has to be qualified by the aspirations of each of those local authorities. So we need to be able to moderate that because that's a, almost a technical view of the forecast with what the local authorities want to do. What is their profile? What are their priorities? Where, what areas are they gonna put that in? And that will help us to plan the network from the point of view of electricity side, 
from my point, but also the, the whole systems approach with my colleagues on, on the table. So that's one element of it, to be able to have that really close collaboration to make sure that we understand the what are the, the, the what are the aspirations for, for net zero, what are your timetable for it, what areas that the local authority is going to do. But on the other side of it, and it's very much the point that Matthew made, is that we know where we've got the capacity on the network. We know how our network is operating. So we can actually help to steer strategic decisions by the local authorities, by the labs, to say, you know, if you want affordable energy, then if you phase it in this way, then you're going to have the, the, the best solution to be able to, you know, to deliver what you want to do in that, that zero um, that way. So there's a definitely a two-way conversation that needs to be happening. And that engagement is, is, is critical. And you know, in, in, in our business plan, we're putting extra um, local area energy uh, engineers in to make sure we have that liaison with 130 local authorities that we engage in across the WPD patch. Brilliant, brilliant. Anybody else on? Matthew, do you want to come in yeah, on? Yeah, I, I'm going to make one point here, which is, is um, picks up on what Cheryl was saying as well, I think. For me, the critical thing here is local authorities need to be given a formal statutory is probably the right word, role in the energy system. Currently, the, the UK energy system recognises only two things, two customers. There's, there's the government, Ofgem, which has a strategic view which is really important but far too broad to deliver net zero in a cost effective way and the other customer group is market participants you and me etc and the problem with that group is we're all focused on the short term in the end inevitably even if we're um i don't know a car company and we're building a factory it's about our connection costs and so on so we've all got short-term perspectives there is a completely missing piece and it's the place with the strategic interest in the next 20 30 years of the black country or birmingham or the west midlands and it's local authorities that sit there they need to be able to articulate that in the energy regulatory system and they need to be funded to do it it's it's no good government simply saying mm. just do it because if you don't have the knowledge you can't possibly communicate with mark and his people you know, these are these are challenging detailed technical conversations uh, and, and people who are able to have them are actually relatively rare sadly <laughs> Cheryl I was just going to build on um, Matthew's point to say that again, if you look at it from a government point of view or a national point of view, people don't m mind where things happen. It's not important. So if all the generation is in one place and um, all the carbon capture and storage is in another place based on geography and where the opportunities are, then that, that's that's fine as far as the central government's concerned. But when you come when it comes to places and places where people live, the cost of decarbonizing is fundamental to the economics of business um, and whether they're going to continue and whether they can continue in the location that they're currently um, based. And so for us, um, the energy transition is a really important aspect of levelling up. Um, the government talks about it's not just about pumping money into the north of England. It's about making sure that we are in, the, in the Midlands are able to decarbonise effectively, maintain our industries, maintain our businesses or transition them. And part of the objective around smartening our energy system and making it um, more participatory i suppose enabling those multiple dispatchable assets to be part of the, the the market going forward is really really important great catherine have you got a, a view on sort of how we might work with local authorities and integrate them more into the kind of conversations we have or indeed the role of the combined authority as well so one of the things that we've said in the net zero strategy that we published mm. recently uh was uh was absolutely, we see a very, very important role for local authorities. Indeed, many local authorities are doing fantastic work already on net zero. Um, definitely have uh, the role thinking about net zero locally and thinking about, as I said, the different responsibilities that local authorities have, but also uh, as, as the local actor that can help to facilitate discussions and convene between, mm. between you know, the types of groups we've got here today. Mm. Um, we've also uh, said, uh, particularly uh, for, for what we're doing in government, uh, that we want to engage local authorities in a uh, in a new way. We're setting up a new local net zero forum uh, to help strengthen that that discussion uh, and think about some of these uh, these big questions that local authorities raise with us, uh, as well as continuing the support that we provide through the local net zero program. And I think the um, I said this start the opportunity to think about a place based approach to look at how you can uh, look for the synergies when you're thinking about what you're doing. Uh, with energy generation when what you're doing on planning what you're doing in transport what you're doing in waste and are there ways that those can be um, 
the action in those areas can be combined to, to, to actually move us towards the net zero faster and in a, a, in a more effective or even you know, less, less costly way. Um, but there, there's a big opportunity there, I think, and a big opportunity to learn from each other mm -hmm. and from places like this that are actually very ambitious at Fording Ahead. Um, so I say we're very interested to see what comes out of the work that you're, you're doing here. Mm, absolutely. I mean, next time we all get together, it will be jackets off, sleeves rolled up, literally around a table, having the real conversations that we need to have. Before we move off local authorities, which I think is so key, Ross, I can see you sitting there. I, I'm, I'm desperate to kind of bring you in and get your opinion. I don't want to put you on the spot if you really don't want to, but is there anything, is there anything you'd like to kind of contribute to this conversation? <laughs> Oh, look, you've even got a mic, Eleanor, thank you. Do you want to introduce yourself for the sake of everybody else? Thank you. So I'm uh, Ross Cook, Director of Housing and uh, Environment at Wolverhampton City Council. So re really welcome all the contributions from the panel today. And I think um, some of it has been touched on, particularly around capacity and connectivity to the grid. Um, and if I think around the, the city ourselves and actually the next panel being been chaired by our cabinet member to talk about place. But when you think that we're we're looking at a growth of around 20,000 properties over the next sort of 10 years, in some ways that growth is easier to, to work on, but we need that conversation to be, to be planning it so that we know when it's coming online and what we need to do. At the same time, we've got 20,000 of our own housing stock and the retrofit of that is far more difficult. And that's the challenging conversation to think about how do we turn that around in the next 10, 15 years to actually be more uh, energy efficient. Again, I think somebody mentioned before around that, that building new with that energy efficiency. So do we know now, do we know now what those houses will need in 10 years time? So when we're thinking about that construction um, and the methods of construction, are we building in the new tech that actually means that they don't need to draw off the grid in, in five years time? Um, so it's a really important conversation. And then again, transport is another key part of it, isn't it? So wherever we are seeing growth in the, the sort of, you know, demand on local transport, uh, public transport as well, how we've got that connectivity to make sure that it's a first choice for people so that we're not thinking about, you know, we often say that actually, you know, 60 electric cars is the, is the same um, congestion as 60 petrol or diesel cars. So it might solve one issue with, with regards to climate and, and the, the impact on, on the um, air quality, but it's the same congestion. So how do we change that? And how do we encourage more people to use public transport as well? Come back to that strategic planning, doesn't it? So we have to be up, all sat around the table together to think about growth and uh, how we can work together and certainly welcome uh, further conversations with you all. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Ross. So we're right up against time. I hope that um, here at this regional COP, um, where we're hearing about big international global commitments, um, there is that sense that we have demonstrated by this panel and the comments that we've heard today that there is a special commitment in the West Midlands to working together for net zero and how um, all of you uh, and us can work together with our local authorities, with our LEPs, um, in order to really think very hard about local area energy planning and what that means, particularly for the way in which you all invest, we all invest um, in uh, in, in the future of the West Midlands. So um, I see this as our big commitment that we are making as part of COP26 today. So thank you to all of our panel for um, joining us today. And um, we're going to, again, have a five minute hubbub whilst uh, we change uh, and we'll have, we're moving on now to think about place as if we haven't been talking about place already, <laughs> but we're gonna think about place and the built environment in our next session. So thanks everybody very much. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Well, um, we have moved from transport through energy and now uh, we're at the part of the jigsaw puzzle where we're thinking about place. Uh, and in many respects, place brings so much of this together, but we're also thinking especially about the built environment um, in this session. And uh, once again, we've got a fantastic uh, panel of speakers. I will introduce them uh, each in turn as they, as they come up. Um, and first of all, I'd like to introduce Councillor Steve Evans. Um, Councillor Steve Evans is the city's cabinet member for the environment here at the city of Wolverhampton. So Steve, over to you. Do you, come, do you want to come up and speak from the... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, listen, it's fantastic to be here today in uh, this wonderful building, actually. I'm just saying it, it's retained its character, but mixing the old and the new, and it's fantastic to be here 
at the University of Wolverhampton uh, School Building of Architecture and Building Environment. But what's really interesting about being here in Wolverhampton, and it, it is a pleasure, you know, I know this is called a symposium, but I guess more down to earth, we just say it's a get together in Wolvo. But this is a really important event as far as I'm concerned, because we have got a really strong and growing proposition in terms of place where we believe we are going to lead on the climate agenda for a greener and more sustainable future. We're certainly leading in the region and if not in the country. And the reason I say that is some of the examples I'd wish to share with you because backed by our council commitment to be carbon neutral by 2028, we're already the first city in England to sign the European Circular Cities Declaration. You may have heard, we are, and I'm really proud of this, we are going to be the first place that will have a solar farm that will supply clean green energy to an accident and emergency hospital at New Cross Hospital, which should be up and running as early as next spring. And of course, we are going to be the home of the government's MMC. You know, we, we've got some £10 million worth of investment that will mean that will be rolled out across MMC homes across the country. We've already planted thousands of trees. We got the first tiny forest in the black country and working with Earthwatch and lots of community organisations, as well as the private sector. And we have some 2,000 small and medium enterprises within our city. They are leading on the green agenda. They are working on retrofit and green and sustainable construction. And of course, soon to be announced, if it hasn't been already, I think I saw Andy Street on the screen earlier, whether I beat him to the announcement, maybe it shouldn't matter because what really does matter is that Wolverhampton, again, will be the pilot for a net zero neighbourhood. And we are the home to our 17 and a half million pound National Brownfield Institute. So we believe we've got a strong and growing reputation in terms of the climate agenda and of course, sustainable construction within place. I'm really pleased to be here. And I know there are a number of speakers. They will share their own individual expertise. And of course, there will be questions at the end, but thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Evans. Uh, next up is Dr. Paul Hampton, Professor Dr. Paul Hampton, who is the um, Head of Built Environment within this Faculty of Science and Engineering here at the University of Wolverhampton and indeed a Chartered Surveyor as well. So over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Ed, and thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining us at what is a magnificent campus. Um, We've heard a lot today, um, not only in Glasgow, but also here in this West Midlands COP, around challenges and how we're going to face them. I'll talk about the Brownfield Challenge in a moment, but I'm sure you'll join me in recognising this is what success looks like. This is evidence of what can be achieved. And going forward, it's vital that we do prove concept we do provide evidence from the region of what this success means. And I know we've heard lots of people talk about the blah, blah, blah. Well, here's the reality. This is actual living proof of what can be achieved. And if you look at the blend of the heritage and the new, this is what can be very much an exemplar for the future. So let me talk a little bit about not just this fantastic building, but the other one we've got, which is the Brownfield National Brownfield Institute. I think you'll join me in recognising that this is one of the worst housing crises 
in recent times. And if you're looking at the numbers around that three, four, five thousand new homes in England, those just can't come from Greenland. They need to come from industrial legacy. This is exactly proof again, because this was brownfield land. This 12 acre site was brownfield. But of course, there is 25,000 hectares of brownfield sites around um, sort of the, uh, the, the country. Importantly, though, it's recognising, and it was recognised today on Radio 4, that as we move land and we disturb land, it creates carbon. And we've got to repurpose that and we've got to change that position. So how do we tackle brownfield? Well, for sure, it's around that transformation of place. And to start a transformation, to start a renaissance, you need a center of excellence. And what we've got with the Brownfield Institute is that vision crystallized. It's just almost complete. It will be open at the close of January, and it will provide that opportunity for various stakeholders to come together to bring in world-class research and to deliver on the expectations that we've been faced with as a nation. But of course, Brownfield isn't just about a building. It requires people and it requires investment. And the government's funding has helped towards that, but it's made the University of Wolverhampton become a center of this and of course, it needs that circular economy growth and that brownfield development. We know from regenerating this piece of land here and these 12 acres, there's been massive challenges in that. But of course, the solution will lie across there. So this is one of the visions and uh, some images that will tell you what it looks like. And you'll see the impact as you walk outside. It's having a massive influence on what we can do and how digital technology can be built in to drive innovation. So on the screen there, you will see we've got a planetarium and that planetarium can link to anywhere in the world to showcase where pieces of land are located and how they might be regenerated and repurposed. But it's not just that, it's got incubation space, meeting space, and of course, research labs. Importantly though, within the building, we haven't forgot the energy and the carbon challenge. So again, you'll see from the slide at the moment, we've used air source heat pumps, which we know have been talked about a lot. We've got the photo, uh, the photo uh, PV panels and the efficient services not only to drive repurposing, but also re heat recovery. And in this building, what we're doing is duplicating some of the successes across in the Brownfield lab. And of course, from this challenge becomes the realization of deliverables. So what we've moved towards is matching those deliverables to real tangible outcomes again. And I know what everyone wants to see is this slide, which demonstrates what that building and what my colleagues with their expertise will provide. And that is new jobs, new homes, business assist and learner assist as a national Brownfield Institute. Of course, we need more of those national institutes, but this is a crystallization of a vision. And I thank everyone who's contributed to that. At this point, I would traditionally show you a video, but you're actually here, you can see it, and I really do hope, take the time, not just to be on the ground floor, to look around and see what a magnificent vision uh, that is being crystallized in Wolverhampton. Be questions later, but thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you, Charminder, as well, for being here, um, ready to answer questions as well um, later on. I think we'll all agree this is the most fantastic place uh, to hold uh, today's, today's event. Um, so next, I'm going to invite Hannah Smith up. Hannah is the Climate Services and Sustainable Development Delivery Leader for Arab 
in the Midlands. I think my job title might be longer than yours, but um, be great to have to hear what you've got to say. Thanks, Hannah. Hello, everybody. Um, it is a really long title and it's not quite as fancy as it sounds. It basically means that I go around and annoy all of our teams within Arab to make sure they're doing more sustainable development in their business as usual. So really exciting job. Um, so I've been asked today, I don't work for EY, I actually work for Arup. Um, <laughs> no, you said that, the slides are the EY. <laughs> I've been asked to talk today uh, about place and using place as a driver to uh, meet the needs of the UN SDGs um, and ways to implement change. But I thought I'd just start a little bit about digging into what we mean by place and the place-based agenda. Uh, Let's go to the next slide. Not in there. Okay, brilliant. So this picture is a picture of a place and I don't know if uh, many of you would think that it's a good place or not. We can maybe have a talk about that later. Um, but the place-based agenda is really about understanding and locally grounding any development based on local need. It needs to be kind of locally owned, delivered locally, um, having locally beneficial impact, reflecting the local wants and aspirations, and really based on the assets that are available in a place. So each place is kind of built up of an ecosystem of assets. Um, and that's kind of the model we used to think about place. And, and some of them are physical in terms of our homes, business premises, uh, transport infrastructure, nature and green space. But that also needs to be backed up by economic assets in terms of kind of high value businesses, uh, innovators, SMEs, startups, education and training facilities like this brilliant one here, um, and the, the finance that can help you bring all that together. But then that also needs to be underpinned by social and networking assets in terms of relationships that we hold between each other and um, ties to a community institutions that actually help support create those relationships and community ties and only with a good balance of all of those assets can you have a good place um, and when we're thinking about development and what we need to build and, and planning we really need to understand what those assets are and build on them but also and probably more importantly what is the need and what is the gap that isn't currently met so each place is different development solutions need to be different and reflect those different places and really understand what that need is. Um, and, we, and we've seen that understanding of needing to think about place in a growing narrative coming out of government. And it started with localism and the LEPs and it's kind of built into the combined authorities. Um, more recently, we've been talking about leveling up and looking at the inequalities in between places. And, and government funding has really been turning to, to think about those and the funding pots we've seen recently in terms of kind of the stronger towns fund the leveling up fund the uk shared prosperity fund are all trying to think about how can we invest in a place and creating a, a place that meets the specific needs of that place and and when it's done well it really focuses that development in creating locally needed outcomes and justice um, and we really do need to think about these things locally, but we also need a shared language to talk to these things between different places. And that's really where the UN SDGs come in. So they're a global language that have been so highly consulted. I think thousands and thousands of people are engaged. They were talked about across over 190 countries and, and they define what we expect good will be in 2030. So there can be this kind of common language that we can use across places, but they also challenge us to look kind of more broadly and holistically. So when we work in the built environment and in places, we're often looking at those kind of ones in the middle that we see as the safe, inclusive, sustainable, resilient infrastructure in cities. But in looking at a place as a whole, you then also need to bring in those kind of outcomes for society and understanding what you're creating for people um, and improving their lives and, and fairness and justice, but also the natural environment and the outcomes for the planet that kind of create that uh, support system that we all rely on. So at all points, creating good places is about this balance and using these UN SDGs gives us a language that goes across all of this balance and um, that can really help us look at what we're trying to get. 
Um, so this is a diagram that I use with my teams within our quite a lot. Uh, whenever we're doing something and whenever we're developing something, there are always inputs. We do things with those inputs and we create outputs. So sometimes they're drawings, it might be planning application. Um, it might be building a building like this. That's currently where we stop thinking a lot of the time, but actually what we need to be thinking about and, and moving that conversation forward is, well, why are we doing this? What are we creating out of this? What are the outcomes that can come out of doing these activities? And then what is the impact? What does that mean for society? What does it mean for the planet? And really being intentional about that, thinking about that from the outset, picking the things that you want to do and doing it on purpose. So one of the ways we've been thinking about this, and we've particularly used this with the Environment Agency for their um, funding of new flood infrastructure, is to look at benefit portfolios and trying to work out when we are making an investment, and development is always an investment, trying to work out what it is, what's the problem that we're trying to, to solve, when and who are those outcomes for, so are we looking to solve problems that we have now, or are we looking for problems that we're gonna have in the future? Are we looking at meeting the needs that we already know and those gaps in those assets that we've already talked about? Or are we looking at unlocking the potential and understanding what assets we already have and how can we push them even further? And, and you can kind of you know, pick your point and say, well, actually, I, for, right for now, I just wanna look at meeting need for now. And that's all I can think about right now. And that's important and, and knowing what you're going to do at that point is important, but actually we want to be making these investments to last and we want to be making good investments that have a long term impact. So if we can stack these questions and have solutions that can answer two or three of these questions at the same time, so they can solve the problems that we have now and in the future while we're making that change and while we're making that investment, make the most of that money while we can. And why can't we? solve the needs but also look to the future and what we're going to want later and create that kind of transformation piece so that it's really a kind of change is happening and it needs to happen so rapidly because of the way that the world is changing that we need to be really intentional um, and having this language of outcomes and talking to people about why we're doing things and how it's going to impact them it can help stakeholders feel like the change is with and for them so that they're not as likely to, to kind of say, no, actually, I don't want this to happen. Um, and it can help them to really understand how it's going to change their lives, take it to heart and really embed it in their lives. So outcomes are the way to think, please. And that's it from me. Thank you. So from Hannah to Becky Lane, Becky Lane's uh, Net Zero Demonstrator, Net Zero Neighbourhood Demonstrator um, Delivery Manager at the West Midlands Combined Authority. So Becky, come and tell us about Net Zero Neighbourhoods. I am really excited to talk about this initiative today and I've been discussing it with quite a few people in the room and it's really energised me to really understand how people are backed behind it as well. So I'm hoping that um, introducing it today and it reflects a lot of the principles that Hannah was talking about as well and what we're trying to embed in the West Midlands. Um, obviously, we heard from Andy earlier about the goals for the West Midlands. We want to get to net zero by 2041. And part of that in our five year plan is um, to try and retrofit up to 300,000 homes by 2026. And you can imagine that is quite some challenge. So what we're doing in the West Midlands um, with energy capital as well is we're trying to take a different approach to traditional retrofit approaches, which is taking this net zero neighborhood approach. I'll just talk to you a little bit about what that is. So at the heart of um, the net zero neighborhood of our understanding um, is, is retrofitting houses, um, but across housing tenures. So a lot of people in the room will be familiar with how retrofit funding is working at the moment, it tends to be very specific in terms of the types of properties and the housing tenure, which it's eligible for. And what we're trying to understand is by taking a street by street approach, and we're looking at the scale of about 200 to 300 homes, how we can engage all of those people, regardless of housing tenure, regarding, regardless of housing type, in opting into, into retrofit to provide them with warm homes um, for the future, 
that have enabled the low carbon heating systems. So that could be heat pumps through electrification or in the future, which we're uncertain about at the moment, whether that could be hydrogen potentially too. Um, but it's not just about um, the houses. And as Hannah was talking about, we're thinking about place among all the other assets that are in that location. Um, and while we're taking this street by street approach, we should be looking at other opportunities to help people in that area, those communities to transition to a more sustainable lifestyle. So just the pictures up on the screen, obviously we heard a lot about transport this morning, but that's a huge part of it. What can we do in that area to not only support maybe electrification of transport, bringing in investment into public transport in that area, but also bringing in initiatives around active mobility to support people to make those choices that are on their doorstep in that community. Um, other areas as well that we're looking to explore while we're designing these net zero neighborhoods is how we can improve the wider neighborhood. So neighborhood regeneration, improving green spaces as well. I think there's a lot of work that we're doing in the combined authority about promoting investment into green spaces, which was so vital during the pandemic as well, um, and how we can bring that into the neighborhood. Um, but also, and underpinning all of this is how we can get the communities engaged in this initiative and co-designing it with us to make sure the, the neighbourhood is not only fit for the infrastructure that's available and the data we have so we can design that, but it's fit for their needs in the future as well, which I think um, pulls on a lot of what Hannah was talking about and the initiatives of thinking about the impact and the outcome of how we're divine, um, designing these initiatives. Um, I've missed off a little bit, but just to say, I've spoken a lot about the domestic sphere, but we are looking to include opportunities for inclusive growth and potentially social enterprise in these regions, bringing in the businesses in those areas to um, support the development of that neighbourhood. Basically, what we're trying to do is look at what that region has, that area, what the assets are and how we can build a sustainable neighbourhood, bringing in different funding sources to achieve that. Um, and there are a lot of things that we're trying to learn from this approach. Um, so firstly, I've mentioned a lot about community engagement. Um, we want to know how we can encourage all people to opt into this um, to retrofit. It's an incredibly difficult decision to make. It's very disruptive um, to your lives. It's disruptive to your house. Um, whether you own that property or you're renting that property, it's a big decision to make to opt in. So we need to learn through this process how we can effectively engage people in that process so they're feeling empowered and involved in it. Um, and I said, again, across all housing tenures, and there's a lot of activity at the moment in the social housing space, but we're really looking to branch out into private housing and potentially the private rental sector too, which are two areas which are very difficult at the moment to engage in retrofit particularly. On the second one, um, and this is more trying to understand what the combined authorities role and potentially the local authorities be working with in this role is in coordinating the supply chain to deliver this. Traditionally, retrofit funding has been quite boom and bust which has meant the supply chain has responded and then hasn't really had the opportunity to invest in things like external wall insulation. And now obviously we've got some signals around heat pumps, but those kind of technologies that we need in our homes to allow us to transition to net zero. So we're trying to understand by providing this place-based approach, here is a place of 200, 300 homes, a pipeline of 10, 15 projects in the future as well, how we can provide some certainty for demand in the region to drive that supply chain. I'm trying to understand what our role is in that through this program. And also by taking this place-based approach, um, by having um, contractors on site at one time, we, we need to demonstrate what those cost efficiencies are by taking a more place-based approach to delivering um, these programs. So giving some of the context for making sure that we're driving the demand, but also bringing the supply chain to help manage the cost for delivering that. Um, and then finally, the money. Um, at the moment, there is a lot of grant funding available for this, but we can't rely on grant funding for the future to allow this to be a sustainable um, programme for us or across the nation. So what we're trying to understand through this is how we can use the grant funding we currently have available through various funds, a lot of you will be aware of those, to bring in private capital or other capital funds to blend together to deliver these neighbourhoods in a place-based approach. On top of that um, is the complicated part of governance, and there were some conversations about that earlier in other energy capital um, conversations, is how you structure that, who's responsible for delivering that, and, who, um, and how those different funding sources get brought together. So there's a lot of things that we're trying to learn from these demonstrators, but what I will say is ultimately, we're trying to understand how we can deliver the best impact to those people in the area and understand what our role is in coordinating and delivering that as a sustainable pipeline into the future. 
So what are we doing next? Um, we're at the start of our programme. Um, you can see a lot of faces in the room that I've been talking to already um, about the neighbourhoods to identify the locations um, in the seven constituent authorities, which are up on the map there. Um, I'm hoping before um, the end of the year, we'll be able to identify at least two of those neighbourhoods that we have to go ahead with. And it's good to hear Councillor Evans said that Wolverhampton is looking to be one of those pilot regions um, and hopefully being able to announce what that location is soon. Um, and then it's planning, um, hopefully in the new year, developing regeneration partnerships around some of those points throughout funding, um, supply chain and community engagement to deliver those net zero neighbourhoods, and then starting the engagement with community buy-in. That's what we're hoping to get in the early new year. But ultimately, getting to that point of delivery, um, there's a lot of preparation stages that need to come first. Um, what I will say is, um, I appreciate my email address isn't involved, but if you're a company in this room that's involved in community engagement, finance, technical delivery, this is interesting, please get in touch because we need to bring together people um, across different sectors to deliver these, particularly when we want to take a place-based approach um, to bring in different perspectives. So that's me. Fantastic. And then last but by no means least, uh, Christian Slayer is Senior Policy Officer for Place at Grace Birmingham and Solihull Local Enterprise Partnership, otherwise known as GBS LEP. Thank you very much. It's a bit of a competition of who's got the longest job title on this panel. So um, uh, apologies for that, everyone. Um, good afternoon, all. Um, this afternoon, I'm just going to take you through a whistle stop tour around nature in place, discussing how expanding green and blue infrastructure will play an important role in tackling climate breakdown, current state of affairs in the region, as well as briefly introducing a number of emerging projects, which will hopefully um, inspire people listening. First off, definitions. Green infrastructure is the phrase we use to describe the network of multifunctional green spaces and other green features, both urban and rural, which can deliver quality of life and environmental benefits for communities. It is important to stress that green infrastructure is not simply a description for conventional urban spaces such as parks, woodlands um, and other green spaces, but covers a wider variety of features, including street trees, allotments, private gardens, green roofs and walls, soils, and sustainable drainage systems. It also includes rivers, streams, canals, and other water bodies, which unsurprisingly, we refer to as blue infrastructure. Green and blue infrastructure plays an important role in both helping to reduce climate breakdown as well as mitigating the impact, impacts from climate change, especially in our urban areas. Obviously, green and blue infrastructure act, acts as an important carbon sink, helping to reduce carbon, damaging carbon levels in the atmosphere. And I'm sure everyone in the room here today is well aware of the important role tree planting has in tackling climate change. However, it also plays as an important role in mitigating the impacts of climate breakdown. Green and blue infrastructure helps to counter urban heat island effects, reducing temperatures, especially during hot summers. And related to this, well-planned green infrastructure can also reduce air pollution levels in our towns and cities. As our towns and cities face increasing rainfall, especially heavy thunderstorms and the associated risk of flash flooding and the connected damage it causes, Green and blue infrastructure can both reduce surface water runoff as well as providing sustainable drainage solutions. In addition, the positive impacts of um, green infrastructure on both mental and physical health, as well as the role it plays in attracting private sector investment are well evidenced. Across the greater Birmingham and Solihull region, as well as the wider West Midlands, we have a good track record of green infrastructure projects. Substantial tree planting programs are live across the region, including, as has already been mentioned, a number of Miyawaki forest initiatives. So these are fast growing tiny forests, which are often around the size of a tennis court and come to maturity, reach maturity after around three years. We have the Commonwealth Games and the Seven, Trest, uh, Seven Trent Legacy Forest, 
which will um, uh, hopefully leave a legacy of uh, 2022 acres of new wooded area, as well as recent launches of tree strategies by local authorities across the region, such as the Birmingham Urban Forest Master Plan and Solihull's Planting Our Future. The WMCA have recently published their very strong natural capital and circular economy strategies, as well as the virtual forest project to encourage planting across the region. Substantial work has been put into blue infrastructure, especially around our canal networks, with deculverting of waterways and improvement of water quality access and the surrounding environment. Obviously, as I'm standing here representing GBS Le, it would be remiss of me if I didn't draw brief attention to increased private sector engagement with green and blue infrastructure. Increasingly, developers across the region, both domiciled here and from elsewhere, are situating green infrastructure at the heart of planned developments. The Colmore and retail business improvement districts with funding from GBS LEP are in conjunction with their business members, producing a green infrastructure master plan for their geography. To support increased private sector engagement with issues of green infrastructure and wider transition to clean growth, we're launching a clean growth program with a package of business support measures at our conference later this month. However, as consistent with the theme of COP26, and as has been um, emphasized by speakers throughout the day, we recognize the need to accelerate and increase the implementation of green infrastructure interventions across the region. As just one example, the Combined Authorities National Environment Plan highlights that to achieve decarbonization targets, we will need to plant 5.7 million trees by 2026 and 19 million by 2041. I know many in the room agree, and this is reflected in the increased ambitions present in many of the master plans being produced by local authorities in the region, such as the Kidderminster 2040 plan, Birmingham City Council's Our Future City Plan, and the new Birmingham Enterprise Zone Investment Plan, which place green and blue infrastructure at the heart of urban renewal plants. However, it's also important we don't just view green and blue infrastructure as a mere technical fix, but also actively engage with the challenging conversations that increase in quality and quantity of green and blue infrastructure raise. We need to expand efforts to bring private sector, public sector and citizens together to discuss issues around land ownership, behavioural change and democratic participation, which will be vital to develop workable solutions around the challenges faced. Projects such as the um, Environment Agency's led River Seven and River Trent partnerships are trialling new approaches to green and new uh, to green and blue infrastructure delivery and funding models. While the emerging West Midlands National Park project, which I believe um, uh, Catherine Moore will be talking more about later, is developing new policy approaches. Organisations such as Civic Square and Breathe are delivering innovative, innovative approaches to civic engagement with green infrastructure and climate change issues. The West Midlands is also a leading research centre into biochar, a sustainable form of charcoal made from heating organic materials at very high temperatures without oxygen. Added to soil, it acts as an effective form of carbon sequestration, retains water efficiently, reducing surface water runoff, and increases nutrients in the soil, leading to improved plant growth. Pilots are running in the region with a focus on expanding the base materials used, as well as mobile production units to make biochar even more attractive to developers, as well as reducing road miles. A joint project by Slow Food Birmingham, Birmingham City Council and GBS LEP, aims to convert an underutilized multi-story car park in Birmingham's Jewelry Quarter into a multi-story urban farm and garden set to be one of the largest in the country. With energy from entirely sustainable sources, the project will repurpose instead of demolishing a former site of carbon infrastructure, producing high quality produce for local businesses, as well as acting as a hub for other food, uh, urban food producers, reducing food mileage, and providing a strong example of repurposing obsolete buildings for green infrastructure. Thank you kindly.
Fantastic. So we've heard about um, brownfield, we've heard about retrofit, we've heard about um, natural capital, we've heard about the big picture from Arab, we've heard about um, Wolverhampton as a place uh, where all of these issues can come together. Um, I want to know if you've got, anybody's got any questions they'd like to ask the panel now. We've got a few minutes for questions. Yeah, can we get a microphone to Grace, please, in the middle? Thank you. Hi, so I had a quick question specifically about brownfield sites. Um, it was sort of alluded to earlier that they can be quite complex, challenging, and in some cases more expensive to develop when the current kind of gold standard for new office and increasingly industrial buildings is zero carbon. Um, and in some cases, you know, we see people prefer to knock down a relatively young building and rebuild one rather than regenerate a brownfield site. Um, so I was just wondering, what people think we could do to challenge that narrative or how you can make brownfield sites more commercially viable. Sure. Paul or Charmender, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, um, I think it's, it's always been a, a challenge uh, how we can actually uh, kind of encourage those developers to, um, uh, you know, develop these uh, brownfield sites when compared with, you know, the greenfield sites and all that. But uh, one of the things is we can, there are certain incentives that we can actually, we can encourage those uh, developers who can claim and, and get, you know, certain, uh, you know, cl claims and get some money, you know, the expenses back. And what, that's one of the kind of areas that we try to make these developers knowledgeable and understand that they know about those opportunities and things. Um, that's always been, been, a, been a challenge, I would think. Um, but I know also um, there's a kind of bit of uh, perception that uh, the about the risk involved with these uh, brownfield site, you know, the development. Uh, but there are a lot of, uh, for example, the NBI and also uh, we also have the brownfield research and innovation center as well. Uh, what we try to do is we, we try to kind of, you know, provide necessary information and all the details uh, be, uh, to try and you know, make an informed decision about those uh, developing brownfield sites. Uh, <clears throat> so those sort of, you know, the information, because that's a kind of a perception uh, uh, idea that they have that, you know, these brownfield, this very risky and then, you know, sometimes more cost if, you know, costly uh, developing these things, but not in, that, in actual case, sometimes knowing those information and taking an informed decision would certainly uh, will be, you know, will, can be more cost effective and for them and also having those kind of uh, incentives uh, available for them uh, you know, for those, you know, uh, encouraging them to, for brownfield development would certainly help us to bring unlock these brownfield brownfield sites. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think there was a question guy at the back there. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Okay, this will be longer. Um, I'm, I'm encouraged about the brownfield development. I think it's excellent news, and you're right about this particular site. It's a fantastic development, and uh, congratulations to all those involved. But I see that the uh, Black Country Plan envisages development of housing on the Greenbelt uh, at uh, North Coast, uh, Bushby North. I think uh, Councillor Anderson was all about that because he did this constituency in his ward. Uh, you know, and what about the council going to put the campaign against development on the Greenbelt at the north of Wolverhampton then? Hans Evans, you want to reply to that? And was the guy further at the back, Eleanor, please? Yeah, uh, it's not in my constituency or ward, but that's irrelevant. <coughs> you know, we, we've been really clear as the controlling group on the council that Brownfield only. I think the difficulty is, is the capping numbers that the government have put on all the councils, in particular in metropolitan boroughs, and it looks as though Maybe I'm being a little bit cynical. It looks as though they've backed off a little bit more of the rural shires and put a lot more pressure on the metropolitan areas of the country. I think the reality is, is look, you know, we've got to look at brownfield sites and one example would be Caldwell Street, which is our fleet depot. You know, we've been really clear, you know, let's give that site up, move to Ickman Avenue, where we can have three or four different services on one site. So using one lot of electricity and energy, but using solar. So a new development at the wholesale market, as well as the school buses and 
Meals on Wheels services, and then we can free up that up for the canal side and the brewer's yard development. Brilliant. So we're really clear what we need to do and the right way to do it. What isn't helpful is when somebody in government says, you need to have this many houses by this date, you end up sadly having to look at and put in a consultation plan every bit of area you got, whether that's brownfield or, or green space. And we've got very little green space in Wolverhampton. Geographically, you'll know it's not huge. And we probably only got about 10%, and in particular in the northeast of the city that you're referring to, we have a lot less green space than other areas. So we're clear. Brownfield, not first, Brownfield only. Thank you. Question at the back. Hi, uh, I'm Aaron. I'm a student here at the University of Wolverhampton, and I kind of have two questions. Uh, about, about Keep them short, sure and then they'll be fine. <laughs> um, so the first one was in regards to the uh, next neighbourhood scheme. Uh, I was just wondering how do you actually target uh, which neighbourhood you were after, and if it would be worth uh, using data seen in that case study we saw earlier in Coventry and applying that uh, to define critical areas to actually select by a spatial analysis on them. Well, brilliant that you've picked that up because um, in the Coventry one, they are actually using that data from that project to identify the neighbourhood, so definitely on the same page for that approach. Um, in some of the other areas, it's a combination of data, but in some cases, there hasn't been that um, that funded project to bring all those data sets together, but it's definitely what we would like to do in the future. Um, but currently trying to look at what the opportunities are already in the area, where there are some existing community and relationships and where maybe the biggest impact could be for that neighbourhood. And that could be the approach that's taken by some of the ones. But definitely on that Coventry one, using the data that has been used for that research project. Fantastic. And you had your second question. Uh, yeah, the second one was in regards to the new structure uh, built by Christian. Um, just in regards to the whole uh, COP26 mindset, it seems to be mainly based on energy consumption and how we can lower uh, emissions. Uh, do you feel that investment into systems such as SUDS uh, within the local areas will kind of be brought onto a back foot? Uh, just with people focusing more on the energy sort of things instead? Christian. No, um, no uh, I don't think it will, especially on the regional scale. Um, uh, you look at the number of plans which are which either have just been released or just about to really be released um, for the urban regeneration. Um, and it is there is a very, very strong emphasis on green and blue infrastructure is very much the recognition, the role that not only does um, uh, an in, in increase in both the quantity and quality of green and blue infrastructure make places a nicer and better place to live, but it also acts as one of our real key mitigating factors um, in reducing any of the negative impacts on, uh, of climate breakdown on our urban areas. Great, and then I think we had the last question just over here, please. <laughs> um, Chris from Friends of the Earth West Midlands. Um, one of the things I think that we really need to get to grips with is that clearing up brownfield sites is expensive, and yet greenfield sites do not attract VAT on house building developments. Also, when we look at retrofitting, retrofitting of the property attracts VAT, and yet a new house on a greenfield site does not. Do you think that we need to actually work with Treasury so as we can actually change the way in which developers are actually looking towards the sites that they take forward to get them away from developing sprawl, which is car dependent housing in the countryside, which will become unsustainable in a in in very short amount of time, and start to really get to grips with intensifying the amount of development that we have in our urban areas so that we can have economies of scale to invest in the uh, social and physical infrastructure to make places livable for people. Great. Hannah, do you want to come in on that one? I think that's the last point you said is the really important one about, you know, we need to make places that people want to be. So as much as I can, I, I completely see the viability is a really important part of any development and, and anything we can do to help 
encourage more sustainable forms of development. I absolutely think we should be. I'm a, a serial petition signer and uh, MP letter writer, so encourage everyone to do the same. But um, yeah, that that having creating places where people want to be, and a lot of the time, the things that people want are in urban areas. You know, they have the schools, they have the hospitals, they have the healthcare, they have the parks already. It's about making sure that they're accessible and that people can get around to them um, and, and making sure that those places are where people want to be and explaining. Sometimes I think people perceive city centres or town centres as a dirty and crime ridden place and actually they're not. And, and if we have that focus on outcomes and, and explaining the good things that we're trying to create with things, I think it will help people take, take in what the good things are out of being in different places that may not be their traditional experience or expectation of life. Great. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time uh, for this panel session, but can you join me in giving um, all the panelists a round of applause? Thank you very much. Stay there for one moment. So we are now um, moving into a very short comfort break. If you want to grab a cup of tea or coffee, that's absolutely great. But um, we have two rounds of workshops now. Um, all the workshops are in rooms upstairs. Uh, I say all the, all, there's, there's two rooms upstairs and they will have uh, two workshops in. Uh, for, at 3.15, there's a workshop on constructing net zero and a workshop on the natural environment. Those will be in the two rooms up there. Um, they're starting as soon as you've grabbed your tea or coffee and moved upstairs, that's when they'll start. Um, and then at 3.45, um, there will be two more workshops in those same two rooms, one on decarbonising heat and another on resources and materials. So you have time now, as I say, to grab a drink, move upstairs, choose which workshop you'd like to go to. You'll get to swap at 3.45 and then back down here again for our final session at 4.15. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you so much. Man. Can I encourage people to come and take a seat for our final session, please? I know some people are kind of still filtering their way down from the workshops upstairs. But if you could take seats, that would be absolutely fantastic. Are there still more people coming from upstairs? Yeah, okay. Just give it two more minutes and then um, we'll kick off, but thank you for your patience. That's the way it was Happened so naturally I did not know it was love The next thing I felt was you Holding me close What was I gonna do? I let myself go And now we're flying through the stars I hope this night will last forever Oh, oh so long I knew just what I would do when I heard your song you filled my heart with a kiss you gave me freedom you knew I could not resist I needed great welcome back for this last session um, we are 
focusing now on skills and green skills and the huge opportunities. I think in our West Midlands 2041 five-year plan, we said the scope for at least 21,000 jobs between now and 2026 um, in the West Midlands. And who better to um, talk to us about some of these things than um, young people uh, themselves. So Barry um, is going to introduce the young people, but I need to introduce Barry first. So Barry Duffin, uh, next to me here, uh, is going to chair our session. He's Director of Operations at Acceleron. Um, Acceleron, if you haven't come across them, are another of these really funky, innovative, net zero companies that we have in the West Midlands. Um, I would particularly encourage you to have a look at their little video um, about how we can recycle batteries and the importance of recycling uh, battery uh, technology. So Barry, I'm going to hand over to you uh, for this session. Thank you. Uh, so very brief introduction for myself. Uh, so what's I am Operations Director for Acceleron. I have a background in civil engineering. Uh, I spent 15 years designing infrastructure, geotechnical engineering, uh, flood defence, uh, all those sorts of projects. I've developed a bit of software, uh, but also now sort of running the, the Acceleron's programs and projects to make sure that we really do walk the walk of recycling batteries and, and delivering great products, not just for the first life, but the second life and thereafter. So off to my left here are a range of individuals, young professionals from the industry. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves briefly, uh, and then we'll just jump straight into some of the questions. Come on, Jack. Uh, so yeah, I'm Jack Johnson. Um, I'm from University of Birmingham, and in my second year studying physics. Um, and I wrote an article about the impact of militaries on climate change, and it was published by the university. Um, so give it a read. <laughs> Hi everyone. My name is Obinar Karika. I'm VP of Education at Coventry University Students Union. And before I came for my masters last year in international relations, I did some work in marketing for three years in Nigeria after my first degree. And yeah, that's a bit about me. And this is my second year as an officer. I'm Shaw McAdam. I'm a graduate civil engineer at Mark McDonald. And I'm also um, sustainability lead for the early careers professionals in the office. Hi, everyone. I'm Callum John. I'm a final year international business and economics student at Aston University. I'm also the sustainability officer in the Students' Union and a junior sustainability consultancy at Wild Connections. I am Corey Bridgen. I am an undergrad student at Wolverhampton University studying architecture. Hi, I'm Naveen Hare. I'm currently in college um, and I'm representing the Young Combined Authority today. Wonderful. Thank you very much for everybody for your intro. Now, we're obviously up here talking about education skills. I mean, as young professionals recently coming through or maybe even still in education, there's a, there's a great opportunity for us to start to explore how well and prepared you feel to come and start tackling some of the challenges of, of climate change and the journey towards net zero by 2041. So I wondered if um, anybody would like to go ahead and perhaps Jack, as, as a physicist, I think it's quite interesting that you're up here talking about sustainability and, and winning papers, but coming back from a physics background. Do you want to, how does that, how did that happen? Um, yeah, so I got into climate change, uh, like the impacts of it, just as I got into uh, the first kind of year of my degree. But I felt like a lot of the um, lower level secondary, secondary school physics education doesn't really give you much of an actual uh, background into the new technologies coming around, uh, revolving around climate change. Um, so the, I think it was the GCSE specification for physics that is 80 pages long um, and there's only 100 words in reference to climate change in the wow. entire document. Um, and you would have thought physics, you know, you're, you're helping develop these new technologies. Um, and there are only a few fleeting references. The A-level syllabus um, for physics only references climate change twice. Um, and as a visual aid, <laughs> this is my university textbook. It's 1,000 pages long. And there is half a page in the entire thing in any kind of reference to climate change. Um, and I feel like I understand physics isn't 100% related. Uh, there are other avenues. Mm -hmm. um, geography, for example, would do a better job at explaining climate change to young people. Um, but you would have thought, if you want to encourage people 
into um, climate, uh, into research, into climate change into, uh, technologies, you would start from a younger age mm -hmm. and get people interested and perhaps change the, uh, change the syllabus to support that. Um, Do you think there's been too much emphasis upon the traditional engineering side? And yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll come into that, some of that a bit later, but the science side, particularly from physics, do you think that's been underrepresented going forward? It's, and do you feel prepared for what challenges you're going to have to face going forward? It's been underrepresented. It's also been, I'll say, it's not been updated, really. Um, if you look at the stuff, um, I was talking about syllabuses earlier, it's stuff that you're required to teach the young children um, about climate change in physics, um, the only points made are, oh, we have solar panels and we have hydroelectric power, and these are a few different things. Um, and there's no reference to any technologies part, you know, in, in the 21st century. It, like, this stuff was being taught to my dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's no new update. And people, you know, young people my, uh, my age, and, you know, younger than me, don't get interested yeah. when they're learning about technologies from the 70s. Um, so you've got to stay updated in order to get young people into that field. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Jay. Mm -hmm. Naveen, uh, how about you? Do, how, what's your educational approach and, and do you feel prepared for, for where you're going in the future? Um, I think it's something like the statistic is that only 4% of students would feel confident actually um, answering questions about climate change or net zero, which is quite a small percentage considering how many people take geography and how many people take these optional subjects that do explore climate change on such large large scale. And um, even just doing my GCSEs, although I did do geography and it's a whole big topic, I think climate change was only a really, really small section that was discussed. And um, in A-level, my specification doesn't even cover it at all. So it really is something that's only accessible when you reach um, further education like university. And I think the main thing that needs to be implemented is really kind of combining the climate change with subjects that everyone is doing, not just mm. the optional subjects like environment, science and geography, because the impacts of climate change is something that's going to affect um, everyone and it's kind of something that everyone needs to respond to. Excellent. Thank you. So. That, I mean, opens up whole sorts of different questions around what sorts of skills are required to move forward. I mean, we've talked about the educational process and it may not cover, particularly from an early enough age, the impacts of climate change. But it'd be interesting to go through and say, what skills and knowledge is required and how can we adapt? Sean, do you want to give us some thoughts on that? I think, um, well, knowledge, everyone kind of needs to know the key climate change terms, like the basic, um, as in everyone needs to know a bit about recycling, what carbon's it, what, uh, carbon neutral is and net zero, kind of different food choices and that kind of thing, because otherwise it can get really confusing as an adult going into that, um, figuring out the way to be the most sustainable. But also, um, and there's been a lot of talk today about uh, using data and uh, digital twins and stuff, and I think it shows that technology and learning about coding and that kind of thing is really interesting because we do have a lot of data and we need people to analyze it and to manipulate it. Uh, so yeah, I'd say that's quite important. Okay, excellent. Uh, Callum, did you have any thoughts on how, I know you've gone into the world of consultancy and, yeah. and being a sustainability officer. That seems very different in that you're coming in from a very specialist point, point of view. What sort of skills and knowledge do you think you're going to need now moving forward to try and tackle this beyond the sort of the conventional, uh, what you may have expected you were coming to, to, to learn? Yeah, um, well, last year I was on placement at um, my company, uh, Wild Connections, as a sustainability consultant. Um, one of the things that we really try and push, which I was never made aware of coming from an educational background like in university or in high school or college. Um, the things such as we need to start pushing towards a more circular economy, like, so looking at all like, from start to end of life 
with um, companies' products and stuff. And we need to move towards, like, I, I study international business and economics. And in my opinion, like capitalist economics is quite flawed, broken down. And as, as from the sustainability side, we need to start moving towards a, a, the, something called the donut economics, which is living in a just and social world, but within there are the nine planetary boundaries that we need to make sure that we don't go past that limit, but we also don't need, but we shouldn't go below the basic level of social and justice needs for everybody across the world. Okay, thank you. Now, Corey, on the end there, I know you're doing architecture and uh, you know, it's wonderful to be sitting in a space like this and, and really start to appreciate the value of the built environment as we move forward towards net uh, zero by 2041. What is it that you as a young architect are going to be doing to try and drive that agenda forward from, from a sort of a, an entry stage? Well, at university, we are pushed to achieve net zero in buildings and we're taught to focus on brainfield sites, which is like the refurbishment and the reuse of or buildings that already exist, but retrofit them with smart technologies and use passive design to insulate the buildings and ventilate them without the need for energy consumption. Mm -hmm. and the, I think the built environment contributes to 40% of the car carbon output. So in reducing that, we can reduce our usage. So, so but how, how are you going to be doing that? Is that, what sort of techniques are you going to be bringing to the table? Is that a, a design focus? Is it a change of technology? Yeah, so to start with, we're focused on passive design. So use of windows and natural light and mm -hmm. to reduce the consumption of um, um, fluorescent lighting. So during the day and um, <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Um, solar gain and the use of thermal masses. And so we're consuming all this energy from the sun and naturally we're just not using it properly. So making the most of the natural resources, using the material properties yes. To, yes. to really enhance the, the built environment, but ultimately trying to use as little energy as possible, yes. drive down that carbon footprint. Yeah. Excellent. So we're going to take a, a, a small step into to sort of more of the, what sort of, um, the region in itself has got a very young population. Uh, I think it's Birmingham itself has got 41% under 25. Now that's a, quite a hefty challenge. What would you say as young individuals looking for roles coming into industry, that what should they be doing to attract a diverse workforce? not just in terms of male and female, but race and skills and ability. Sean, do you want to yeah. give us um, your thoughts I'd there? I'd say use sustainability to your advantage. So if you're a company that has good sustainable ethics, then you really will attract the best workforce. I know most, most of the graduates at Mott's were um, encouraged, so Mott McDonald became carbon neutral in 2020, and that really made me think, oh yeah, I want to work for that company, because it's rewarding. Um, but also, I think just have role models that you can relate to. So I mean, so we've got uh, Kathy Travers is I think she's one of the regional leads. Yeah. And I see someone in that position who's like me, and I think, wow, well, yeah, I can do that as well. So yeah, I think that's really important. Okay. And Abina, uh, you know, I, I know you've got a very different background to us all. What what sort of things would you from, uh, from the Nigerian background sort of start to say, this is how to attract a, a far more diverse and, and broaden that understanding of that climate change isn't just localized, it's, it, you know, it's impacting everybody. And, and what would you do about that? I feel like when we speak about climate change, we tend to focus on STEM subjects and we forget that there's a whole range of um, disadvantaged people. So if you want to go into, let's say, developing countries to help them, and make, um, to help them with practical steps that they can take to actually um, meet net zero. You need project managers, you need people that are going to those communities to actually communicate these um, resolutions at COP26 because it doesn't make sense to an average, 
person in Africa, for example, the average farmer that is just trying to grow his plants and you know, sell some things to make some money or feed the community, this, um, these big goals and uh, you know the Paris climate change, or Paris Accords, and all that, these things don't make sense to them. So you need people. You need a diverse range of um, students, graduates, workforce, um, and people from that region. Um, because I know that we have like lots of international students in the West Midlands. So how do we equip them to have sustainable mindsets? And how do we also work with leaders in you know developing countries, African countries? to have sustainable mindsets and not just you know, use the money that whenever, there's, let's say, there's a pledge of 100 billion, to use that for other things other than climate change. So these are the conversations that we need to be having. OK. Anybody else want to chip in on that one? Um, Go on again, Sean. <laughs> I think that it's important for businesses to invest in uh, developing countries and invest in you know, sustainable businesses in those developing countries, especially in universities or research projects there, because then you can reap the benefits when they come up with a great idea. But it's also helping to create a green economy in that country and making them not rely on the stuff that we've kind of forced them to rely on in the past. Uh, so I think that's... Yeah, and also I know that these days, whenever you turn this, it does something about blockchain or Bitcoin. And we have venture capitalists that give seed money to people that, that are into, let's say, tech. I'd like to see that same sense of urgency for climate change. So we need people that are going to invest money into young people that are interested in climate change from developing countries and not just STEM, not just tech, not just artificial intelligence, not just Bitcoin, blockchain, and all that. So, okay. yeah. Let's just say, in terms of attracting um, young people, especially at university, towards climate careers, um, making sure there's an incentive to go for these different careers, because um, the common strategy for um, a lot of different, uh, a lot of companies to say, oh, we have career, careers fairs. Um, careers fairs are great. There are also a lot of them. <laughs> um, and you need a big, uh, you know, it's a big ask to say, oh, can you take your time out of your work to go and view this career, uh, career fair potentially you might be interested in. Whereas, uh, on the other hand, uh, the big, uh, big main scholarship uh, that was announced at University of Birmingham was uh, from BP, who offered a load of money and said, oh, come work for us. Mm -hmm. We have nine grand to sponsor you. So people are going incentivized to go and work for an oil company. Um, you need to make, you need to, eat. it's not just, just about throwing money out into the void and saying, oh, come get it but make sure there's an actual incentive, an actual excitement you know, by different competitions or offering internships instead of just, oh, a careers fair. Okay. So that's an interesting point because I think over the last couple of weeks, we've seen a bit of a stereotype coming into young people. There's been certainly two famous phases that I can you know, bring out this week of blah, blah, blah as the Greta Thunberg representative for everybody who is young and Barack Obama saying, stay angry, young people. And I thought that that was an interesting statement from him on the basis of, well, are you angry? And if you are angry, what, what can you do with that anger? Because I, th I feel that there's two approaches, from the outside, throw stones, or change from the inside. And it's, it's going to be an interesting approach to how this generation tackle the challenges moving forward. So I wonder, did anybody want to sort of pass on their view? I mean, um, as a young person, I'm passionate about climate change and all. I wouldn't say I'm angry. I'm more interested in having those conversations with like, people coming from a developing country. I'm more interested in having those conversations with people from developed countries to tell them that climate change is not a one size fits all for all countries. And to have practical steps, even if I'm, I'm, more, I'm interested in climate change, but I want to work from within to change the, pers the perspective, the narrative around developing countries, young people and climate change. So I wouldn't say I'm necessarily angry, but that's just me. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, so I'm not necessarily angry with the climate change itself. There's no point staying angry and holding a grudge because that's not going to change anything. But 
personally, I'm the type of person who wants to try and change it from the out, from the inside rather than the outside. I'm not that type of person. I'll go to these climate protests and hold big signs and shout at people. I want to use my passion for sustainability to go into these big multinational companies who haven't had a single conversation of what are they what is their plan in terms of sustainability going forward in the short term and the long term and that's what i'm going to be going into once i finish university as a consultant mm -hmm. i'll be going into these companies and uh, analyzing their operations um, and coming up with a strategy plan for them to follow um, what to implement what how and what to do to go forward basically so it sounds callum that what one of your key drivers then is understanding the culture and the behavior and the environmental responsibility of a comp company as you want to go and potentially go work for them, but also try to use that inf information, your, your skills and knowledge to influence their direction yeah. of travel from the outset. Yeah, especially being taught in international business and economics, there being very little to do with anything sustainability wise. Um, I've always had it from the, the, the theories, the mm -hmm. concepts from old generations, like centuries ago, these concepts are still being taught. And th that is also a trigger for me, basically, to try to go in and try and change everything from within. One of the things that I've done in university is I held, we held an event um, inviting academics, lecturers, uh, heads of departments to come in um, and we basically, I gave a presentation from the student's perspective. There was also a full-time officer from the student union who gave their side and a staff member from the university. And it was basically about how, why they should embed sustainability development goals into cool. their curriculum. So that this also stemmed from areas like that okay. going forward. Right, we're going to start to wrap this up now, and I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball at you all, something that uh, hopefully won't, won't throw you all too far off. But as leaders of the future sat here now, I just wanted you to think very carefully and very quickly about what is your biggest challenge that you think is going to be faced over the next nine years? Anybody want to go first? Yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> inequality. Inequality. The gap between developing countries and developed countries, it keeps getting bigger. So the skills gap, the inequality gap, yeah. Inequality, That's okay. Yeah. Um, I'd say um, keeping young people interested. We're, in terms of, you, as you said just before about channeling anger as well, um, there are loads and loads of polls recently. Oh, I think 75% of young people um, are, believe that the government is to blame for uh, climate change. And I think 80% believe that there's, you know, it's a real, a uh, real threat, but 2019, our age demographic, 50% voter turnout. It was, it was below, we need to make sure, we need to get voter numbers up so we can put pressure um, on governments and uh, on MPs to actually take action. Keep, keep the political pressure. Yeah. Okay. Sean? Uh, I think a big issue is funding by the sounds of it. A lot of people seem to be struggling to get funding, making sustainability affordable for construction or for individuals. Um, and ensuring collaboration is effective, make sure people aren't doing the same work as everyone else. Mm -hmm. There's no repeatability of things. I think that's definitely a big challenge. And just generally changing how you work, how you think. It's really quite big changes that people have to do. Um, so I think that's a big, big okay. challenge. Naveen? Um, I think getting everyone to that equal state where everyone has the same ability to combat climate change and reach net zero because it's very easy for countries that are developed to kind of just throw money at them and say you build um, sustainable energy resources but we need to make sure we're actually doing stuff to get them to a place where they can combat climate change by implementing education schemes and working with charities alongside businesses. Excellent. Callum? Um, one of the things that they mentioned earlier was making sure that young people are still involved, making sure that their voices are heard, um, putting 
that political pressure on the governments to make sure that they're committing and actually meeting their policies and their commitments that they've, they're currently making as we speak and what they have done in the past two weeks. Um, especially seeing how they failed to meet their certain pledges from 2015 with the Paris Agreement. I think in these next couple of years, they need to start taking it a lot more seriously and we need to keep applying that pressure from inside and from the outside as well. Cool. And Corey? Yeah, I agree with Callum. I think being heard is going to be tough and making a difference. Wonderful. OK, well, I for one wanted to say a big thank you to, to our panel today. I think they've done wonderful. So please... We should pass, pass back. Stay there for one sec, yeah. So, um, massive thank you to the panel. That was brilliant. Really, really good session. What I'd like you all to do now will be finished in five minutes, I promise. <laughs> but two minutes. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, or find someone next to you, uh, and tell them what, what's the thing that stuck with you? What's the most memorable thing? What's the best bit of today that you're going to take away with you from here? So, just have a quick chat to the person next to you. Two minutes. Great, thanks very much guys. You can you can yep. scoot Okay, have you both had a chance to say something to each other? Right, I'm going to come round and get a quick bit of feedback from people then. So, could I have this mic on? Katie? <laughs> the youth session was the best. The youth session was the best, of course. You organised it. Uh, great. Can I ask you what was yeah, the best sure. thing? The, the general enthusiasm from everybody, really. I don't think it's reflective of the outside world because everybody here is facing in the one direction. So, you know, half criticism, maybe some more provocative and, and negative comments would have been okay in that debate. But, but the enthusiasm throughout the day has been very impressive. Brilliant, thank you. Can I come over here, Grace, would you mind? We said um, the success stories and case studies, uh, most memorable bit, seeing who's already making a difference and what work's already been done. Yeah, brilliant. Some of those companies earlier were absolutely fantastic. Can I come to you? Would you mind offering a comment? Um, yeah, sure. A couple of things. I think um, collaboration and building on that, continuing to build on that, and also um, the curriculum aspect. I think we kind of knew that a lot of curriculums were very mm. archaic, but the fact that there was maybe a paragraph or a couple of hundred words on climate change and what the kids are learning at school and college is ridiculous. Yeah, absolutely. So something that really needs to be changed from that point of view. Anybody else want to shout out anything that they particularly thought was important we should take away from today? Everybody's avoiding my eye contact. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go for it. So I've, got, I've got two things. One is the amount of collaboration that's going on across all the organisations. I've not seen that anywhere else in, in the UK. And just the excitement and all the things that you are doing in the West Midlands is just phenomenal. Brilliant. Well, that is a great place to um, finish uh, today. Um, I feel really encouraged um, at how many people have uh, come, um, how many people have um, participated, and, and how many people actually have stayed right to the end as well, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, I've got a bunch of thank yous to do, um, if that's okay. I mean, first of all, I want to thank once again the 
uh, Department for Business, Energy, Industrial Strategy, who um, have sponsored today's event, and uh, Catherine, who came earlier, um, was really was really great to have uh, that commitment uh, too. Uh, I want to thank our online audience. Um, they have been. Uh, engaging. We, we, we said as a policy we wouldn't take questions from the online audience because it was just too complicated to um, organise. But if there are people who are still following uh, right through since this morning or indeed have dipped in and out during the day, um, then really, really grateful that we've had your engagement in that way as well. Um, I want to say a massive thank you to the people who put on the uh, display in the expo. That was really, really interesting and exciting. Um, some of the, the people that did the workshops um, earlier, absolutely great to be able to have those breakout spaces in those smaller groups. Um, and indeed, the literally, I can't remember, must be tens, probably not quite a hundred panellists that we've had um, over the course of the day. I'm really, really grateful uh, for their work as well. I want to do a big thank you to the West Midlands Combined Authority team, um, particularly comms colleagues, Kirsty and others who have um, put such a huge effort into organising and preparing um, all of this today. Also the energy capital team, the environment team. Um, I know you've put a lot of uh, intellectual capital into, uh, into today and, and how it's all gone. So many thanks to you all for your uh, involvement as well. Um, I want to say a big thank you to um, the University of Wolverhampton, the technical people, the guy who's been on the camera all day, uh, and the guys out the back here, um, you've done a fantastic job. Other people who have been looking after this building, um, massive thank you to you uh, for making it all happen so smoothly. Um, and also Paul um, and Jeff, uh, and uh, everybody here um, in the School of Built Environment, um, absolutely brilliant venue. So thank you so much for hosting us. I'm sure lots of us are going to want to come back and use this space for um, other events going forward. Uh, and then finally, I just want to thank all of you um, for being involved um, in the conversation, for your, uh, we heard it earlier, um, excitement and enthusiasm around this um, agenda. Um, I think it was a really wise comment earlier about, okay, so perhaps there hasn't been sufficient critique, haven't been the difficult questions, but I guess we should just take that excitement and enthusiasm out into um, the other places that we work and, uh, and the, the other social circles in which we mix. And if you like, get into those more difficult conversations with people who perhaps might be a little bit more skeptical um, about this agenda. But certainly I feel hugely infused by the conversations that we've been having today, uh, where the West Midlands um, is really leading the way as home of the Green Industrial Revolution. And I'm really, really proud of being able to uh, be part of this movement, if you like, that we're all um, part of here. So thank you so much. Do hang around now for as long as you like, um, uh, for a bit of networking time. If there's people you still want to catch up with, then please take the opportunity to do that. But otherwise, thank you and have safe journeys home. Thank <clears throat> you.